Computers really have allowed us to do some pretty amazing things. Think global telecommunications, international commerce, global transportation, breakthroughs in medicine, distributed education, online shopping, online dating, and just the internet in general. <laughs> Computers are allowing us to explore our own world and other worlds and of course some seemingly mundane things like permitting us to spy on our pets from work or communicating with our friends in a nearly indecipherable stream of emoji. But don't call computers magical, they are not, I repeat, are not magical. So before we get into what we're going to talk about in this series, it might be useful to tell you what we are not going to talk about. We aren't going to teach you how to program. Programming is a really crucial aspect of computer science, and we will get to the rules that guide the logic of hardware and software design. But we aren't going to teach you how to program an Arduino to water your plant, or how to change the CSS on your grandma's sewing blog so visitors' cursors turn into kittens. This also isn't a computing course, or at least how computing is thought of in the US. Computing here is a goal, it's what computers do, and we'll talk about some of that for sure, but our goal for this course is much broader. But computing means other things in other countries. It's all pretty confusing. But what we are going to look at are the history of computers. Even before we had electricity, we're going to retrace the design decisions that have given us our present day components. We're going to talk about how operating systems work, or don't work, how the YouTubes get to you over the internet, how our smartphones and other smart devices are well, getting smarter, and of course, mysterious futuristic stuff like quantum computing and frustrating present day stuff like hacking. It's a lot to cover, but I suppose before we get started I should introduce myself. I'm Carrie ann Philbin. Hello! I'm an award-winning computing teacher, author of Adventures in Raspberry Pi, and the creator of a YouTube video series for teenagers called The Geek Girl Diaries, which includes stuff like interviews with women working in technology, computer science-based tutorials, and hands-on digital maker-style projects. In my day job, I help people learn about technology and how to make things with computers as director of education for the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which is a charity based in Cambridge in the UK. Needless to say, I am passionate about this stuff, but not because computers are these amazing devices that are always making our lives easier, sometimes that's debatable, but because computers in arguably have become pivotal in our society. From our cars and thermostats to pacemakers and cell phones, computers are everywhere, and it's my hope that by the end of this course you'll have a better understanding and appreciation for how far we've come and how far they may take us. Over the course of this series we're going to go from bits, bytes, transistors and logic gates all the way to operating systems, virtual reality and robots. We're going to cover a lot, but just to clear things up, we are not going to teach you how to program. Instead we're going to explore a range of computing topics as a discipline and a technology. Computers are the lifeblood of today's world. If they were to suddenly turn off all at once, the power grid would shut down, cars would crash, planes would fall, water treatment plants would stop, stock markets would freeze, trucks with food wouldn't know where to deliver, and employees wouldn't get paid. Even many non-computer objects, like DFTBA shirts and the chair I'm sitting on, are made in factories run by computers. Computing really has transformed nearly every aspect of our lives. And this isn't the first time we've seen this sort of technology-driven global change. Advances in manufacturing during the Industrial Revolution brought new scale to human civilization in agriculture, industry, and domestic life. Mechanization meant superior harvests and more food, mass-produced goods, cheaper and faster travel and communication, and usually a better quality of life. And computing technology is doing the same right now, from automated farming and medical equipment to global telecommunications and educational opportunities. And new frontier like virtual reality and self-driving cars. We are living in a time likely to be remembered as the electronic age. And with billions of transistors in just your smartphones, computers can seem pretty complicated. But really, they're just simple machines that perform complex actions through many layers of abstraction. So in this series, we're going to break down those layers and build up from simple ones and zeros to logic units, CPUs, operating systems, the entire internet and beyond. And don't worry, in the same way someone buying t-shirts on a web page doesn't need to know how that web page was programmed, or the web designer doesn't need to know how all the packets are routed, or router engineers don't need to know about transistor logic, this series will build on previous episodes, but not be dependent on them. By the end of this series, I hope that you can better contextualise computing's role both in your own life and society, and how humanity's arguably greatest invention is just in its infancy, with its biggest impact yet to come. But before we get into all that, we should start at computing's origins, because although electronic computers are relatively new, the need for computation is not. The earliest recognised device for computing was the abacus, 
invented in Mesopotamia around 2500 BCE. It's essentially a hand-operated calculator that helps add and subtract many numbers. It also stores the current state of the computation, much like your hard drive does today. The abacus was created because the scale of society had become greater than what a single person could keep and manipulate in their mind. There might be thousands of people in a village, or tens of thousands of cattle. There are many variants of the abacus, but let's look at a really basic version, with each row representing a different power of 10. So each bead on the bottom row represents a single unit. In the next row, they represent 10, the row above, 100, and so on. Let's say we have three heads of cattle represented by three beads on the bottom row on the right side. If we were to buy four more cattle, we would just slide four more beads to the right for a total of seven. But if we were to add five more after the first three, we would run out of beads. So we would slide everything back to the left, slide one bead on the second row to the right representing 10, and then add the final two beads on the bottom row for a total of 12. This is particularly useful with large numbers. So if we were to add 1,251, we would just add one to the bottom row, five to the second row, two to the third row, and one to the fourth row. We don't have to add in our head, and the abacus stores the total for us. Over the next 4,000 years, humans developed all sorts of clever computing devices, like the astrolabe, which enabled ships to calculate their latitude at sea, or the slide rule for assisting with multiplication and division. And there are literally hundreds of types of clocks created that could be used to calculate sunrise, tides, positions of celestial bodies, and even just the time. Each one of these devices made something that was previously laborious to calculate much faster, easier, and often more accurate. It lowered the barrier to entry, and at the same time amplified our mental abilities. Take note, this is a theme we're going to touch on a lot in this series. As early computer pioneer Charles Babbage said, at each increase of knowledge, as well as on the contrivance of every new tool, human labor becomes abridged. However, none of these devices were called computers. The earliest documented use of the word computer is from 1613 in a book by Richard Braithwaite. And it wasn't a machine at all, it was a job title. Braithwaite said, I have read the truest computer of times and the best arithmetician that ever breathed, and he reduceth thy days into a short number. In those days, computer was a person who did calculations, sometimes with the help of machines, but often not. This job title persisted until the late 1800s, when the meaning of computers started shifting to refer to devices. And notable among these devices was the step reckoner built by German polymath Gottfried Leibniz in 1694. Leibniz said, it is beneath the dignity of excellent men to waste their time in calculation when any peasant could do the work just as accurately with the aid of a machine. It worked kind of like the odometer in your car, which is really just a machine for adding up the number of miles your car is driven. The device had a series of gears that turned. Each gear had 10 teeth to represent the digits from zero to nine. Whenever a gear bypassed nine, it rotated back to zero and advanced the adjacent gear by one tooth. Kind of like when hitting 10 on that basic abacus. This worked in reverse when doing subtraction too. With some clever mechanical tricks, the step reckoner was also able to multiply and divide numbers. Multiplications and divisions are really just many additions and subtractions. For example, if we want to divide 17 by 5, we just subtract 5, then 5, then 5 again, and then we can't subtract any more 5s. So we know 5 goes into 17 three times, with 2 left over. The step reckoner was able to do this in an automated way, and was the first machine that could do all four of these operations. And this design was so successful, it was used for the next three centuries of calculator design. Unfortunately, even with mechanical calculators, most real-world problems required many steps of computation before an answer was determined. It could take hours or days to generate a single result. Also, these handcrafted machines were expensive, and not accessible to most of the population. Before the 20th century, most people experienced computing through pre-computated tables, assembled by those amazing human computers we talked about. So if you needed to know the square root of 8,675,309, instead of spending all day hand cranking your step reckoner, you could look it up in a huge book full of square root tables in a minute or so. Speed and accuracy is particularly important on the battlefield, and so militaries were among the first to apply computing to complex problems. A particularly difficult problem is accurately firing artillery shells, which by the 1800s could travel well over a kilometer, or a bit more more than half a mile. Add to this varying wind conditions, temperature, and atmospheric pressure, and even hitting something as large as a ship was difficult. Range tables were created that allowed gunners to look up environmental conditions and the distance they wanted to fire, and the table would tell them the angle to set the cannon. These range tables worked so well, they were used well into World War II. The problem was, if you changed the design of the cannon or of the shell, a whole new table had to be computed, which was massively time-consuming and inevitably led to errors. Charles Babbage acknowledged this problem in 1822 in a paper to the Royal Astronomical Society entitled Note on the Application of Machinery to the Computation of Astronomical and Mathematical Tables. 
Let's go to the thought bubble. Charles Babbage proposed a new mechanical device called the difference engine, a much more complex machine that could approximate polynomials. Polynomials describe the relationship between several variables, like range and air pressure, or amount of pizza Carrie-Anne eats and happiness. Polynomials could also be used to approximate logarithmic and trigonometric function, which are a real hassle to calculate by hand. Babbage started construction in 1823 and over the next two decades tried to fabricate and assemble the 25,000 components, collectively weighing around 15 tonnes. Unfortunately, the project was ultimately abandoned. But in 1991, historians finished constructing a difference engine based on Babbage's drawings and writings, and it worked! But more importantly, during construction of the difference engine, Babbage imagined an even more complex machine the analytical engine. Unlike the difference engine, step reckon on all other computational devices before it, the analytical engine was a general purpose computer. It could be used for many things, not just one particular computation. It could be given data and run operations in sequence, it had memory and even a primitive printer. Like the difference engine, it was ahead of its time and was never fully constructed. However, the idea of an automatic computer, one that could guide itself through a series of operations automatically, was a huge deal and would foreshadow computer programs. English mathematician Ada Lovelace wrote hypothetical programs for the analytical engine, saying a new, a vast and a powerful language is developed for the future use of analysis. For her work, Ada is often considered the world's first programmer. The analytical engine would go on to inspire arguably the first generation of computer scientists who incorporated many of Babbage's ideas in their machines. This is why Babbage is often considered the father of computing. Thanks, Fort Bubble. So by the end of the 19th century, computing devices were used for special purpose tasks in the sciences and engineering, but rarely seen in business, government or domestic life. However, the US government faced a serious problem for its 1819 census that demanded the kind of efficiency that only computers could provide. The US Constitution requires that a census be conducted every 10 years for the purposes of distributing federal funds, representation in Congress and good stuff like that. And by 1880, the US population was booming, mostly due to immigration. That census took seven years to manually compile, and by the time it was completed, it was already out of date. And it was predicted that the 1819 census would take 13 years to compute. That's a little problematic when it's required every decade. The Census Bureau turned to Herman Hollerith, who built a tabulating machine. His machine was electromechanical. It used traditional mechanical systems for keeping count, like Leibniz's step reckoner, but coupled them with electrically powered components. Hollerith's machine used punch cards, which were paper cards with a grid of locations that could be punched out to represent data. For example, there was a series of holes for marital status. If you were married, you would punch out the married spot. Then when the card was inserted into Hollerith's machine, little metal pins would come down over the card. If a spot was punched out, the pin would pass through the hole in the paper and into a little vial of mercury, which completed the circuit. This now completed circuit powered an electric motor, which turned a gear to add one, in this case, to the married total. Hollerith's machine was roughly 10 times faster than manual tabulations, and the census was completed in just two and a half years, saving the census office millions of dollars. Businesses began recognizing the value of computing and saw its potential to boost profits by improving labor and data-intensive tasks, like accounting, insurance appraisals, and inventory management. To meet this demand, Hollerith founded the Tabulating Machine Company, which later merged with other machine makers in 1924 to become the International Business Machines Corporation, or IBM, which you've probably heard of. These electromechanical business machines were a huge success, transforming commerce and government, and by the mid-1900s, the explosion in world population and the rise of globalized trade demanded even faster and more flexible tools for processing data setting the stage for digital computers. Our last episode brought us to the start of the 20th century, where early special purpose computing devices like tabulating machines were a huge boon to governments and business, aiding and sometimes replacing rote manual tasks. But the scale of human systems continued to increase at an unprecedented rate. The first half of the 20th century saw the world's population almost double. World War I mobilized 70 million people, and World War II involved more than 100 million. Global trade and transit networks became interconnected like never before, and the sophistication of our engineers engineering and scientific endeavors reached new heights. We even started to seriously consider visiting other planets. And it was this explosion of complexity, bureaucracy, and ultimately data that drove an increasing need for automation and computation. Soon those cabinet-sized electromechanical computers grew into room-sized behemoths that were expensive to maintain and prone to errors. And it was these machines that would set the stage for future innovation. One of the largest electromechanical computers built was the Harvard Mark I. 
Completed in 1944 by IBM for the Allies during World War II, it contained 765,000 components, 3 million connections, and 500 miles of wire. To keep its internal mechanics synchronized, it used a 50-foot shaft running right through the machine driven by a 5-horsepower motor. One of the earliest uses for this technology was running simulations for the Manhattan Project. The brains of these huge electromechanical beasts were relays electronically controlled mechanical switches. In a relay, there is a control wire that determines whether a circuit is opened or closed. The control wire connects to a coil of wire inside the relay. When current flows through the coil, an electromagnetic field is created, which in turn attracts a metal arm inside the relay, snapping it shut and completing the circuit. You can think of a relay like a water faucet. The control wire is like the faucet handle. Open the faucet and the water flows through the pipe. Close the faucet and the flow of water stops. Relays are doing the same thing, just with electrons instead of water. The controlled circuit can then connect to other circuits or to something like a motor, which might increment a count on a gear, like in Hollerus tabulating machine we talked about last episode. Unfortunately, the mechanical arm inside of a relay has mass and therefore can't move instantly between open and closed states. A good relay in the 1940s might be able to flick back and forth 50 times in a second. That might seem pretty fast, but it's not fast enough to be useful at solving large complex problems. The Harvard Mark I could do three additions or subtractions per second. Multiple Applications took 6 seconds and divisions took 15. And more complex operations like a trigonometric function could take over a minute. In addition to slow switching speed, another limitation was wear and tear. Anything mechanical that moves will wear over time. Some things break entirely and other things start getting sticky, slow and just plain unreliable. And as the number of relays increases, the probability of a failure increases too. The Harvard Mark I had roughly 3,500 relays. Even if you assume a relay has an operational life of 10 years, this would mean you would have to replace, on average, 140 relay every day. That's a big problem when you're in the middle of running some important multi-day calculation. And that's not all engineers had to contend with. These huge dark and warm machines also attracted insects. In September 1947, operators on the Harvard Mark II pulled a dead moth from a malfunctioning relay. Grace Hopper, who we'll talk more about in a later episode, noted, from then on, when anything went wrong with a computer, we said it had bugs in it. And that's where we get the term computer bug. It was clear that a faster, more reliable alternative to electromechanical relays was needed if computing was going to advance further. And fortunately, that alternative already existed. In 1904, English physicist John Ambrose Fleming developed a new electrical component called a thermionic valve, which housed two electrodes inside an airtight glass bulb. This was the first vacuum tube. One of the electrodes could be heated, which would cause it to emit electrons, a process called thermionic emission. The other electrode could then attract these electrons to create the flow of our electric faucet, but only if it was positively charged. If it had a negative or neutral charge, the electrons would no longer be attracted across the vacuum, so no current would flow. An electronic component that permits the one-way flow of current is called a diode. But what was really needed was a switch to help turn this flow on and off. Luckily, shortly after in 1906, American inventor Lee DeForest added a third control electrode that sits between the two electrodes in Fleming's design. By applying a positive charge to the control electrode, it would permit the flow of electrons as before. But if the control electrode was given a negative charge, it would prevent the flow of electrons. So by manipulating the control wire, one could open or close the circuit. It's pretty much the same thing as a relay, but importantly, vacuum tubes have no moving parts. This meant there was less wear and they could switch thousands of times per second. These triode vacuum tubes would become the basis of radio, long distance telephone, and many other electronic devices for nearly half a century. I should note here that vacuum tubes weren't perfect. They're kind of fragile and can burn out like light bulbs, but they were a big improvement over mechanical relays. Also, initially, vacuum tubes were expensive. A radio set often used just one, but a computer might require hundreds or thousands of electrical switches. But by the 1940s, their cost and reliability had improved to the point where they became feasible for use in computers at least by people with deep pockets, like governments. This marked the shift from electromechanical computing to electronic computing. Let's go to the thought bubble. The first large-scale use of vacuum tubes for computing was the Colossus Mark I, designed by engineer Tommy Flowers and completed in December of 1943. The Colossus was installed at Bletchley Park in the UK and helped to decrypt Nazi communications. This may sound familiar because two years prior, Alan Turing, often called the father of computer science, had created an electromechanical device also at Bletchley Park called the bomb. It was an electromechanical machine designed to break Nazi enigma codes. 
but the bomb wasn't technically a computer, and we'll get to Alan Turing's contributions later. Anyway, the first version of Colossus contained 1,600 vacuum tubes, and in total, 10 colossi were built to help with code breaking. Colossus is regarded as the first programmable electronic computer. Programming was done by plugging hundreds of wires into plug boards, sort of like old school telephone switchboards, in order to set up the computer to perform the right operations. So while programmable, it still had to be configured to perform any specific computation. Enter the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, or ENIAC, completed a few years later in 1946 at the University of Pennsylvania. Designed by John Muckley and J. Presper Eckert, this was the world's first truly general-purpose programmable electronic computer. ENIAC could perform 5,000 10-digit additions or subtractions per second, many, many times faster than any machine that came before it. It was operational for 10 years, and it's estimated to have done more arithmetic than the entire human race up to that point. But with that many vacuum tubes, failures were common, and ENIAC was generally only operational for about half a day at a time before breaking down. Thanks, Thought Bubble. By the 1950s, even vacuum tube-based computing was reaching its limits. The US Air Force's ANFSQ-7 computer, which was completed in 1955, was part of the SAGE Air Defense computer system, which we'll talk about more in a later episode. To reduce cost and size, as well as to improve reliability and speed, a radical new electronic switch was needed. In 1947, Bell Laboratory scientists John Barden, Walter Britton and William Shockley invented the transistor, and with it a whole new era of computing was born. The physics behind transistors is pretty complex, relying on quantum mechanics, so we're going to stick to the basics. A transistor is just like a relay or vacuum tube. It's a switch that can be opened or closed by applying electrical power via a control wire. Typically, transistors have two electrodes separated by a material that sometimes can conduct electricity and other times resist it, a semiconductor. In this case, the control wire attaches to a gate electrode. By changing the electrical charge of the gate, the conductivity of the semiconducting material can be manipulated, allowing current to flow or be stopped, like the water faucet analogy we discussed earlier. Even the very first transistor at Bell Labs showed tremendous promise. It could switch between on and off states 10,000 times per second. Further, unlike vacuum tubes made of glass and with carefully suspended fragile components, transistors were solid material, known as a solid state component. Almost immediately, transistors could be made smaller than the smallest possible relays or vacuum tubes. This led to dramatically smaller and cheaper computers, like the IBM 608, released in 1957, the first fully transistor-powered commercially available computer. It contained 3,000 transistors and could perform 4,500 additions, or roughly 80 multiplications or divisions every second. IBM soon transitioned all of its computing products to transistors, bringing transistor-based computers into offices and eventually homes. Today, computers use transistors that are smaller than 50 nanometers in size. For reference, a sheet of paper is roughly 100,000 nanometers thick. And they're not only incredibly small, they're super fast. They can switch states millions of times per second and can run for decades. A lot of this transistor and semiconductor development happened in the Santa Clara Valley between San Francisco and San Jose, California. Since the most common material used to create semiconductors is silicon, this region soon became known as Silicon Valley. Even William Shockley moved there, founding Shockley Semiconductor, whose employees later founded Fairchild Semiconductors, whose employees later founded Intel, the world's largest computer chip maker today. Okay, so we've gone from relays to vacuum tubes to transistors. We can turn electricity on and off really, really, really fast. But how do we get from transistors to actually computing something? especially if we don't have motors and gears. That's what we're going to cover over the next few episodes. Thanks for watching, see you next week. Today we start our journey up the ladder of abstraction, where we leave behind the simplicity of being able to see every switch and gear, but gain the ability to assemble increasingly complex systems. Last episode, we talked about how computers evolved from electromechanical devices that often had decimal representations of numbers, like those represented by teeth on a gear, to electronic computers with transistors that can turn the flow of electricity on or off. And fortunately, even with just two states of electricity, we can represent important information. Information. We call this representation binary, which literally means of two states, in the same way a bicycle has two wheels or a biped has two legs. You might think two states isn't a lot to work with, and you'd be right, but it's exactly what you need for representing the values true and false. In computers, an on state when electricity is flowing represents true. 
the off state, no electricity flowing, represents false. We can also write binary as ones and zeros instead of trues and falses. They are just different expressions of the same signal. But we'll talk about that in the next episode. Now, it is actually possible to use transistors for more than just turning electrical current on and off, and to allow for different levels of current. Some early electronic computers were ternary, that's three states, and even quinary using five states. The problem is, the more intermediate states there are, the harder it is to keep them all separate. If your smartphone battery starts running low, or there's electrical noise because someone's running a microwave nearby, the signals can get mixed up. And this problem only gets worse with transistors changing states millions of times per second. So placing two signals as far apart as possible using just on and off gives us the most distinct signal to minimize these issues. Another reason computers use binary is that an entire branch of mathematics already existed that dealt exclusively with true and false values, and it had figured out all the necessary rules and operations for manipulating them. It's called Boolean algebra. George Boole, from which Boolean algebra later got its name, was a self-taught English mathematician in the 1800s. He was interested in representing logical statements that went under, over and beyond Aristotle's approach to logic, which was, unsurprisingly, grounded in philosophy. Boole's approach allowed truth to be systematically and formally proven through logic equations which he introduced in his first book, The Mathematical Analysis of Logic, in 1847. In regular algebra, the type you probably learned in high school, the values of variables are numbers and operations on those numbers are things like addition and multiplication. But in Boolean algebra, the values of variables are true and false, and the operations are logical. There are three fundamental operations in Boolean algebra, a not, an and, and an or operation. And these operations turn out to be really useful, so we're going to look at them individually. A not takes a single Boolean value, either true or false, and negates it. It flips true to false and false to true. We can write out a little logic table that shows the original value under input and the outcome after applying the operation under output. Now here's the cool part. We can easily build Boolean logic out of transistors. As we discussed last episode, transistors are really just electrically controlled switches. They have three wires, two electrodes and one control wire. When you apply electricity to the control wire, it lets current flow through from one electrode through the transistor to the other electrode. This is a lot like a spigot on a pipe Open the tap, water flows. Close the tap, water shuts off. You can think of the control wire as an input and the wire coming from the bottom electrode as the output. So with a single transistor, we have one input and one output. If we turn the input on, the output is also on because the current can flow through it. If we turn the input off, the output is also off and the current can no longer pass through. Or in Boolean terms, when the input is true, the output is true. And when the input is false, the output is also false which again, we can show on a logic table. This isn't a very exciting circuit though, because it's not doing anything. The input and output are the same, but we can modify this circuit just a little bit to create a knot. Instead of having the output wire at the end of the transistor, we can move it before. If we turn the input on, the transistor allows current to pass through it to the ground, and the output wire won't receive that current, so it will be off. In our water metaphor, grounding would be like if all the water in your house was flowing out of a huge hose, so there wasn't any water pressure left for your shower. So in this case, if the input is on, output is off. When we turn off the transistor though, current is prevented from flowing down it to the ground. So instead, current flows through the output wire. So the input will be off and the output will be on. And this matches our logic table for NOT. So congrats, we just built a circuit that computes NOT. We call them NOT gates and we call them gates because they're controlling the path of our current. The AND Boolean operation takes two inputs but still has a single output. In this case, the output is only true if both inputs are true. Think about it like telling the truth. You're only being completely honest if you don't lie even a little. For example, let's take the statement, my name is Carrie Ann and I'm wearing a blue dress. Both of those facts are true, so the whole statement is true. But if I said my name is Carrie Ann and I'm wearing pants, that would be false because I'm not wearing pants or, or trousers if you're in England. The Carrie Ann part is true, but a true and a false is still false. If I were to reverse that statement, it would still obviously be false. And if I were to tell you two complete lies, that is also false. And again, we can write all of these combinations out in a table. To build an AND gate, we need two transistors connected together so we have our two inputs and one output. If we turn on just transistor A, current won't flow because the current is stopped by transistor B. Alternatively, if transistor B is on but transistor A is off, same thing, the current can't get through. Only if transistor A and transistor B are on does the output wire have current. The last Boolean operator is OR, where only one input has to be true for the output to be true. For example, my name is Margaret Hamilton or I'm wearing a blue dress. 
This is a true statement, because although I'm not Margaret Hamilton, unfortunately, I am wearing a blue dress. So the overall statement is true. An or statement is also true if both facts are true. The only time an OR statement is false is if both inputs are false. Building an OR gate from transistors needs a few extra wires. Instead of having two transistors in series, one after the other, we have them in parallel. We run wires from the current source to both transistors. We use this little arc to note that the wires jump over one another and aren't connected, even though they look like they cross. If both transistors are turned off, the current is prevented from flowing to the output, so the output is also off. Now, if we turn on just transistor A, current can flow to the output. Same thing if transistor A is off, but transistor B is on. Basically, if A or B is on, the output is also on. Also, if both transistors are on, the output is still on. OK, now we've got NOT and and OR gates, and we can leave behind their constituent transistors and move up a layer of abstraction. The standard engineers use for these gates are a triangle with a dot for a NOT, a D for the AND, and a spaceship for the OR. Those aren't the official names, but that's how I like to think of them. Representing them and thinking about them this way allows us to build even bigger components while keeping the overall complexity relatively the same. Just remember that all of the mess of transistors and wires is still there. For example, another useful Boolean operation in computation is called an exclusive OR, or XOR for short. XOR is like a regular OR, but with one difference. If both inputs are true, the XOR is false. The only time an XOR is true is when one input is true and the other input is false. It's like when you go out to dinner and your meal comes with a side salad or a soup. Sadly, you can't have both. And building this from transistors is pretty confusing, but we can show how an XOR is created from our three basic Boolean gates. We know we have two inputs again, A and B, and one output. Let's start with an OR gate, since the logic table looks almost identical to an OR. There's only one problem. When A and B are true, the logic is different from OR, and we need to output false. To do this, we need to add some additional gates. If we add an AND gate and the input is true and true, the output will be true. This isn't what we want, but if we add a NOT immediately after, this will flip it to false. OK, now if we add a final AND gate and send it that value along with the output of our original OR gate, the AND will take in false and and true. And since AND needs both values to be true, its output is false. That's the first row of our logic table. If we work through the remaining input combinations, we can see this Boolean logic circuit does implement an exclusive OR. And XOR turns out to be a very useful component, and we'll get to it in another episode. So useful, in fact, engineers gave it its own symbol too. An OR gate with a smile. But most importantly, we can now put XOR into our metaphorical toolbox and not have to worry about the individual logic gates that make it up, or the transistors that make up those gates, or how electrons are flowing through a semiconductor, moving up another layer of abstraction. When computer engineers are designing processors, they rarely work at the transistor level and instead work with much larger blocks, like logic gates, and even larger components made up of logic gates, which we'll discuss in future episodes. And even if you are a professional computer programmer, it's not often that you think about how the logic that you are programming is actually implemented in the physical world by these teeny tiny components. We've also moved from thinking about raw electrical signals to our first representation of data, true and false. And we've even gotten a little taste of computation. With just the logic gates in this episode, we could build a machine that evaluates complex logic statements, like if name is John Green and after 5 p.m. or is weekend and near Pizza Hut, then John will want pizza equals true. And with that, I'm starving, I'll see you next week. And so today, we're going to talk about how computers store and represent numerical data, which means we've got to talk about math. But don't worry, every single one of you already knows exactly what you need to know to follow along. So last episode, we talked about how transistors can be used to build logic gates, which can evaluate Boolean statements. And in Boolean algebra, there are only two binary values, true and false. But if we only have two values, how in the world do we represent information beyond just these two values? That's where the math comes in. So as we mentioned last Last episode, a single binary value can be used to represent a number. Instead of true and false, we can call these two states 1 and 0, which is actually incredibly useful. And if we want to represent larger things, we just need to add more binary digits. This works exactly the same way as the decimal numbers that we're all familiar with. With decimal numbers, there are only 10 possible values a single digit can be, 0 through 9. And to get numbers larger than 9, we just start adding more digits to the front. We could do the same with binary. For example, let's take the number 263. What does this number actually represent? Well, it means we've got two 100s, six 10s, and three 1s. If you add those all together, we've got 263. Notice how each column has a different multiplier. In this case, it's 100, 10, and 1. 
Each multiplier is 10 times larger than the one to the right. That's because each column has 10 possible digits to work with, 0 through 9, after which you have to carry one to the next column. For this reason, it's called base 10 notation, also called decimal, since deci means 10. And binary works exactly the same way, it's just base 2. That's because there are only two possible digits in binary, 1 and 0. This means that each multiplier has to be two times larger than the column to its right. Instead of hundreds, tens and ones, we now have fours, twos and ones. Take for example the binary number 101. This means we have one four, zero twos and one one. Add those all together and we've got the number five in base 10. But to represent larger numbers, binary needs a lot more digits. Take this number in binary. We can convert it to decimal in the same way. We have one times 128, zero times 64, one times 32, one times 16, zero times eight, 1 times 4, 1 times 2, and 1 times 1, which all adds up to 183. Math with binary numbers isn't hard either. Take for example decimal addition of 183 plus 19. First we add 3 plus 9, that's 12, so we put 2 as the sum and carry 1 to the tens column. Now we add 8 plus 1 plus the one we carried, that's 10, so the sum is 0 carry 1. Finally we add 1 plus the one we carried which equals 2, so the total sum is 202. Here's the same sum but in binary. Just as before, we start with the ones column. Adding one plus one results in two, even in binary. But there's no symbol two, so we use one zero and put zero as our sum and carry the one, just like in our decimal example. One plus one plus the one carried equals three, or one one in binary. So we put the sum as one and carry one again and so on. We end up with this number, which is the same as the number 202 in base 10. Each of these binary digits, one or zero, is called a bit. So in these last few examples, we were using 8-bit numbers with their lowest value of 0 and highest value of 255, which requires all 8 bits to be set to 1. That's 256 different values, or 2 to the 8th power. You might have heard of 8-bit computers or 8-bit graphics or audio. These were computers that did most of their operations in chunks of 8 bits. But 256 different values isn't a lot to work with. So it meant things like 8-bit games were limited to just 256 different colours for their graphics. And 8 bits is such a common size in computing, it has a special word, a byte. A byte is 8 bits. If you've got 10 bytes, it means you've really got 80 bits. You've heard of kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes and so on. These prefixes denote different scales of data. Just like one kilogram is a thousand grams, one kilobyte is a thousand bytes, or really 8,000 bits. Mega is a million bytes and giga is a billion bytes. Today, you might even have a hard drive that has one terabyte of storage. That's eight trillion ones and zeros. But hold on, that's not always true. In binary, a kilobyte has two to the power of 10 bytes, or 1,024. 1,000 is also right when talking about kilobytes, but we should acknowledge it isn't the only correct definition. You've probably also heard the term 32-bit or 64-bit computers. You're almost certainly using one right now. What this means is that they operate in chunks of 32 or 64 bits. That's a lot of bits. The largest number you can represent with 32 bits is just under 4.3 billion, which is 32 ones in binary. This is why our Instagram photos are so smooth and pretty. They are composed of millions of colours, because computers today use 32-bit colour graphics. Of course, not everything is a positive number, like my bank account in college. So we need a way to represent positive and negative numbers. Most computers use the first bit for the sign, one for negative, zero for positive numbers, and then use the remaining 31 bits for the number itself. That gives us a range of roughly plus or minus two billion. While this is a pretty big range of numbers, it's not enough for many tasks. There are seven billion people on the Earth, and the US national debt is almost $20 trillion after all. This is why 64-bit numbers are useful. The largest value a 64-bit number can represent is around 9.2 quintillion. That's a lot of possible numbers, and will hopefully stay above the US national debt for a while. Most importantly, as we'll discuss in a later episode, computers must label locations in their memory, known as addresses, in in order to store and retrieve values. As computer memory has grown to gigabytes and terabytes, that's trillions of bytes, it was necessary to have 64-bit memory addresses as well. In addition to negative and positive numbers, computers must deal with numbers that are not whole numbers, like 12.7 and 3.14, or maybe even star date 43989.1. These are called floating point numbers, because the decimal point can float around in the middle of a number. Several methods have been developed to represent floating point numbers, the most common of which is the IEEE 754 standard, and you thought historians were the only people bad at naming things. In essence, this standard stores decimal values sort of like scientific notation. For example, 625.9 can be written as 0.6259 times 10 to the power of 3. 
There are two important numbers here. The point 6259 is called the significand, and three is the exponent. In a 32-bit floating point number, the first bit is used for the sign of the number, positive or negative. The next eight bits are used to store the exponent, and the remaining 23 bits are used to store the significand. Okay, we've talked a lot about numbers, but your name is probably composed of letters, so it's really useful for computers to also have a way to represent text. However, rather than have a special form of storage for letters, computers simply use numbers to represent letters. The most straightforward approach might be to simply number the letters of the alphabet, A being 1, B being 2, C3, and so on. In fact, Francis Bacon, the famous English writer, used 5-bit sequences to encode all 26 letters of the English alphabet to send secret messages back in the 1600s. And 5-bits can store 32 possible values, so that's enough for the 26 letters, but not enough for punctuation, digits, and upper and lowercase letters. Enter ASCII, the American standard code for information interchange. Invented in 1963, ASCII was a 7-bit code, enough to store 128 different values. With this expanded range, it could encode capital letters, lowercase letters, digits 0 through 9, and symbols like the at sign and punctuation marks. For example, a lowercase a is represented by the number 97, while a capital A is 65, a colon is 58, and a closed parenthesis is 41. ASCII even had a selection of special command codes, such as a new line character to tell the computer where to wrap a line to the next row. In older computer systems, the line of text would literally continue off the edge of the screen if you didn't include a new line character. Because ASCII was such an early standard, it became widely used and critically allowed different computers built by different companies to exchange data. This ability to universally exchange information is called interoperability. However, it did have a major limitation. It was really only designed for English. Fortunately, there are 8 bits in a byte, not 7, and it soon became popular to use codes 128 through 255, previously unused, for national characters. In the US, those extra numbers were largely used to encode additional symbols, like mathematical notation, graphical elements, and common accentuated characters. On the other hand, while the Latin characters were used universally, Russian computers use the extra codes to encode Cyrillic characters, and Greek computers Greek letters and so on. And national character codes work pretty well for most countries. The problem was, if you opened an email written in Latvian on a Turkish computer, the result was completely incomprehensible. And things totally broke with the rise of computing in Asia, as languages like Chinese and Japanese have thousands of characters. There was no way to encode all those characters in 8 bits. In response, each country invented multi-byte encoding schemes, all of which were mutually incompatible. The Japanese were so familiar with this encoding problem that they even had a special name for it. Moji Bakay, which means scrambled text. And so it was born, Unicode, one format to rule them all. Devised in 1992 to finally do away with all of the different international schemes, it replaced them with one universal encoding scheme. The most common version of Unicode uses 16 bits with space for over a million codes, enough for every single character from every language ever used, more than 120,000 of them in over 100 types of script, plus space for mathematical symbols and even graphical characters like emoji. And in the same way that ASCII defines a scheme for encoding letters as binary numbers, other file formats like MP3s or GIFs use binary numbers to encode sounds or colours of a pixel in our photos, movies and music. Most importantly, under the hood, it all comes down to long sequences of bits. Text messages, this YouTube video, every web page on the internet, and even your computer's operating system are nothing but long sequences of ones and zeros. So next week, we'll start talking about how your computer starts manipulating those binary sequences for our first true taste of computation. So last episode, we talked about how numbers can be represented in binary, like 00101010 is 42 in decimal. Representing and storing numbers is an important function of a computer, but the real goal is computation, or manipulating numbers in a structured and purposeful way, like adding two numbers together. These operations are handled by a computer's arithmetic and logic unit, but most people call it by its street name, the ALU. The ALU is the mathematical brain of a computer. When you understand an ALU's design and function, you'll understand a fundamental part of modern computers. It is the thing that does all of the computation in a computer, so basically everything uses it. First though, look at this beauty. This is perhaps the most famous ALU ever, the Intel 74181. When it was released in 1970, it was the first complete ALU that fit entirely inside a single chip. 
which was a huge engineering feat at the time. So today we're going to take those Boolean logic gates we learned about last week to build a simple ALU circuit with much of the same functionality as that 74181. And over the next few episodes, we'll use this to construct a computer from scratch. So it's going to get a little bit complicated, but I think you guys can handle it. An ALU is really two units in one. There's an arithmetic unit and a logic unit. Let's start with the arithmetic unit, which is responsible for handling all numerical operations in a computer, like addition and subtraction. It also does a bunch of other simple things, like add one to a number, which is called an increment operation, but we'll talk about those later. Today, we're going to focus on the piece de resistance, the creme de la creme of operations that underlines almost everything else a computer does, adding two numbers together. We could build this circuit entirely out of individual transistors, but that would get confusing really fast. So instead, as we talked about in episode three, we can use a high level of abstraction and build our components out of logic gates. In this case, AND, OR, NOT, and XOR gates. The simplest adding circuit that we can build takes two binary digits and adds them together. So we have two inputs, A and B, and one output, which is the sum of those two digits. Just to clarify, A, B, and the output are all single bits. There are only four possible input combinations. The first three are 0 plus 0 equals 0, 1 plus 0 equals 1, and 0 plus 1 equals 1. Remember that in binary, 1 is the same as true, and 0 is the same as false. So this set of inputs exactly matches the Boolean logic of an XOR gate, and we can use it as our one-bit adder. But the fourth input combination, 1 plus 1, is a special case. 1 plus 1 is 2, obviously, but there's no two-digit in binary. So as we talked about last episode, the result is 0, and the 1 is carried to the next column. So the sum is really 1, 0 in binary. Now, the output of our XOR gate is partially correct. 1 plus 1 output 0, but we need an extra output wire for that carry bit. The carry bit is only true when the inputs are 1 and 1, because that's the only time when the result is bigger than one bit can store. And conveniently, we have a gate for that, an AND gate, which is only true when both inputs are true. So we'll add that to our circuit too. And that's it. This circuit is called a half adder. It's not that complicated, just two logic gates. But let's abstract away even this level of detail and encapsulate our newly minted half adder as its own component with two inputs, bits A and B, and two outputs, the sum and the carry bits. This takes us to another level of abstraction. Oh, I feel like I say that a lot. If you want to add more than one plus one, we're going to need a full adder. That half adder left us with a carry bit as output. That means that when we move on to the next column in a multi-column addition, and every column after that, we're going to have to add three bits together, not two. A full adder is a bit more complicated. It takes three bits as inputs, A, B, and C. So the maximum possible input is one plus one plus one, which equals one carry out one. So we still only need two output wires, sum and carry. We can build a full adder using half adders. To do this, we use a half adder to add A plus B, just like before, but then feed that result and input C into a second half adder. Lastly, we need an OR gate to check if either one of the carry bits was true. That's it, we just made a full adder. Again, we can go up a level of abstraction and wrap up this full adder as its own component. It takes three inputs, adds them, and outputs the sum and the carry if there is one. Armed with our new components, we can now build a circuit that takes two 8-bit numbers, let's call them A and B, and adds them together. Let's start with the very first bit of A and B, which we'll call A0 and B0. At this point, there is no carry bit to deal with, because this is our first addition. So we can use our half adder to add those two bits together. The output is sum 0. Now we want to add Add A1 and B1 together, it's possible there was a carry from the previous addition of A0 and B0. So this time we need to use a full adder that also inputs the carry bit. We output this result as sum 1. Then we take any carry from this full adder and run it into the next full adder that handles A2 and B2. And we just keep doing this in a big chain until all 8 bits have been added. Notice how the carry bits ripple forward to each subsequent adder. For this reason, this is called an 8-bit ripple carry adder. Notice how our last full adder has a carry out. If there is a carry into the ninth bit, it means the sum of the two numbers is too large to fit into 8 bits. This is called an overflow. In general, an overflow occurs when the result of an addition is too large to be represented by the number of bits you are using. This can usually cause errors and unexpected behavior. Famously, the original Pac-Man arcade game used 8 bits to keep track of what level you were on. This meant that if you made it past level 255, 
the largest number storable in 8 bits, to level 256, the ALU overflowed. This caused a bunch of errors and glitches, making the level unbeatable. The bug became a rite of passage for the greatest Pac-Man players. So if we want to avoid overflows, we can extend our circuit with more full adders, allowing us to add 16 or 32-bit numbers. This makes overflows less likely to happen, but at the expense of more gates. An additional downside is that it takes a little bit of time for each of the carries to ripple forward. Admittedly, not very much time. Electrons move pretty fast, so we're talking about billionths of a second, but that's enough to make a difference in today's fast computers. For this reason, modern computers use a slightly different adding circuit called a carry look-ahead adder, which is faster but ultimately does exactly the same thing adds binary numbers. The ALU's arithmetic unit also has circuits for other math operations, and in general, these eight operations are always supported. And like our adder, these other operations are built from individual logic gates. Interestingly, you may have noticed that there are no multiply and divide operations. That's because simple ALUs don't have a circuit for this, and instead just perform a series of additions. Let's say you want to multiply 12 by 5. That's the same thing as adding 12 to itself five times. So it would take five passes through the ALU to do this one multiplication. And this is how many simple processors, like those in your thermostat, TV, remote, and microwave, do multiplication. It's slow, but it gets the job done. However, fancier processors, like those in your laptop or smartphone, have arithmetic units with dedicated circuits for multiplication. And as you might expect, the circuit is more complicated than addition, there's no magic, it just takes a lot more logic gates, which is why less expensive processors don't have this feature. OK, let's move on to the other half of the ALU, the logic unit. Instead of arithmetic operations, the logic unit performs, well, logical operations, like AND, OR, and NOT, which we've talked about previously. It also performs simple numerical tests, like checking if a number is negative. For example, here's a circuit that tests if the output of the ALU is zero. It does this using a bunch of OR gates to see if any of the bits are one. Even if one single bit is one, we know the number can't be zero. And then we use a final NOT gate to flip this input, so the output is one only if the input number is zero. So that's a high-level overview of what makes up an ALU. We even built several of the main components from scratch, like our ripple adder. As you saw, it's just a big bunch of logic gates connected in clever ways. Which brings us back to that ALU you admired so much at the beginning of the episode, the Intel 74181. Unlike the 8-bit ALU we made today, the 74181 could only handle 4-bit inputs, which means you built an ALU that's like twice as good as that super famous one with your mind. Well, sort of. We didn't build the whole thing, but you get the idea. The 74181 used about 70 logic gates, and it couldn't multiply or divide, but it was a huge step forward in miniaturization, opening the doors to more capable and less expensive computers. This 4-bit ALU circuit is already a lot to take in, but our 8-bit ALU would require hundreds of logic gates to fully build, and engineers didn't want to see all that complexity when using an ALU, so they came up with a special symbol to wrap it all up, which looks like a big V. Our 8-bit ALU has two inputs, A and B, each with 8 bits. We also need a way to specify what operation the ALU should perform, for example, addition or subtraction. For that, we use a 4-bit operation code. We'll talk more about this in a later episode, but in brief, 1000 might be the command to add, while 1100 is the command for subtract. Basically, the operation code tells the ALU what operation to perform, and the result of that operation on inputs A and B is an 8-bit output. ALUs also output a series of flags, which are 1-bit outputs for particular states and statuses. For example, if we subtract two numbers and the result is zero, our zero testing circuit, the one we made earlier, sets the zero flag to true. This is useful if we are trying to determine if two numbers are equal. If we wanted to test if A was less than B, we can use the ALU to calculate A subtract B, and look to see if the negative flag was set to true. If it was, we know that A was smaller than B. And finally, there's also a wire attached to the carryout on the adder we built. So if there is an overflow, we'll know about it. This is called the overflow flag. Fancier ALUs will have more flags, but these three flags are universal and frequently used. In fact, we'll be using them soon in a future episode. So now you know how your computer does all of its basic mathematical operations digitally, with no gears or levers required. We're going to use this ALU when we construct our CPU two episodes from now. But before that, 
our computer is going to need some memory. So last episode, using just logic gates, we built a simple ALU, which performs arithmetic and logic operations, hence the A and the L. But of course, there's not much point in calculating a result, only to throw it away. It would be useful to store that value somehow, and maybe even run several operations in a row. That's where computer memory comes in. If you've ever been in the middle of a long RPG campaign on your console, or slogging through a difficult level on Minesweeper on your desktop, and your beloved dog came by, tripped and pulled the power cord out the wall, you know the agony of losing all your progress. Condolences. But the reason for your loss is that your console, your laptop and your computers make use of random access memory or RAM, which stores things like game state as long as the power stays on. Another type of memory called persistent memory can survive without power, and it's used for different things, but we'll talk about the persistence of memory in a later episode. Today we're going to start small, literally by building a circuit that can store one single bit of information. After that, we'll scale up and build our very own memory module, and we'll combine it with our ALU next time when we finally build our very own CPU. All of the logic circuits we've discussed so far go in one direction, always flowing forward, like our 8-bit ripple adder from last episode. But we can also create circuits that loop back on themselves. Let's try taking an ordinary OR gate and feed the output back into one of its inputs and see what happens. First, let's set both inputs to zero. So zero OR zero is zero, and so this circuit always outputs zero. If we were to flip input A to one, one OR zero is one. So now the output of the OR gate is one. A fraction of a second later, that loops back around into input B. So the OR gate sees that both of its inputs are now one. One OR one is still one, so there is no change in output. If we flip input A back to zero, the OR gate still outputs one. So now we've got a circuit that records a one for us. Except we've got a teensy tiny problem. This change is permanent. No matter how hard we try, there's no way to get this circuit to flip back from a one to a zero. Now let's look at the same circuit, but with an AND gate instead. We'll start inputs A and B both at one. One AND one outputs one forever. But if we then flip input A to zero because it's an AND gate, the output will go to zero. So this circuit records a zero, the opposite of our other circuit. Like before, no matter what input we apply to input A afterwards, the circuit will always output zero. Now we've got the circuits that can record both zeros and ones. The key to making this a useful piece of memory is to combine our two circuits into what's called the AND OR latch. It has two inputs, a set input which sets the output to a one, and a reset input which resets the output to a zero. If set and reset are both zero, the circuit just outputs whatever was last put in it. In other words, it remembers a single bit of information. Memory! This is called a latch because it latches onto a particular value and stays that way. The action of putting data into memory is called writing, whereas getting the data out is called reading. OK, so we've got a way to store a single bit of information. Great! Unfortunately, having two different wires for input, set and reset is a bit confusing. To make this a little easier to use, we really want a single wire to input data that we can set to either 0 or 1 to store the value. Additionally, we're going to need a wire that enables the memory either to be available for writing or locked down, which is called the write enable line. By adding a few extra logic gates, we can build this circuit, which is called a gated latch, since the gate can be opened or closed. Now this circuit is starting to get a little complicated. We don't want to have to deal with all the individual logic gates, so as before, we're going to bump up a level of abstraction and put our whole gated latch circuit in a box, a box that stores one bit. Let's test out our new component. Let's start everything at zero. If we toggle the data wire from zero to one or one to zero, nothing happens. The output stays at zero. That's because the right enable wire is off, which prevents any change to the memory. So we need to open the gate by turning the right enable wire to one. Now we can put a one on the data line to save the value to our latch. Notice how the output is now one. Success! we can turn off the enable line and the output stays as one. Once again, we can toggle the value on the data line all we want, but the output will stay the same. The value is saved in memory. Now let's turn the enable line on again and use our data line to set the latch to zero. Done. Enable line off, the output is zero, and it works. Now, of course, computer memory that only stores one bit of information isn't very useful. Definitely not enough to run Frogger or anything, really. But we're not limited to using only one latch. If we put eight latches side by side, we can store eight bits of information, like an eight-bit number. A group of latches operating like this is called a register, which holds a single number. And the number of bits in a register is called its width. Early computers had 8-bit registers, then 16, 32, and today, many computers have registers that are 64 bits wide. To write to our register, we first have to enable all of the latches. We can do this with a single wire that connects to all of their enable inputs, which we set to 1. 
We then send our data in using the eight data wires and then set the enable back to zero. And the 8-bit value is now saved in memory. Putting latches side by side works okay for a smallish number of bits. A 64-bit register would need 64 wires running to the data pins and 64 wires running to the outputs. Luckily, we only need one wire to enable all of the latches, but that's still 129 wires. For 256 bits, we end up with 513 wires. The solution is a matrix. In this matrix, we don't arrange our latches in a row. We put them in a grid. For 256 bits, we need a 16 by 16 grid of latches with 16 rows and columns of wires. To activate any one latch, we must turn on the corresponding row and column wire. Let's zoom in and see how this works. We only want the latch at the intersection of the two active wires to be enabled, but all of the other latches should stay disabled. For this, we can use our trusty AND gate. The AND gate will output a 1 only if the row and the column wires are both 1. So we can use this signal to uniquely select a single latch. This row and column setup connects all of our latches with a single shared write enable wire. In order for a latch to become write enabled, the row wire, the column wire and the write enable wire must all be 1. That should only ever be true for one single latch at any given time. This means we can use a single shared wire for data because only one latch will ever be write enabled. Only one will ever save the data. The rest of the latches will simply ignore values on the data wire because they are not write enabled. We can use the same trick with a read enable wire to read the data later, to get the data out of one specific latch. This means in total for 256 bits of memory, we only need 35 wires. One data wire, one write enabled wire, one read enable wire, and 16 rows and columns for the selection. That's significant wire savings. But we need a way to uniquely specify each intersection. We can think of this like a city, where you might want to meet someone at 12th Avenue and 8th Street. That's an address that defines an intersection. The latch we just saved our one bit into has an address of row 12 and column 8. Since there is a maximum of 16 rows, we store the row address in a 4-bit number. 12 is 1100 in binary. We could do the same for the column address. 8 is 1000 in binary. So the address for the particular latch we just used can be written as 1100 1000. To convert from an address into something that selects the right row or column, we need a special component called a multiplexer, which is a computer component with a pretty cool name, at least compared to the ALU. Multiplexers come in all different sizes, but because we have 16 rows, we need a 1 to 16 multiplexer. It works like this. You feed it a 4-bit number and it connects the input line to a corresponding output line. So if we pass in 0000, it will select the very first column for us. If we pass in 0001, the next column is selected and so on. We need one multiplexer to handle our rows and another multiplexer to handle the columns. OK, it's starting to get complicated again, so let's make our 256-bit memory its own component. It takes an 8-bit address for input, the 4 bits for the column and 4 for the row. We also need write and read enable wires. And finally, we need just one data wire, which can be used to read or write data. Unfortunately, even 256 bits of memory isn't enough to run much of anything, so we need to scale up even more. We're going to put them in a row, just like with the registers. We'll make a row of 8 of them so we can store an 8-bit number, also known as a byte. To do this, we feed the exact same address into all eight of our 256-bit memory components at the same time. And each one saves one bit of the number. That means the component we just made can store 256 bytes at 256 different addresses. Again, to keep things simple, we want to leave behind this inner complexity. Instead of thinking of this as a series of individual memory modules and circuits, we'll think of it as a uniform bank of addressable memory. We have 256 addresses, and at each address, we can read or write an 8-bit value. We're going to use this memory component next episode when we build our CPU. The way that modern computers scale to megabytes and gigabytes of memory is by doing the same thing we've been doing here. Keep packaging up little bundles of memory into larger and larger and larger arrangements. And as the number of memory locations grow, our addresses have to grow as well. 8 bits hold enough numbers to provide addresses for 256 bytes of our memory. But that's all. To address a gigabyte or a billion bytes of memory, we need 32-bit addresses. An important property of this memory is that we can access any memory location at any 
time and in a random order. For this reason, it's called random access memory, or RAM. When you hear people talking about how much RAM a computer has, that's the computer's memory. RAM is like a human short-term or working memory, where you keep track of things going on right now, like whether or not you had lunch or paid your phone bill. Here's an actual stick of RAM, with eight memory modules soldered onto the board. If we carefully opened up one of these modules and zoomed in, the first thing you would see are 32 squares of memory. Zoom into one of those squares and we can see each one is comprised of four smaller blocks. If we zoom in again, we get down to the matrix of individual bits. This is a matrix of 128 by 64 bits. That's 8,192 bits in total. Each of our 32 squares has four matrices, so that's 32,768 bits. And there are 32 squares in total, so all in all, that's roughly 1 million bits of memory in each chip. Our RAM stick has eight of these chips, so in total, this RAM can store 8 million bits, otherwise known as 1 megabyte. That's not a lot of memory these days. This is a RAM module from the 1980s. Today you can buy RAM that has a gigabyte or more of memory. That's billions of bytes of memory. So today we built a piece of SRAM, static random access memory, which uses latches. And there are other types of RAM, such as DRAM, flash memory, and NVRAM. These are very similar in function to SRAM but use different circuits to store the individual bits. For example, using different logic gates, capacitors, charge traps, or memristors. But fundamentally, all of these technologies store bits of information in massively nested matrices of memory cells. Like many things in computing, the fundamental operation is relatively simple. It's the layers and layers of abstraction that's mind-blowing, like a Russian doll that keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Today, we're talking about processors. Just a warning though, this is probably the most complicated complicated episode in the series, so once you get this, you're golden. We've already made an arithmetic and logic unit which takes in binary numbers and performs calculations, and we've made two types of computer memory. Registers, small linear chunks of memory, useful for storing a single value, and then we scaled up and made some RAM, a larger bank of memory that can store a lot of numbers located at different addresses. Now it's time to put it all together and build ourselves the heart of any computer, but without any of the emotional baggage that comes with human hearts. For computers, this is the central processing unit most commonly called the CPU. A CPU's job is to execute programs. Programs like Microsoft Office, Safari, or your beloved copy of Half-Life 2 are made up of a series of individual operations called instructions because they instruct the computer what to do. If these are mathematical instructions like add or subtract, the CPU will configure its ALU to do the mathematical operation. Or it might be a memory instruction, in which case the CPU will talk with the memory to read and write values. There are a lot of parts in a CPU, so we're going to lay it out piece by piece building up as we go. We'll focus on functional blocks rather than showing every single wire. When we do connect two components with a line, this is just another level of abstraction. This high level view is called the micro architecture. Okay, first we're going to need some memory. Let's drop in the RAM module we created last episode. To keep things simple, we'll assume it only has 16 memory locations, each containing eight bits. Let's also give our processor four 8-bit memory registers labeled A, B, C, and D, which will be used to temporarily store and manipulate values. We already know that data can be stored in memory as binary values, and programs can be stored in memory too. We can assign an ID to each instruction supported by our CPU. In our hypothetical example, we use the first four bits to store the operation code, or opcode for short. The final four bits specify where the data for that operation should come from. This can be registers or an address in memory. We also need two more registers to complete our CPU. First, we need a register to keep track of where we are in a program. For this, we use an instruction address register, which as the name suggests, stores the memory address of the current instruction. And then we need the other register to store the current instruction, which we'll call the instruction register. When we first boot up our computer, all of our registers start at zero. As an example, we've initialized our RAM with a simple computer program that we'll go through today. The first phase of a CPU's operation is called the fetch phase. This is where we retrieve our first instruction. First, we wire our instruction address register to our RAM module. The register's value is zero, so the RAM returns whatever value is stored in address zero. In this case, 00101110. Then this value is copied into our instruction register. Now that we've fetched an instruction from memory, we need to figure out what that instruction is so we can execute it. That is, run it, not kill it. This is called the decode phase. 
In this case, the opcode, which is the first four bits, is 0010. This opcode corresponds to the load A instruction, which loads a value from RAM into register A. The RAM address is the last four bits of our instruction, which are 1110, or 14 in decimal. Next, instructions are decoded and interpreted by a control unit. Like everything else we've built, it too is made out of logic gates. For example, to recognize a load A instruction, we need a circuit that checks if this opcode matches 0010, which we could do with a handful of logic gates. Now that we know what instruction we're dealing with, we can go ahead and perform that instruction, which is the beginning of the execute phase. Using the output of our load A checking circuit, we can turn on the RAM's read enable line and send in address 14. The RAM retrieves the value at that address, which is 0000, 0011, or 3 in decimal. Now, because this is a load A instruction, we want the value to only be saved into register A and not any of the other registers. So if we connect the RAM's data wires to our four data registers, we can use our load A check circuit to turn on the write enable only for register A. And there you have it, we've successfully loaded the value at RAM address 14 into register A. We've completed the instruction, so we can turn all of our wires off, and we're ready to fetch the next instruction in memory. To do this, we increment the instruction address register by one, which completes the execute phase. Load A is just one of several possible instructions that our CPU can execute. Different instructions are decoded by different logic circuits, which configure the CPU's components to perform that action. Looking at all those individual decode circuits is too much detail, so since we looked at one example, we're going to go ahead and package them all up as a single control unit to keep things simple. The control unit is comparable to the conductor of an orchestra, directing all of the different parts of the CPU. Having completed one full fetch decode execute cycle, we're ready to start all over again, beginning with the fetch phase. The instruction address register now has the value 1 in it, so the RAM gives us the value stored at address 1, which is 00011111. On to the decode phase. 0001 is the load B instruction, which moves a value from RAM into register B. The memory location this time is 1111, which is 15 in decimal. Now to the execute phase. The control unit configures the RAM to read address 15 and configures register B to receive that data. Bingo, we just saved the value 00001110, or the number 14 in decimal, into register B. Last thing to do is to increment our instruction address register by one, and we're done with another cycle. Our next instruction is a bit different. Let's fetch it. 10000100. That opcode 1000 is an add instruction. Instead of a 4-bit RAM address, this instruction uses two sets of 2 bits. Remember that 2 bits can encode 4 values, so 2 bits is enough to select any one of our 4 registers. The first set of 2 bits is 0, 01, which in this case corresponds to register B, and 00, 0 which is register A. So 1000100 is the instruction for adding the value in register B into the value in register A. So to execute this instruction, we need to integrate the ALU we made in episode 5 into our CPU. The control unit is responsible for selecting the right registers to pass in as inputs and configuring the ALU to perform the right operation. For this add instruction, the control unit enables register B and feeds its value into the first input of the ALU. It also enables register A and feeds it into the second ALU input. As we already discussed, the ALU itself can perform several different operations, so the control unit must configure it to perform an add operation by passing in the add opcode. Finally, the output should be saved into register A, but it can't be written directly because the new value would ripple back into the ALU and then keep adding to itself. So the control unit uses an internal register to temporarily save the output turn off the ALU, and then write the value into the proper destination register. In this case, our inputs were 3 and 14, and so the sum is 17, or 0001-0001 in binary, which is now sitting in register A. As before, the last thing to do is increment our instruction address by 1, and another cycle is complete. OK, so let's fetch one last instruction. 01001101. When we decode it, we see that 0100 is a store A instruction with a RAM address of 13. As usual, we pass the address to the RAM module, but instead of read enabling the memory, we write enable it. At the same time, we read enable register A. This allows us to use the data line to pass in the value stored in register A. Congrats, we just ran our first computer program. It loaded two values from memory, added them together, and then saved that sum back into memory. Of course, by me talking you through the individual steps, I was manually transitioning the CPU through its fetch, 
decode and execute phases. But there isn't a mini carry-on inside of every computer. So the responsibility of keeping the CPU ticking along falls to the component called the clock. As its name suggests, the clock triggers an electrical signal at a precise and regular interval. Its signal is used by the control unit to advance the internal operation of the CPU, keeping everything in lockstep, like the dude on a Roman galley drumming rhythmically at the front, keeping all the rowers synchronized or a metronome. Of course, you can't go too fast because even electricity takes some time to travel down wires and for the signal to settle. The speed at which a CPU can carry out each step of the fetch, decode, execute cycle is called its clock speed. This speed is measured in hertz, a unit of frequency. One hertz means one cycle per second. Given that it took me about six minutes to talk you through four instructions, load, load, add and store, that means I have an effective clock speed of roughly 0.03 hertz. Admittedly, I'm not a great computer, but even someone handy with math might only be able to do one calculation in their head every second, or one hertz. The very first single chip CPU was the Intel 4004, a 4-bit CPU released in 1971. Its micro architecture is actually pretty similar to our example CPU. Despite being the first processor of its kind, it had a mind-blowing clock speed of 740 kilohertz. That's 740,000 cycles per second. You might think that's fast, but it's nothing compared to the processes that we use today. One megahertz is one million clock cycles per second. And the computer or even phone that you're watching this video on right now is no doubt a few gigahertz. That's billions of CPU cycles every single second. Also, you may have heard of people overclocking their computers. This is when you modify the clock to speed up the tempo of the CPU. Like when the drummer speeds up when the Roman galley needs to ram another ship. Chip makers often design CPUs with enough tolerance to handle a little bit of overclocking. But too much can either overheat the CPU or produce gobbledygook because the signals fall behind the clock. And although you don't hear very much about underclocking, it's actually super useful. Sometimes it's not necessary to run the processor at full speed. Maybe the user has stepped away or is just not running a particularly demanding program. By slowing the CPU down, you can save a lot of power, which is important for computers that run on batteries like laptops and smartphones. To meet these needs, many modern processors can increase or decrease their clock speed based on demand, which is called dynamic frequency scaling. So with the addition of a clock, our CPU is complete. We can now put a box around it and make it its own component. RAM, as I showed you last episode, lies outside the CPU as its own component, and they communicate with each other using address, data, and enable wires. Although the CPU we designed today is a simplified example, many of the basic mechanics we discussed are still found in modern processors. Next episode, we're going to beef up our CPU, extending it with more instructions as we take our first baby steps into software. And last episode, we combined an ALU control unit, some memory, and a clock together to make a basic but functional central processing unit, or CPU, the beating, ticking heart of a computer. We've done all the hard work of building many of these components from the electronic circuits up, and now it's time to give our CPU some actual instructions to process. The thing that makes a CPU powerful is the fact that it is programmable. If you write a different sequence of instructions, then the CPU will perform a different task. So the CPU is a piece of hardware controlled by easy to modify software. Let's quickly revisit the simple program we stepped through last episode. The computer memory looked like this. Each address contained eight bits of data. For our hypothetical CPU, the first four bits specified the operation code, or op code, and the second set of four bits specified an address or registers. In memory address zero, we have 00101110. Again, those first four bits are our op code, which corresponds to a load A instruction. This instruction reads data from a location of memory specified in those last four bits of the instruction and saves it into register A, in this case 1110 or 14 in decimal. So let's not think of this memory address 0 as 00101110, but rather as the instruction load A14. That's much easier to read and understand and for me to say. And we can do the same thing for the rest of the data in memory. In this case, our program is just four instructions long and we've put some numbers into memory 2 and 14. So now let's step through this program. First is load A14, which takes the value in address 14, which is the number 3, and stores it into register A. Then we have a load B15 instruction, which takes the value in memory location 15, which was the number 14, and saves it into register B. Okay, easy enough, but now we have an add instruction. This tells the processor to use the ALU to add two registers together. In this case, B and A are specified. 
The ordering is important because the resulting sum is saved into the second register that's specified. So in this case, the resulting sum is saved into register A. And finally, our last instruction is store A13, which instructs the CPU to write whatever value is in register A into memory location 13. Yes! Our program adds two numbers together. That's about as exciting as it gets when we only have four instructions to play with. So let's add some more. Now we've got a subtract function, which like add specifies two registers to operate on. We've also got a fancy new instruction called jump. As the name implies, this causes the program to jump to a new location. This is useful if you want to change the order or skip some instructions. For example, a jump zero would cause the program to go back to the beginning. At a low level, this is done by writing the value specified in the last four bits into the instruction address register, overwriting the current value. We've also added a special version of jump called jump negative. This only jumps the program if the ALU's negative flag is set to true. As we talked about in episode five, the negative flag is only set when the result of an arithmetic operation is negative. If the result was zero or positive, the negative flag would not be set, so the jump negative wouldn't jump anywhere, and the CPU will just continue on to the next instruction. And finally, computers need to be told when to stop processing, so we need a halt instruction. Our previous program really should have looked like this to be correct. Otherwise, the CPU would have just continued on after the store instruction, processing all those zeros. But there is no instruction with an opcode of zero, and so the computer would have just crashed. It's important to point out here that we're storing both instructions and data in the same memory. There is no difference fundamentally, it's all just binary numbers. So the halt instruction is really important because it allows us to separate the two. Okay, so let's make our program a bit more interesting by adding a jump. We'll also modify our two starting values in memory to one and one. Let's step through this program just as our CPU would. First, load A14 loads the value one into register A. Next, load B15 loads the value one into register B. As before, we add registers B and A together, with the sum going into register A. 1 plus 1 equals 2, so now register A has the value 2 in it, stored in binary of course. Then the store instruction saves that into memory location 13. Now we hit a jump to instruction. This causes the processor to overwrite the value in the instruction address register, which is currently 4 with the new value 2. On the processor's next fetch cycle, we don't fetch halt. Instead, we fetch the instruction at memory location 2, which is add B A. We've jumped! Register A contains the value 2, and register B contains the value 1, so 1 plus 2 equals 3. So now register A has the value 3. We store that into memory, and we've hit the jump again, back to add B A. 1 plus 3 equals 4, so now register A has the value 4. See what's happening here? Every loop we're adding one is counting up. Cool. But notice there's no way to ever escape. We're never ever going to hit that halt instruction, because we're always going to hit that jump. This is called an infinite loop, a program that runs forever, ever, 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 ever. To break the loop, we need a conditional jump, a jump that only happens if a certain condition is met. Our jump negative is one example of a conditional jump, but computers have other types too, like jump if equal and jump if greater. So let's make our code a little fancier and step through it. Just like before, the program starts by loading values from memory into registers A and B. In this example, the number 11 gets loaded into register A and 5 gets loaded into register B. Now we subtract register B from register A. That's 11 minus 5, which is 6, and so 6 gets saved into register A. Now we hit our jump negative. The last ALU result was 6. That's a positive number, so the negative flag is false. That means the processor does not jump, so we continue on to the next instruction which is jump 2. No conditional on this one, so we jump to instruction 2 no matter what. OK, so we're back at our subtract register B from register A. 6 minus 5 equals 1, so 1 gets saved into register A. Next instruction, we're back again at our jump negative. 1 is also a positive number, so the CPU continues on to the jump 2, looping back around again to the subtract instruction. This time is different though. 1 minus 5 is negative 4, and so the ALU sets its negative flag to true for the first time. Now when we advance to the next instruction, jump negative 5, the CPU executes the jump to memory location 5. We're out of the infinite loop. Now we have an add B to A. Negative 4 plus 5 is positive 1, and we save that into register A. Next we have a story instruction that saves register A into memory address 13. Lastly, we hit our halt instruction and the computer rests. 
So even though this program is only seven instructions long, the CPU ended up executing 13 instructions, and that's because it looped twice internally. This code calculated the remainder if we divide five into 11, which is one. With a few extra lines of code, we could also keep track of how many loops we did, the count of which would be how many times five went into 11. We did two loops, so that means five goes into 11 two times, with a remainder of one. And of course, this code could work for any two numbers, which we can just change in memory to whatever we want. 7 and 81, 18 and 54, it doesn't matter. That's the power of software. Software also allowed us to do something our hardware could not. Remember our ALU didn't have the functionality to divide two numbers. Instead, it's the program we made that gave us that functionality. And then other programs can use our divide program to do even fancier things. And you know what that means, new levels of abstraction. So our hypothetical CPU is very basic. All of its instructions are eight bits long, with the opcode occupying only the first four bits. So even if we used every combination of four bits, our CPU would only be able to support a maximum of 16 different instructions. On top of that, several of our instructions use the last four bits to specify a memory location. But again, four bits can only encode 16 different values, meaning we can address a maximum of 16 memory locations. That's not a lot to work with. For example, we couldn't even jump to location 17 because we literally can't fit the number 17 into four bits. For this reason, real modern CPUs use two strategies. The most straightforward approach is just to have bigger instructions with more bits, like 32 or 64 bits. This is called the instruction length unsurprisingly. The second approach is to use variable length instructions. For example, imagine a CPU that uses 8-bit opcodes. When the CPU sees an instruction that needs no extra values, like the halt instruction, it can just execute it immediately. However, if it sees something like a jump instruction, it knows it must also fetch the address to jump to, which is saved immediately behind the jump instruction in memory. This is called, logically enough, an immediate value. In such processor designs, instructions can be any number of bytes long, which makes the fetch cycle of the CPU a tad more complicated. Now, our example CPU and instruction set is hypothetical, designed to illustrate key working principles. So I want to leave you with a real CPU example. In 1971, Intel released the 4004 processor. It was the first CPU placed in a single chip and paved the path to the Intel processors we know and love today. It supported the 46 instructions shown here, which was enough to build an entire working computer. And it used many of the instructions we've talked about, like jump, add, subtract, and load. It also uses 8-bit immediate values, like we just talked about, for things like jumps, in order to address more memory. And processors have come a long way since 1971. A modern computer processor like an Intel Core i7 has thousands of different instructions and instruction variants, ranging from 1 to 15 bytes long. For example, there's over a dozen different opcodes just for variants of add. And this huge growth in instruction set size is due in large part to extra bells and whistles that have been added to processor designs over time, which we'll talk about more next episode. As we've discussed throughout the series, computers have come a long way from mechanical devices capable of maybe one calculation per second to CPUs running at kilohertz and megahertz speeds. The device you're watching this video on right now is almost certainly running at gigahertz speeds. That's billions of instructions executed every second, which trust me, is a lot of computation. In the early days of electronic computing, processors were typically made faster by improving the switching time of the transistors inside the chip the ones that make up all the logic gates, ALUs, and other stuff we've talked about over the past few episodes. But just making transistors faster and more efficient only went so far. So processor designers have developed various techniques to boost performance, allowing not only simple instructions to run fast, but also performing much more sophisticated operations. Last episode, we created a small program for our CPU that allowed us to divide two numbers. We did this by doing many subtractions in a row. So for example, 16 divided by four could be broken down into the smaller problem of 16 minus four, minus four, minus four, minus four. When we hit zero or a negative number, we knew that we were done. But this approach gobbles up a lot of clock cycles and isn't particularly efficient. So most computer processors today have divide as one of the instructions that the ALU can perform in hardware. Of course, this extra circuitry makes the ALU bigger and more complicated to design, but also more capable. It's a complexity for speed trade-off that has been made many times in computing history. For instance, modern computer processors now have special circuits for things like graphics operations, 
applications, decoding compressed video and encrypting files, all of which are operations that would take many, many, many clock cycles to perform with standard operations. You may even have heard of processors with MMX, 3D Now or SSE. These are processors with additional fancy circuits that allow them to execute additional fancy instructions for things like gaming and encryption. These extensions to the instruction set have grown and grown over time, and once people have written programs to take advantage of them, it's hard to remove them. So instruction sets tend to keep getting larger and larger, keeping all the old opcodes around for backwards compatibility. The Intel 4004, the first truly integrated CPU, had 46 instructions, which was enough to build a fully functional computer. But a modern computer processor has thousands of different instructions, which utilizes all sorts of clever and complex internal circuitry. Now, high clock speeds and fancy instruction sets tend to lead to another problem, getting data in and out of the CPU quickly enough. It's like having a powerful steam locomotive, but no way to shovel in coal fast enough. In this case, the bottleneck is RAM. RAM is typically a memory module that lies outside the CPU. This means that data has to be transmitted to and from RAM along sets of data wires, called a bus. This bus might only be a few centimeters long, and remember those electrical signals are traveling near the speed of light. But when you're operating at gigahertz speeds, that's billionths of a second. Even this small delay starts to become problematic. It also takes time for RAM itself to look up the address, retrieve the data, and configure itself for output. So a load from RAM instruction might take dozens of clock cycles to complete. And during this time, the processor is just sitting there idly waiting for the data. One solution is to put a little piece of RAM right on the CPU called a cache. There isn't a lot of space on a processor's chip, so most caches are just kilobytes or maybe megabytes in size, whereas RAM is usually gigabytes. Having a cache speeds things up in a clever way. When the CPU requests a memory location from RAM, the RAM can transmit not just one single value, but a whole block of data. This takes only a little bit more time, but it allows this data block to be saved into the cache. This tends to be really useful because computer data is often arranged and processed sequentially. For example, let's say the processor is totaling up daily sales for a restaurant. It starts by fetching the first transaction from RAM at memory location 100. The RAM, instead of sending back just that one value, sends a block of data from memory location 100 through 200, which are then all copied into the cache. Now, when the processor requests the next transaction to add to its running total, the value at address 101, the cache will say, oh, I've already got that value right here, so I can give it to you right away and there's no need to go all the way to RAM. Because the cache is so close to the processor, it can typically provide the data in a single clock cycle, no waiting required. This speeds things up tremendously over having to go back and forth to RAM every single time. When data requested in RAM is already stored in the cache like this, it's called a cache hit. And if the data requested isn't in the cache, so you have to go to RAM, it's called a cache miss. The cache can also be used like a scratch space, storing intermediate values when performing a longer or more complicated calculation. Continuing our restaurant example, let's say the processor has finished totaling up all of the sales for the day and wants to store the result in memory address 150. Like before, instead of going back all the way to RAM to save that value, it can be stored in cache copy, which is faster to save to and also faster to access later if more calculations are needed. But this introduces an interesting problem. The cache's copy of data is now different to the real version stored in RAM. This mismatch has to be recorded so that at some point everything can get synced up. For this purpose, the cache has a special flag for each block of memory it stores, called the dirty bit, which might just be the best term computer scientists have ever invented. Most often this synchronization happens when the cache is full, but a new block of memory is being requested by the processor. Before the cache erases the old block to free up space, it checks its dirty bit, and if it's dirty, the old block of data is written back to RAM before loading in the new block. Another trick to boost CPU performance is called instruction pipelining. Imagine you have to wash an entire hotel's worth of sheets, you've only got one washing machine and one dryer. One option is to do it all sequentially. Put a batch of sheets in the washer and wait 30 minutes for it to finish. Then take the wet sheets out, put them in the dryer and wait another 30 minutes for that to finish. This allows you to do one batch of sheets every hour. Side note, if you have a dryer that can dry a load of laundry in 30 minutes, please tell me the brand and model in the comments because I'm living with 90 minute dry times minimum. But even with this magic clothes dryer, you can speed things up even more if you parallelize your operation. As before, you start off putting one batch of sheets in the washer, you wait 30 minutes for it to finish, then you take the wet sheets out and put them in the dryer. But this time, instead of just waiting 30 minutes for the dryer to finish, you simultaneously start another load in the washing machine. 
Now you've got both machines going at once. Wait 30 minutes and one batch is now done. One batch is half done and another is ready to go in. This effectively doubles your throughput. Processor designs can apply the same idea. In episode 7, our example processor performed the fetch, decode, execute cycle sequentially and in a continuous loop. Fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute, fetch, decode, execute and so on. This meant our design required three clock cycles to execute one instruction. But each of these stages uses a different part of the CPU, meaning there is an opportunity to parallelize. While one instruction is getting executed, the next instruction could be getting decoded and the instruction beyond that fetched from memory. All of these separate processes can overlap so that all parts of the CPU are active at any given time. In this pipeline design, an instruction is executed every single clock cycle, which triples the throughput. But just like with caching, this can lead to some tricky problems. A big hazard is a dependency in the instruction instructions. For example, you might fetch something that the currently executing instruction is just about to modify, which means you'll end up with the old value in the pipeline. To compensate for this, pipeline processors have to look ahead for data dependencies and, if necessary, store their pipelines to avoid problems. High-end processors like those found in laptops and smartphones go one step further and can dynamically reorder instructions with dependencies in order to minimize stalls and keep the pipeline moving, which is called out-of-order execution. As you might imagine, the circuits that figure this all out are incredibly complicated. Nonetheless, pipelining is tremendously effective and almost all processors implement it today. Another big hazard are conditional jump instructions. We talked about one example, a jump negative, last episode. These instructions change the execution flow of a program depending on a value. A simple pipelined processor will perform a long stall when it sees a jump instruction, waiting for the value to be finalized. Only once the jump outcome is known does the processor start refilling its pipeline. But this can produce long delays, so high-end processors have some tricks to deal with with this problem too. Imagine an upcoming jump instruction as a fork in the road, a branch. Advanced CPUs guess which way they're going to go and start filling their pipeline with instructions based off that guess, a technique called speculative execution. When the jump instruction is finally resolved, if the CPU guessed correctly, then the pipeline is already full of the correct instructions and it can motor along without delay. However, if the CPU guessed wrong, it has to discard all of its speculative results and perform a pipeline flush. Sort of like when you miss a turn and have to do a U-turn to get back en route and stop your GPS's insistent shouting! To minimize the effects of these flushes, CPU manufacturers have developed sophisticated ways to guess which way branches will go, called branch prediction. Instead of being a 50-50 guess, today's processors can often guess with over 90% accuracy. In an ideal case, pipelining lets you complete one instruction every single clock cycle. But then superscalar processors came along, which could execute more than one instruction per clock cycle. During the execute phase, even in a pipeline design, whole areas of the processor might be totally idle. For example, while executing an instruction that fetches a value from memory, the ALU is just going to be sitting there, not doing a thing. So why not fetch and decode several instructions at once, and whenever possible, execute instructions that require different different parts of the CPU all at the same time. But we can take this one step further and add duplicate circuitry for popular instructions. For example, many processors will have four, eight or more identical ALUs, so they can execute many mathematical instructions all in parallel. OK, the techniques we've discussed so far primarily optimize the execution throughput of a single stream of instructions. But another way to increase performance is to run several streams of instructions at once with multi-core processors. You might have heard of dual-core or quad-core processors. This means that there are multiple independent processing units inside of a single CPU chip. In many ways, this is very much like having multiple separate CPUs. But because they're tightly integrated, they can share some resources, like cache, allowing the cores to work together on shared computations. But when more cores just isn't enough, you can build computers with multiple independent CPUs. High-end computers like the server streaming this video from YouTube's data center often need the extra horsepower to keep it silky smooth for the hundreds of people watching simultaneously. Two and four processor configurations are the most common right now, but every now and again, even that much processing power isn't enough, so we humans get extra ambitious and build ourselves a supercomputer! If you're looking to do some really monster calculations, like simulating the formation of the universe, you're going to need some pretty serious computing power. A few extra processors in a desktop computer just isn't going to cut it. You're going to need a lot of processors. No, no, even more than that, a lot more. When this video was made, the world's fastest computer was located in the National Supercomputing Center in Wuxi, China. The Sunway Taohao Light contains a brain-melting 40,960 CPUs, each with 256 cores. That's over 10 million cores in total, and each one of those cores runs at 1.45 gigahertz. In total, this machine can process 93 quadrillion, that's 93 million billions, floating-point math operations per second, known as flops. 
And trust me, that's a lot of flops. No word on whether it can run Crisis at max settings, but I suspect it might. So long story short, not only have computer processors gotten a lot faster over the years, but also a lot more sophisticated, employing all sorts of clever tricks to squeeze out more and more computation per clock cycle. Our job is to wield that incredible processing power to do cool and useful things. That's the essence of programming, which we'll start discussing next episode. Over the last few episodes, we've talked a lot about the mechanics of how computers work how they use complex circuits to save and retrieve values from memory and perform operations on those values, like adding two numbers together. We've even briefly talked about sequences of operations, which is a computer program. But what we haven't talked about is how a program gets into a computer. You might remember in episodes 7 and 8 that we stepped through some simple example programs for the CPU that we had created. For simplicity, we just waved our hands and said that the program was already magically in memory. But in reality, programs have to be loaded into a computer's memory. It's not magic, it's computer science. The need to program machines existed way before the development of computers. The most famous example of this was in textile manufacturing. If you just wanted to weave a big red tablecloth, you could simply feed red thread into a loom and let it run. But what about if you wanted the cloth to have a pattern, like stripes or plaid? Workers would have to periodically reconfigure the loom as dictated by the pattern. But this was labour intensive, which made pattern fabrics expensive. In response, Joseph Marie Jacquard developed a programmable textile loom, which he first demonstrated in 1801. The pattern for each row of the cloth was defined by a punched card. The presence or absence of a hole in the card determined if a specific thread was held high or low in the loom, such that the cross thread, called the weft, passed above or below the thread. To vary the pattern across rows, these punch cards were arranged in long chains, forming a sequence of commands for the loom. Sound familiar? Many consider Jacquard's loom to be one of the earliest forms of programming. Punched cards turned out to be a cheap, reliable, and fairly human-readable way to store data. Nearly a century later, punch cards were used to help tabulate the 1890 US Census, which we talked about in episode 1. Each card held an individual person's data, things like race, marital status, number of children, country of birth, and so on. For each demographic question, a census worker would punch out a hole at the appropriate position. When a card was fed into the tabulating machine, a hole would cause the running total for that specific answer to be increased by one. In this way, you could feed the entire county's worth of people, and at the end, you'd have running totals for all of the questions that you asked. It's important to note here that early tabulating machines were not truly computers, as they could only do one thing, tabulate. Their operation was fixed and not programmable. Punch cards stored data, but not a program. Over the next 60 years, these business machines grew in capability, adding features to subtract, multiply, divide, and even make simple decisions about when to perform certain operations. To trigger these functions appropriately, so that different calculations could be performed, a programmer accessed a control panel. This panel was full of little sockets, into which a programmer would plug cables to pass values and signals between different parts of the machine. For this reason, they were also called plug boards. Unfortunately, this meant having to rewire the machine each time a different program needed to be run. And so by the 1920s, these plug boards were made swappable. This not only made programming a lot more comfortable, but also allowed for different programs to be plugged into a machine. For example, one board might be wired to calculate sales tax, while another helped with payroll. But plug boards were fiendishly complicated to program. This tangle of wires is a program for calculating a profit and loss summary, using an IBM 402 accounting machine, which were popular in the 1940s. And this style of plug board programming wasn't unique to electromechanical computers. The world's first general purpose electronic computer, the ENIAC, completed in 1946, used a ton of them. Even after a program had been completely figured out on paper, physically wiring up the ENIAC and getting the program to run could take upwards of three weeks. Given the enormous cost of these early computers, weeks of downtime simply to switch programs was unacceptable, and a new, faster, more flexible way to program program machines was badly needed. Fortunately, by the late 1940s and into the 50s, electronic memory was becoming feasible. As costs fell, memory size grew. Instead of storing a program as a physical plug board of wires, it became possible to store a program entirely in a computer's memory, where it could be easily changed by programmers and quickly accessed by the CPU. These machines were called stored program computers. With enough computer memory, you could store not only the program you wanted to run, but also any data your program would need, including new values it created along the way. Unifying the program and data into a single shared memory is called the von Neumann architecture, named after John von Neumann, a prominent mathematician and physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project and several early electronic computers, and once said, 
I am thinking about something much more important than bombs. I'm thinking about computers. The hallmarks of a von Neumann computer are a processing unit containing an arithmetic logic unit, data registers, an instruction register, and instruction address register. And finally, a memory to store both data and instructions. Hopefully this sounds familiar because we actually built a von Neumann computer in episode seven. The very first von Neumann architecture stored program computer was constructed in 1948 by the University of Manchester, nicknamed Baby. And even the computer you're watching this video on right now uses the same architecture. Now, electronic computer memory is great and all, but you still have to load the program and data into the computer before it can run. And for this reason, punch cards were used. Let's go to the thought bubble. Well into the 1980s, almost all computers had a punch card reader, which could suck in a single punch card at a time and write the contents of the card into the computer's memory. If you loaded in a stack of punch cards, the reader would load them all into memory sequentially as a big block. Once the program and data were in memory, the computer would be told to execute it. Of course, even simple computer programs might have hundreds of instructions, which meant that programs were stored as stacks of punch cards. So if you ever had the misfortune of accidentally dropping your program on the floor, it could take you hours, days, or even weeks to put the code back in the right order. A common trick was to draw a diagonal line on the side of the card stack called striping, so you'd have at least some clue how to get it back into the right order. Phew. The largest program ever punched into punch cards was the US Air Force's Sage Air Defense System, completed in 1955. At its peak, the project is said to have employed 20% of the world's programmers. Its main control program was stored on a whopping 62,500 punch cards, which is equivalent to roughly five megabytes of data. Pretty underwhelming by today's standards. And punch cards weren't only useful for getting data into computers, but also getting data out of them. At the end of a program, results could be written out of computer memory and onto punch cards by, well, punching cards. Then this data could be analyzed by humans or loaded into a second program for additional computation. Thanks, Thought Bubble. A close cousin to punch cards was punched paper tape, which was basically the same idea, but continuous instead of being on individual cards. And of course, we haven't talked about hard drives, CD-ROMs, DVDs, USB thumb drives, and other similar goodies. We'll get to those more advanced types of data storage in a future episode. Finally, in addition to plug boards and punch paper, there was another common way to program and control computers pre-1980, panel programming. Rather than having to physically plug in cables to activate certain functions, this could also be done with huge panels full of switches and buttons. And there were indicator lights to display the status of various functions and values in memory. Computers of the 50s and 60s often featured huge control consoles that looked like this. Although it was rare to input a whole program using just switches, it was possible. And early home computers made for the hobbyist market used switches extensively, because most home users couldn't afford expensive peripherals like punch card readers. The first commercially successful home computer was the Altair 8800, which sold in two versions, pre-assembled and as a kit. The kit, which was popular with amateur computing enthusiasts, sold for the then unprecedented low price of around $400 in 1975, or about $2,000 in 2017. To program the 8800, you'd literally toggle the switches on the front panel to enter the binary opcodes for the instruction you wanted. Then you'd press the deposit button to write that value into memory. Then in the next location in memory, you'd toggle the switches again for your next instruction, deposit it, and so on. When you had finally entered your whole program into memory, you would toggle the switches to move back to memory address zero, press the run button, and watch the little lights blink. That was home computing in 1975. Wow. Whether it was plug board switches or punched paper, programming these early computers was the realm of experts, either professionals who did this for a living or technology enthusiasts. You needed intimate knowledge of the underlying hardware, so things like processor opcodes and register widths to write programs. This meant programming was hard and tedious, and even professional engineers and scientists struggled to take full advantage of what computing could offer. What was needed was a simpler way to tell computers what to do, a simpler way to write programs. And that brings us to programming languages. So far, for most of this series, we've focused on hardware, the physical components of computing, things like electricity and circuits, registers and RAM, ALUs and CPUs. But programming at the hardware level is cumbersome and inflexible, so programmers wanted a more versatile way to program computers, what you might call a softer medium. That's right, we're going to talk about software. In episode eight, we walked through a simple program for the CPU we designed. The very first instruction to be executed, the one at memory address zero, was 00101110. As we discussed, the first four bits of an instruction is the operation code, or opt code for short. 
On our hypothetical CPU, 0010 indicated a load A instruction, which moves a value from memory into register A. The second set of four bits defines the memory location, in this case 1110, which is 14 in decimal. So what these eight numbers really mean is load address 14 into register A. We're just using two different languages. You can think of it like English and Morse code. Hello and mean the same thing. Hello, they're just encoded differently. English and Morse code also have different levels of complexity. English has 26 different letters in its alphabet and way more possible sounds. Morse only has dots and dashes, but they can convey the same information and computer languages are similar. As we've seen, computer hardware can only handle raw binary instructions. This is the language computer processors natively speak. In fact, it's the only language they're able to speak. It's called machine language or machine code. In the early days of computing, people had to write entire programs in machine code. More specifically, they'd first write a high-level version of a program on paper in English. For example, retrieve the next sale from memory, then add this to the running total for the day, week, and year, then calculate any tax to be added, and so on. An informal high-level description of a program like this is called pseudocode. Then, when the program was all figured out on paper, they'd painstakingly expand and translate it into binary machine code by hand, using things like opt-code tables. After the translation was complete, the program could be fed into the computer and run. As you might imagine, people quickly got fed up with this process. So by the late 1940s and into the 50s, programmers had developed slightly higher level languages that were more human readable. Opt-codes were given simple names called mnemonics, which were followed by operands to form instructions. So instead of having to write instructions as bunches of ones and zeros, programmers could write something like load A14. We use this mnemonic in episode eight because it's so much easier to understand. Of course, a CPU has no idea what load A14 is. It doesn't understand text-based language, only binary. And so programmers came up with a clever trick. They created reusable helper programs in binary that read in text-based instructions and assemble them into the corresponding binary instructions automatically. This program is called, you guessed it, an assembler. It reads in a program written in an assembly language and converts it to native machine code. Load A14 is one example of an assembly instruction. Over time, assemblers gained new features that made programming even easier. One nifty feature is automatically figuring out jump addresses. This was an example program I used in episode eight. Notice how our jump negative instruction jumps to address five, and our regular jump goes to address two. The problem is, if we add more code to the beginning of this program, all of the addresses would change. That's a huge pain if you ever want to update your program. And so an assembler does away with raw jump addresses and lets you insert little labels that can be jumped to. When this program is passed into the assembler, it does the work of figuring out all of the jump addresses. Now the programmer can focus more on programming and less on the underlying mechanics under the hood, enabling more sophisticated things to be built, but hiding unnecessary complexity. As we've done many times in this series, we're once again moving up another level of abstraction. However, even with nifty assembler features like auto-linking jumps to labels, assembly languages are still a thin veneer over machine code. In general, each assembly language instruction converts directly to a corresponding machine instruction, a one-to-one -one mapping, so it's inherently tied to the underlying hardware. And the assembler still forces programmers to think about which registers and memory locations they will use. If you suddenly needed an extra value, you might have to change a lot of code to fit it in. Let's go to the thought bubble. This problem did not escape Dr. Grace Hopper. As a US Naval officer, she was one of the first programmers on the Harvard Mark I computer, which we talked about in episode two. This was a colossal electromechanical beast completed in 1944 as part of the Allied war effort. Programs were stored and fed into the computer on punch paper tape. By the way, as you can see, they patched some bugs in this program by literally putting patches of paper over the holes on the punch tape. The Mark I's instruction set was so primitive, there weren't even jump instructions. To create code that repeated the same operation multiple times, you'd tape the two ends of the punch tape together, creating a physical loop. In other words, programming the Mark I was kind of a nightmare. After the war, Hopper continued to work at the forefront of computing. To unleash the potential of computers, she designed a high-level programming language called Arithmetic Language Version 0, or A0 for short. Assembly languages have direct one-to-one -one mapping to machine instructions, but a single line of a high-level programming language might result in dozens of instructions being executed by the CPU. To perform this complex translation, Hopper built the first compiler in 1952. This is a specialized program that transforms source code 
written in a programming language into a low-level language, like assembly or the binary machine code that the CPU can directly process. Thanks, Thoughtbubble. So despite the promise of easier programming, many people were skeptical of Hopper's idea. She once said, I had a running compiler and nobody would touch it. They carefully told me computers could only do arithmetic, they could not do programs. But the idea was a good one, and soon many efforts were underway to craft new programming languages. Today, there are hundreds. Sadly, there are no surviving examples of A0 code, so we'll use Python, a modern programming language, as an example. Let's say we want to add two numbers and save the value. Remember, in assembly code, we had to fetch values from memory, deal with registers and other low-level details. But this same program can be written in Python like so. Notice how there are no registers on memory locations to deal with. The compiler takes care of that stuff, abstracting away a lot of low-level and unnecessary complexity. The programmer just creates abstractions for needed memory locations, known as variables, and gives them names. So now we can just take our two numbers, store them in variables we give names to. In this case, I picked A and B, but those variables could be anything, and then add those together, saving the result in C, another variable I created. It might be that the compiler assigns register A under the hood to store the value in A, but I don't need to know about it. Out of sight, out of mind. It was an important historical milestone, but A0 and its later variants weren't widely used. Fortran, derived from formula translation, was released by IBM a few years later in 1957 and came to dominate early computer programming. John Backus, the Fortran project director, said, Much of my work has come from being lazy. I didn't like writing programs and so I started work on a programming system to make it easier to write programs. You know, typical lazy person, they're always creating their own programming systems. Anyway, on average, programs written in Fortran were 20 times shorter than equivalent handwritten assembly code. Then the Fortran compiler would translate and expand that into native machine code. The community was skeptical that the performance would be as good as handwritten code, but the fact that programmers could write more code more quickly made it an easy choice economically trading a small increase in computation time for a significant decrease in programmer time. Of course, IBM was in the business of selling computers, and so initially, Fortran code could only be compiled and run on IBM computers. And most programming languages and compilers of the 1950s could only run on a single type of computer. So if you upgraded your computer, you'd often have to rewrite all the code too. In response, computer experts from industry, academia, and government formed a consortium in 1959, the Committee on Data Systems Languages, advised by our friend Grace Hopper to guide the development of a common programming language that could be used across different machines. The result was the high-level, easy-to-use, common business-oriented language, or COBOL for short. To deal with the different underlying hardware, each computing architecture needed its own COBOL compiler. But critically, these compilers could all accept the same COBOL source code, no matter what computer it was run on. This notion is called write once, run anywhere. It's true of most programming languages today, a benefit of moving away from assembly and machine code, which is still CPU-specific. The biggest impact of all of this was reducing computing's barrier to entry. Before high-level programming languages existed, it was the realm exclusive to computer experts and enthusiasts, and it was often their full-time profession. But now, scientists, engineers, doctors, economists, teachers, and many others could incorporate computation into their work. Thanks to these languages, computing went from a cumbersome and esoteric discipline to a general purpose and accessible tool. At the same time, abstraction in programming allowed those computer experts, now professional programmers, to create increasingly sophisticated programs, which would have taken millions, tens of millions, or even more lines of assembly code. Now, this history didn't end in 1959. In fact, a golden era in programming language design jump-started, evolving in lockstep with dramatic advances in computer hardware. In the 1960s, we had languages like Algo, Lisp, and BASIC. In the 70s, Pascal, C, and Smalltalk were released. The 80s gave us C++, Objective-C, and Perl, and the 90s, Python, Ruby, and Java. And the new millennium has seen the rise of Swift, C Sharp, and Go. Not to be confused with Let It Go and Pokemon Go. Anyway, some of these might sound familiar. Many are still around today. It's extremely likely that the web browser you're using right now was written in C++ or Objective-C. That list I gave is just the tip of the iceberg, and languages with fancy new features are proposed all the time. Each new language attempts to leverage new and clever abstractions to make some aspect of programming easier or more powerful, or take advantage of emerging technologies and platforms so that more people can do more amazing things more quickly. Many consider the holy grail of programming to be the use of plain old English, where you can literally just speak what you want the computer to do, it figures it out and executes it. 
This kind of intelligent system is science fiction for now, and fans of 2001 A Space Odyssey may be okay with that. Now that you know all about programming languages, we're going to deep dive for the next couple of episodes, and we'll continue to build your understanding of how programming languages and the software they create are used to do cool and unbelievable things. Last episode, we discussed how writing programs in native machine code and having to contend with so many low-level details was a huge impediment to writing complex programs. To abstract away many of these low-level details, programming languages were developed that let programmers concentrate on solving a problem with computation and less on nitty-gritty hardware details. So today, we're going to continue that discussion and introduce some fundamental building blocks that almost all programming languages provide. Just like spoken languages, programming languages have statements. These are individual complete thoughts like I want tea or it is raining. By using different words, we can change the meaning. For example, I want tea to I want unicorns. But we can't change I want tea to I want raining. That doesn't make grammatical sense. The set of rules that govern the structure and composition of statements in a language is called syntax. The English language has syntax and so do all programming languages. A equals five is a programming language statement. In this case, the statement says a variable named A has the number five stored in it. This is called an assignment statement because we're assigning a value to a variable. To express more complex things, we need a series of statements like A is five, B is 10, C equals A plus B. This program tells the computer to set variable A equal to five, variable B to 10, and finally to add A and B together and put that result, which is 15, into, you guessed it, variable C. Note that we can call variables whatever we want. Instead of A, B, and C, it could be apples, pears, and fruits. The computer doesn't care as long as the variables are uniquely named, but it's probably probably best practice to name them things that make sense in case someone else is trying to understand your code. A program, which is a list of instructions, is a bit like a recipe. Boil water, add noodles, wait 10 minutes, drain and enjoy. In the same way, the program starts at the first statement and runs down one at a time until it hits the end. So far, we've added two numbers together. Boring. Let's make a video game instead. Of course, it's way too early to think about coding the entire game. So instead, we'll use our example to write little snippets of code that cover some programming fundamentals. Imagine we're building an old school arcade game where Grace Hopper has to capture bugs before they get into the Harvard Mark I and crash the computer. On every level, the number of bugs increases. Grace has to catch them before they wear out any relays in the machine. Fortunately, she has a few extra relays for repairs. To get started, we'll need to keep track of a bunch of values that are important for gameplay, like what level the player is on, the score, the number of bugs remaining, as well as the number of spare relays in Grace's inventory. So we must initialize our variables. That is, set their initial value. Level equals one, score equals zero, bugs equals five, spare relays equals four, and player name equals Andre. To create an interactive game, we need to control the flow of the program beyond just running from top to bottom. To do this, we use control flow statements. There are several types, but if statements are the most common. You can think of them as if X is true, then do Y. An English language example is, if I am tired, then get tea. So if I am tired is a true statement, then I will go get tea. If I am tired is false, then I will not go get tea. An if statement is like a fork in the road. Which path you take is conditional on whether the expression is true or false. So these expressions are called conditional statements. In most programming languages, an if statement looks something like if expression, then some code, then end the if statement. For example, if level is one, then we set the score to zero because the player is just starting. We also set the number of bugs to one to keep it easy for now. Notice the lines of code that are conditional on the if statement are nested between the if and end if. Of course, we can change the conditional expression to whatever we want to test, like is score greater than 10 or is bugs less than one? And if statements can be combined with an else statement, which acts as a catch-all if the expression is false. If the level is not one, the code inside the else block will be executed instead, and the number of bugs that Grace has to battle is set to three times the level number. So on level two, it would be six bugs, and on level three, there's nine and so on. Score isn't modified in the else block, so Grace gets to keep any points earned. Here are some examples of if-then-else statements from some popular programming languages. You can see the syntax varies a little, but the underlying structure is roughly the same. If statements are executed once, a conditional path is chosen and the program moves on. To repeat some statements many times, we need to create a conditional loop. One way is a while statement, also called a while loop. As you might have guessed, this loops a piece of code while a condition is true. Regardless of the programming language, they look something like this. In our game, let's say at certain points, a friendly colleague restocks Grace with relays. Hooray! To animate him replenishing our stock back up to a maximum of four, we can use a while loop. Let's walk through this code. First, we'll assume that Grace only has one tube left when her colleague enters. When we enter the while loop, the first thing the computer does is test its conditional. Is relays less than four? Well, relays is currently one, so yes. 
Now we enter the loop. Then we hit the line of code relays equals relays plus one. This is a bit confusing because the variable is using itself as an assignment statement. So let's unpack it. You always start by figuring out the right side of the equals sign first. So what does relays plus one come out to be? Well, relays is currently the value one. So one plus one equals two. Then this result gets saved back into the variable relays, writing over the old value. So now relays stores the value two. We've hit the end of the while loop, which jumps the program back up. Just as before, we test the conditional to see if we're going to enter the loop. Is relays less than four? Well, yes, relays now equals two. So we enter the loop again. Two plus one equals three. So three is saved into relays. Loop again. Is three less than four? Yes, it is. Into the loop again. Three plus one equals four. So we save four into relays. Loop again. Is four less than four? No. So the condition is now false and thus we exit the loop and move on to any remaining code. That's how a while loop works. There's also the common for loop. Instead of being a condition controlled loop that can repeat forever until the condition is false, a for loop is count controlled. It repeats a specific number of times. They look something like this. Now let's put in some real values. This example loops 10 times because we specified that variable i starts at the value one and goes up to 10. The unique thing about a for loop is that each time it hits next, it adds one to i. When i equals 10, the computer knows it's been looped 10 times and the loop exits. We can set the number to whatever we want, 10, 42, or a billion. It's up to us. Let's say we want to give the player a bonus at the end of each level for the number of vacuum relays they have left over. As the game gets harder, it takes more skill to have unused relays. So we want the bonus to go up exponentially based on the level. We need to write a piece of code that calculates exponents. That is multiplying a number by itself a specific number of times. A loop is perfect for this. First, let's initialize a new variable called bonus and set it to one. Then we create a for loop starting at one and looping up to the level number. Inside that loop, we multiply bonus times the number of relays and save that new value back into bonus. For example, let's say relays equals two and level equals three. So the for loop will loop three times, which means bonus is going to get multiplied by relays, by relays, by relays, or in this case, times two, times two, times two, which is a bonus of eight. That's two to the third power. This exponent code is useful and we might want to use it in other parts of our code. It'd be annoying to copy and paste this everywhere and have to update the variable names each time. Also, if we found a bug, we'd have to hunt around and update every place we used it. It also makes code more confusing to look at. Less is more. What we want is a way to package up our exponent code so that we can use it, get the result and not have to see the internal complexity. We're once again moving up a new level of abstraction. To compartmentalize and hide complexity, programming languages can package pieces of code into named functions, also called methods or subroutines in different programming languages. These functions can then be used by any other part of that program just by calling its name. Let's turn our exponent code into a function. First, we should name it. We can call it anything we want, like happy unicorn. But since our code calculates exponents, let's call it exponent. Also, instead of using specific variable names like relays and levels, we specify generic variable names like base and exp, whose initial values are going to be passed into our function from some other part of the program. The rest of our code is the same as before, now tucked into our function and with new variable names. Finally, we need to send the result of our exponent code back to the part of the program that requested it. For this, we use a return statement and specify that the value in result be returned. So our full function code looks like this. Now we can use this function anywhere in our program simply by calling its name and passing in two numbers. For example, if we want to calculate two to the 44th power, we can just call exponent two comma 44. And like 18 trillion comes back. Behind the scenes, two and 44 get saved into variables base and exp inside the function. It does all of its loops as necessary and then the function returns with the result. Let's use our newly minted function to calculate a score bonus. First, we initialize bonus to zero. Then we check if the player has any remaining relays with an if statement. If they do, we call our exponent function passing in relays and level, which calculates relays to the power of level and returns the result which we save into bonus. This bonus calculating code might be useful later. So let's wrap it up as a function too. Yes, a function that calls a function. And then, wait for it, we can use this function in an even more complex function. Let's write one that gets called every time the player finishes a level. We'll call it level finished. It needs to know the number of relays left, what level it was, and the current score. Those values have to get passed in. Inside our function, we'll calculate the bonus using our calc bonus function and add that to the running score. Also, if the current score is higher than the game's high score, we save the new high score and the player's name. Finally, we return the current score. Now we're getting pretty fancy. Functions are calling functions are calling functions. When we call a single line of code like this, the complexity is hidden. 
We don't see all of the internal loops and variables, we just see the result come back as if by magic a total score of 53. But it's not magic, it's the power of abstraction. If you understand this example, then you understand the power of functions and the entire essence of modern programming. It's not feasible to write, for example, a web browser as one gigantically long list of statements. It would be millions of lines long and impossible to comprehend. So instead, software consists of thousands of smaller functions, each responsible for different features. In modern programming, it's uncommon to see functions longer than around 100 lines of code, because by then, there's probably something that should be pulled out and made into its own function. Modularizing programs into functions not only allows a single programmer to write an entire app, but also allows teams of people to work efficiently on even bigger programs. Different programmers can work on different functions, and if everyone makes sure their code works correctly, then when everything is put together, the whole program should work too. And in the real world, programmers aren't wasting time writing things like exponents. Modern programming languages come with huge bundles of pre-written functions called libraries. These are written by expert coders, made efficient and rigorously tested, and then given to everyone. There are libraries for almost everything, including networking, graphics, and sound. Topics we'll discuss in future episodes. But before we get to those, we need to talk about algorithms. Intrigued? You should be. Over the past two episodes, we got our first taste of programming in a high-level language like Python or Java. We talked about different types of programming language statements, like assignments, ifs, and loops, as well as putting statements into functions that perform a computation, like calculating an exponent. Importantly, the function we wrote to calculate exponents is only one possible solution. There are other ways to write this function, using different statements in different orders that achieve exactly the same numerical result. The difference between them is the algorithm, that is, the specific steps used to compute the computation. Some algorithms are better than others, even if they produce equal results. Generally, the fewer steps it takes to compute, the better it is, though sometimes we care about other factors, like how much memory it uses. The term algorithm comes from Persian polymath Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, who was one of the fathers of algebra more than a millennium ago. The crafting of efficient algorithms, a problem that existed long before modern computers, led to a whole science surrounding computation, which evolved into the modern discipline of, you guessed it, computer science. One of the most storied algorithmic problems in all all of computer science is sorting, as in sorting names or sorting numbers. Computers sort all the time, looking for the cheapest airfare, arranging your email by most recently sent, or scrolling your contacts by last name. Those all require sorting. You might think sorting isn't so tough. How many algorithms can there possibly be? The answer is a lot. Computer scientists have spent decades inventing algorithms for sorting, with core names like bubble sort and spaghetti sort. Let's try sorting. Imagine we have a set of airfare prices to Indianapolis. We'll talk about how data like this is represented in memory next week. But for now, a series of items like this is called an array. Let's take a look at these numbers to help see how we might sort this programmatically. We'll start with a simple algorithm. First, let's scan down the array to find the smallest number, starting at the top with 307. It's the only number we've seen, so it's also the smallest. The next is 239. That's smaller than 307, so it becomes our new smallest number. Next is 214, our new smallest number. 250 is not, neither is 384, 299, 223, or 312. So we've finished scanning all numbers, and 214 is the smallest. To put this into ascending order, we swap 214 with the number in the top location. Great, we sorted one number. Now we repeat the same procedure, but instead of starting at the top, we can start one spot below. First we see 239, which we save as our new smallest number. Scanning the rest of the array, we find 223 is the next smallest. So we swap this with the number in the second spot. Now we repeat again, starting from the third number down. This time we swap 239 with 307. This process continues until we get to the very last number. And voila, the array is sorted and you're ready to book that flight to Indianapolis. The process we just walked through is one way or one algorithm for sorting an array. It's called selection sort and it's pretty basic. Here's the pseudocode. This function can be used to sort 8, 80, or 80 million numbers. And once you've written the function, you can use it over and over again. With this sort algorithm, we loop through each position in the array from top to bottom. And then for each of those positions, we have to loop through the array to find the smallest number to swap. You can see this in the code where one for loop is nested inside another for loop. This means very roughly that if we want to sort n items, we have to loop n times, inside of which we loop n times, for a grand total of roughly n times n loops, or n squared. This the relationship of input size to the number of steps the algorithm takes to run characterizes the complexity of the selection sort algorithm. It gives you an approximation of how fast or slow an algorithm is going to be. Computer scientists write this order of growth in something known as, no joke, 
big O notation. n squared is not particularly efficient. Our example array had n equals 8 items, and 8 squared is 64. If we increase the size of our array from 8 items to 80, the running time is now 80 squared, which is 6,400. So although our array only grew by 10 times from 8 to 80, the running time increased by 100 times, from 64 to 6,400. This effect magnifies as the array gets larger. That's a big problem for a company like Google, which has to sort arrays with millions or billions of entries. So you might ask as a burgeoning computer scientist, is there a more efficient sorting algorithm? Let's go back to our old unsorted array and try a different algorithm, merge sort. The first thing merge sort does is check if the size of the array is greater than one. If it is, it splits the array into two halves. Since our array is size eight, it gets split into two arrays of size four. These are still bigger than size one, so they get split again into to arrays of size 2, and finally they split into 8 arrays with one item in each. Now we are ready to merge, which is how merge sort gets its name. Starting with the first two arrays, we read the first and only value in them, in this case 307 and 239. 239 is smaller, so we take that value first. The only number left is 307, so we put that value second. We've successfully merged two arrays. We now repeat this process for the remaining pairs, putting them each in sorted order. Then the merge process repeats. Again, we take the first two arrays and we compare the first numbers in them. This time, it's 239 and 214. 214 is lowest, so we take that number first. Now we look again at the first two numbers in both arrays, 239 and 250. 239 is lower, so we take that number next. Now we look at the next two numbers, 307 and 250. 250 is lower, so we take that. Finally, we're left with just 307, so that gets added last. In every case, we start with two arrays, each individually sorted, and merge them into a larger sorted array. We repeat the exact same merging process for the two remaining arrays of size two. Now we have two sorted arrays of size four. Just as before, we merge, comparing the first two numbers in each array and taking the lowest. We repeat this until all the numbers are merged and then our array is fully sorted again. The bad news is, no matter how many times we sort these, you're still going to have to pay $214 to get to Indianapolis. Anyway, the big O computational complexity of merge sort is n times the log of n. The n comes from the number of times we need to compare and merge items, which is directly proportional to the number of items in the array. The log n comes from the number of merge steps. In our example, we broke our array of eight items into four, then two, and finally one. That's three splits. Splitting in half repeatedly like this has a logarithmic relationship with the number of items. Trust me, log base two of eight equals three splits. If we double the size of our array to 16, that's twice as many items to sort. It only increases the number of split steps by one, since log base two of 16 equals four. Even if we increase the size of array more than a thousand times, from eight items to 8,000 items, the number of split steps stays pretty low. Log base two of 8,000 is roughly 13. That's more, but not much more than three, about four times larger, and yet we're sorting a lot more numbers. For this reason, merge sort is much more efficient than selection sort, and now I can put my ceramic cat collection in name order much faster. There are literally dozens of sorting algorithms we could review, but instead I want to move on to my other favorite category of classic algorithmic problems, graph search. A graph is a network of nodes connected by lines. You can think of it like a map with cities and roads connecting them. Routes between these cities take different amounts of time. We can label each line with what is called a cost or weight. In this case, it's weeks of travel. Now let's say we want to find the fastest route for an army at High Garden to reach the castle at Winterfell. The simplest approach would just be to try every single path exhaustively and calculate the total cost of each. That's a brute force approach. We could have used a brute force approach in sorting by systematically trying every permutation of the array to check if it's sorted. This would have an n factorial complexity. That is the number of nodes times one less, times one less than that, and so on until one, which is way worse than even n squared. But we can be way more clever. The classic algorithmic solution to this graph problem was invented by one of the greatest minds in computer science practice and theory, Edsgard Dijkstra. So it's appropriately named Dijkstra's algorithm. Algorithm. We start in High Garden with a cost of zero, which we mark inside the node. For now, we'll mark all other cities with question marks since we don't know the cost of getting to them yet. Dijkstra's algorithm always starts with the node with the lowest cost. In this case, it only knows about one node, High Garden, so it starts there. It follows all paths from that node to all connecting nodes that are one step away and records the cost to get to each of them. That completes one round of the algorithm. 
We haven't encountered Winterfell yet, so we loop and run Dijkstra's algorithm again. With High Garden already checked, the next lowest cost node is King's Landing. Just as before, we follow every unvisited line to any connecting cities. The line to the Trident has a cost of 5. However, we want to keep a running cost from High Garden, so the total cost of getting to the Trident is 8 plus 5, which is 13 weeks. Now we follow the off road path to River Run, which has a high cost of 25 for a total of 33. But we can see inside of River Run that we've already found a path with a lower cost of just 10. So we disregard our new path and stick with the previous better path. We've now explored every line from King's Landing and didn't find Winterfell, so we move on. The next lowest cost node is River Run at 10 weeks. First we check the path to the Trident, which has a total cost of 10 plus 2, or 12. That's slightly better than the previous path we found, which had a cost of 13. So we update the path and cost to the Trident. There is also a line from River Run to Pike with a cost of 3. 10 plus 3 is 13, which beats the previous cost of 14. And so we update Pike's path and cost as well. That's all paths from River Run checked, so you guessed it, Dijkstra's algorithm loops again. The node with the next lowest cost is the Trident, and the only line from the Trident that we haven't checked is a path to Winterfell. It has a cost of 10, plus we need to add in the cost of 12 it takes to get to the Trident for a grand total cost of 22. We check our last path from Pike to Winterfell, which sums to 31. Now we know the lowest total cost and also the fastest route for the army to get there, which avoids King's Landing. Dijkstra's original algorithm, conceived in 1956, had a complexity of the number of nodes in the graph squared. And squared, as we've already discussed, is never great, because it means the algorithm can't scale to big problems, like the entire roadmap of the United States. Fortunately, Dijkstra's algorithm was improved a few years later to take the number of nodes in the graph times the log of the number of nodes plus the number of lines. Although this looks more complicated, it's actually quite a bit faster. Plugging in our example graph with six cities and nine lines proves it. Our algorithm drops from 36 loops to around 14. As with sorting, there are innumerable graph search algorithms with different pros and cons. Every time you use a service like Google Maps to find directions, an algorithm much like Dijkstra's is running on servers to figure out the best route for you. Algorithms are everywhere. The modern world would not be possible without them. We touched only the very tip of the algorithmic iceberg in this episode, but a central part of being a computer scientist is leveraging existing algorithms and writing new ones when needed. And I hope this little taste has intrigued you to search further. Last episode, we discussed a few example classic algorithms, like sorting a list of numbers and finding the shortest path in a graph. What we didn't talk much about is how the data the algorithms ran on was stored in computer memory. You don't want your data to be like John Green's college dorm room, with food, clothing and paper strewn everywhere. Instead, we want our data to be structured so that it's organised, allowing things to be easily retrieved and read. For this, computer scientists use data structures. We already introduced one basic data structure last episode, arrays, also called lists of vectors in some languages. These are a series of values stored in memory. So instead of just a single value being saved into a variable like j equals 5, we can define a whole series of numbers and save that into an array variable. To be able to find a particular value in this array, we have to specify an index. Almost all programming languages start arrays at index 0 and use a square bracket syntax to denote array access. So for example, if we want to add the values in the first and third spots of our array j and save that into a variable a, we would write a line of code like this. How an array is stored in memory is pretty straightforward. For simplicity, let's say that the compiler chose to store ours at memory location 1000. The array contains seven numbers, and these are stored one after another in memory, as seen here. So when we write j index of zero, the computer goes to memory location 1000 with an offset of zero, and we get the value five. If we wanted to retrieve j index of five, our program goes to memory location 1000 plus an offset of five, which in this case holds a value of four. It's easy to confuse the fifth number in the array with the number at index 5. They are not the same. Remember the number at index 5 is the sixth number in the array because the first number is at index 0. Arrays are extremely versatile data structures, used all the time, and so there are many functions that can handle them to do useful things. For example, pretty much every programming language comes with a built-in sort function, where you just pass in your array and it comes back sorted. So there's no need to write that algorithm from scratch. Very closely related are strings, which are just arrays of characters like letters, numbers, punctuation and other other written symbols. We talked about how computers store characters way back in episode 4. Most often, to save a string into memory, you just put it in quotes like so. Although it doesn't look like an array, it is. Behind the scenes, the memory looks like this. Note that the string ends with a zero in memory. It's not the character zero, but the binary value zero. This is called the null character and denotes the end of a string in memory. This is important because if I call a function like print quote, which writes the string to the screen, it prints out each character in turn starting at the first memory location. But it needs to know when to stop. 
Otherwise, it would print out every single thing in memory as text. The zero tells the string functions when to stop. Because computers work with text so often, there are many functions that specifically handle strings. For example, many programming languages have a string concatenation function, or string cat, which takes in two strings and copies a second one to the end of the first. We can use arrays for making one-dimensional lists, but sometimes you want to manipulate data that is two-dimensional, like a grid of numbers in a spreadsheet or the pixels on your computer screen. For this, we need a matrix. You can think of a matrix as an array of arrays. So a three by three matrix is really an array of size 3, with each index storing an array of size 3. We can initialize a matrix like so. In memory, this is packed together in order like this. To access a value, you need to specify two indexes, like j index of 2, then index of 1. This tells the computer you're looking for the item in subarray 2 at position 1, and this would give us the value 12. The cool thing about matrices is we're not limited to 3 by 3. We can make them any size we want, and we can also make them any number of dimensions we want. For example, we can create a five five-dimensional matrix and access it like this. That's right, you now know how to access a five-dimensional matrix. Tell your friends. So far, we've been storing individual numbers or letters into our arrays or matrices, but often it's useful to store a block of related variables together. Like, you might want to store a bank account number along with its balance. Groups of variables like these can be bundled together into a struct. Now we can create variables that aren't just single numbers, but are compound data structures, able to store several pieces of data at once. We can even make arrays of structs that we define, which are automatically bundled together in memory. If we access, for example, j index of 0, we get back the whole struct stored there, and we can pull the specific account number and balance data we want. This array of structs, like any other array, gets created at a fixed size that can't be enlarged to add more items. Also, arrays must be stored in order in memory, making it hard to add a new item to the middle. But the struct data structure can be used for building more complicated data structures that avoid these restrictions. Let's take a look at this struct that's called a node. It stores a variable like a number and also a pointer. A pointer is a special variable that points, hence the name, to a location in memory. Using this struct, we can create a linked list, which is a flexible data structure that can store many nodes. It does this by having each node point to the next node in the list. Let's imagine we have three node structs saved in memory at locations 1000, 1002, and 1008. They might be spaced apart because they were created at different times and other data can sit between them. So you see that the first node contains the value 7 and the location 1008 in its next pointer. This means that the next node in the linked list is located at memory location 1008. Looking down the linked list to the next node, we see it stores the value 112 and points to another node at location 1002. If we follow that, we find a node that contains the value 14 and points back to the first node at location 1000. So this linked list happened to be circular, but it could also have been terminated by using a next pointer value of zero, the null value, which would indicate we've reached the end of the list. When programmers use linked lists, they rarely look at the memory value stored in the next pointers. Instead, they can use an abstraction of a linked list that looks like this, which is much easier to conceptualize. Unlike an array whose size has to be predefined, linked lists can be dynamically extended or shortened. For example, we can allocate a new node in memory and insert it into this list just by changing the next pointers. Linked lists can also easily be reordered, trimmed, split, reversed, and so on, which is pretty nifty and pretty useful for algorithms like sorting, which we talked about last week. Owing to this flexibility, many more complex data structures are built on top of linked lists. The most famous and universal are queues and stacks. A queue, like the line at your post office, goes in order of arrival. The person who has been waiting the longest gets served first. No matter how frustrating it is that all you want to do is buy stamps and the person in front of you seems to be mailing 23 packages, but regardless, this behavior is called first in, first out of FIFO. That's the first part, not the 23 packages thing. Imagine we have a pointer named post office queue that points to the first node in our linked list. Once we've done serving Hank, we can read Hank's next pointer and update our post office queue pointer to the next person in the line. We've successfully dequeued Hank. He's gone, done, finished. If we want to enqueue someone, that is, add them to the line, we have to traverse down the linked list until we hit the end, and then change that next pointer to point to the new person. With just a small change, we can use linked lists as stacks, which are LIFO, last in, first down. You can think of this like a stack of pancakes. As you make them, you add them to the top of the stack, and when you want to eat one, you take them from the top of the stack. Delicious. Instead of enqueuing and dequeuing, data is pushed onto the stack and popped from the stack. Yep, those are the official terms. If we update our node struct to contain not just one but two pointers, we can build trees, another data structure that's used in many algorithms. Again, programmers rarely look at the values of these pointers and instead conceptualize trees like this. 
The topmost node is called the root, and any nodes that hang from other nodes are called children nodes. As you might expect, nodes above children are called parent nodes. Does this example imply that Thomas Jefferson is the parent of Aaron Burr? I'll leave that to your fanfiction to decide. And finally, any nodes that have no children where the tree ends are called leaf nodes. In our example, nodes can have up to two children, and for that reason, this particular data structure is called a binary tree. But you could just as easily have trees with three, four, or any number of children by modifying the data structure accordingly. You can even have tree nodes that use linked lists to store all the nodes they point to. An important property of trees, both in real life and in data structures, is that there's a one-way path from roots to leaves. It'd be weird if roots connected to leaves that connected to roots. For data that links arbitrarily, that include things like loops, we can use a graph data structure instead. Remember our graph from last episode of cities connected by roads? This can be stored as nodes with many pointers, very much like a tree, but there is no notion of roots and leaves and children and parents. Anything can point to anything. So that's a whirlwind overview of pretty much all of the fundamental data structures used in computer science. On top of these basic building blocks, programmers have built all sorts of clever variants with slightly different properties. Data structures like red, black trees and heaps, which we don't have time to cover. These different data structures have properties that are useful for particular computations. The right choice of data structure can make your job a lot easier, so it pays off to think about how you want to structure your data before you jump in. Fortunately, most programming languages come with libraries packed full of ready-made data structures. For example, C++ has its standard template library, and Java has the Java class library. These mean programmers don't have to waste time implementing things from scratch, and can instead wield the power of data structures to do more interesting things, once again allowing us to operate at a new level of abstraction. Over the past few episodes, we've been building up our understanding of computer science fundamentals, such as functions, algorithms, and data structures. Today, we're going to take a step back and look at the person who formulated many of the theoretical concepts that underline modern computation, the father of computer science, and not quite Benedict Cumberbatch lookalike, Alan Turing. Alan Matheson Turing was born in London in 1912 and showed an incredible aptitude for maths and science throughout his early education. His first brush of what we now call computer science came in 1935, while he was a master's student at King's College in Cambridge. He set out to solve a problem posed by German mathematician David Hilbert, known as the Entscheidungs problem, or decision problem, which asked the following. Is there an algorithm that takes as input a statement written in formal logic and produces a yes or no answer that's always accurate? If such an algorithm existed, we could use it to answer questions like, is there a number bigger than all numbers? No, there's not. We know the answer to that one. But there are many other questions in mathematics that we'd like to know the answer to. So if this algorithm existed, we'd want to know it. The American mathematician Alonzo Church first presented a solution to this problem in 1935. He developed a system of mathematical expressions called lambda calculus and demonstrated that no such universal algorithm could exist. Although lambda calculus was capable of representing any computation, the mathematical technique was difficult to apply and understand. At pretty much the same time, on the other side of the Atlantic, Alan Turing came up with his own approach to solve the decision problem. He proposed a hypothetical computing machine, which we now call a Turing machine. Turing machines provided a simple yet powerful mathematical model of computation. Although using totally different mathematics, they were functionally equivalent to lambda calculus in terms of their computational power. However, their relative simplicity made them much more popular in the burgeoning field of computer science. In fact, they're simple enough that I'm going to explain it right now. A Turing machine is a theoretical computing device equipped with an infinitely long memory tape which stores symbols, and a device called a read-write head which can read and write or modify symbols on that tape. There's also a state variable in which we can hold a piece of information about the current state of the machine, and a set of rules that describes what the machine does given a state and the current symbol the head is reading. The rule can be to write a symbol on the tape, change the state of the machine, move the read-write head to the left or right by one spot, or any combination of these actions. To make this concrete, let's work through a simple example. A Turing machine that reads a string of ones ending in a zero and computes whether there is an even number of ones. If that's true, the machine will write a one to the tape, and if it's false, it'll write a zero. First, we need to define our Turing machine rules. If the state is even and the current symbol on the tape is one, then we update the machine's state to odd and move the head to the right. On the other hand, if the state is even and the current symbol is zero, which means we've reached the end of the string of ones, then we write one to the tape and change the state to halt, as in we're finished and the Turing Turing machine has completed the computation. We also need rules for when the Turing machine is in an odd state. One rule for when the symbol on the tape is a zero, and another for when it is one. Lastly, we need to define a starting 
state, which we'll set to be even. Now that we've defined the rules and the starting state of our Turing machine, which is comparable to a computer program, we can run it on some example input. Let's say we store 110 onto tape. That's two ones, which means there is an even number of ones. And if that's news to you, we should probably get working on crash course math. Notice that our rules only ever move the head to the right, so the rest of the tape is irrelevant. We'll leave it blank for simplicity. Our Turing machine is all ready to go, so let's start it. Our state is even, and the first number we see is a one. That matches our topmost rule, and so we execute the effect, which is to update the state to odd and move the read-write head to the right by one spot. Okay, now we see another one on the tape, but this time our state is odd, and so we execute our third rule which sets the state back to even and moves the head to the right. Now we see a zero and our current state is even, so we execute our second rule which is to write a one to the tape signifying that yes, it's true, there is an even number of ones. And finally, the machine halts. That's how Turing machines work. Pretty simple, right? So you might be wondering why they're such a big deal. Well, Turing showed that this simple hypothetical machine can perform any computation if given enough time and memory. It's a general purpose computer. Our program was a simple example, but but with enough rules, states, and tape, you could build anything. A web browser, World of Warcraft, whatever. Of course, it would be ridiculously inefficient, but it is theoretically possible. And that's why, as a model of computing, it's such a powerful idea. In fact, in terms of what it can and cannot compute, there's no computer more powerful than a Turing machine. A computer that is as powerful is called Turing Complete. Every modern computing system, your laptop, your smartphone, and even the little computer inside your microwave and thermostat are all Turing complete. To answer Hilbert's decision problem, Turing applied his new Turing machines to an intriguing computational puzzle, the halting problem. Put simply, this asks, is there an algorithm that can determine, given a description of a Turing machine and the input from its tape, whether the machine will run forever or halt? For example, we know our Turing machine will halt when given the input 110, because we literally walk through the example until it halted. But what about a more complex problem? Is there a way to figure out if a program will halt without executing it? Some programs might take years to run, so it would be useful to know before we run it, and wait, and wait, and wait, and then start getting worried and wonder, and then decades later when you're old and grey, Control or delete with so much sadness. Unfortunately, Turing came up with a proof that shows the halting problem was in fact unsolvable through a clever logical contradiction. Let's follow his reasoning. Imagine we have a hypothetical Turing machine that takes a description of a program and some input for its tape and always outputs either yes, it halts or no, it doesn't. And I'm going to give this machine a fun name, H for halt. Don't worry about how it works. Let's just assume such a machine exists. We're talking theory here. Turing reasoned that if there existed a program whose halting behavior was not decidable by H, it would mean the halting problem is unsolvable. To find one, Turing designed another Turing machine that built on top of H. If H says the program halts, then we'll make our new machine loop forever. If the answer is no, it doesn't halt, we'll have the new machine output a no and halt. In essence, we're building a machine that does the opposite of what H says, halt if the program doesn't halt and run forever if the program halts. For this argument, we'll also need to add a splitter to the front of our new machine so that it accepts only one input and passes that as both the program and and input into H. Let's call this new machine Bizarro. So far, this seems like a plausible machine, right? Now it's going to get pretty complicated, but bear with me for a second. Look what happens when you pass Bizarro a description of itself as the input. This means we're asking H what Bizarro will do when asked to evaluate itself. But if H says Bizarro halts, then Bizarro enters its infinite loop and thus doesn't halt. And if H says Bizarro doesn't halt, then Bizarro outputs a no and halts. So H can't possibly decide the halting problem correctly because there is no answer. It's a paradox, and this paradox means that the halting problem cannot be solved with Turing machines. Remember Turing proved that Turing machines could implement any computation, so this solution to the halting problem proves that not all problems can be solved by computation. Wow, that's some heavy stuff. I might have to watch that again myself. Long story short, Church and Turing showed that there were limits to the ability of computers. No matter how much time or memory you have, there are just some problems that cannot be solved. Ever. The concurrent efforts by Church and Turing to determine the limits of computation and in general formalize computability are now called the Church-Turing thesis. At this point in 1936, Turing was only 24 years old and really only just beginning his career. From 1936 through 1938, he completed a PhD at Princeton University under the guidance of Church. Then after graduating, he returned to Cambridge. 
Shortly after, in 1939, Britain became embroiled in World War II. Turing's genius was quickly applied to the war effort. In fact, a year before the war started, he was already working part-time at the UK's Government Code and Cipher School, which was the British code-breaking group based out of Bletchley Park. One of his main efforts was figuring out how to decrypt German communications, especially those that used the Enigma machine. In short, these machines scrambled text, like you type the letters H-E-L-L-O and the letters X-W-D-V-J would come out. This process is called encryption. The scrambling wasn't random. The behavior was defined by a series of reordable rotors on the top of the Enigma machine, each with 26 possible rotational positions. There was also a plug board at the front of the machine that allowed pairs of letters to be swapped. In total, there were billions of possible settings. If you had your own Enigma machine and you knew the correct rotor and plug board settings, you could type in XWDVJ and hello would come out. In other words, you decrypted the message. Of course, the German military wasn't sharing their Enigma settings on social media, so the Allies had to break the code. With billions of rotor and plugboard combinations, there was no way to check them all by hand. Fortunately for Turing, Enigma machines and the people who operated them were not perfect. Like, one key flaw was that a letter would never be encoded as itself, as in, an H was never encrypted as an H. Turing, building on earlier work by Polish codebreakers, designed a special purpose electromechanical computer called the BOM that took advantage of this flaw. It tried lots and lots of combinations of Enigma settings for a given encrypted message. If the bomb found a setting that led to a letter being encoded as itself, which we know the real Enigma machine couldn't do, that combination was discarded. Then the machine moved on to try another combination. So bombs were used to greatly narrow the number of possible Enigma settings. This allowed human codebreakers to hone their efforts on the most probable solutions, looking for things like common German words in fragments of decoded text. Periodically, the Germans would suspect someone was decoding their communications and upgrade the Enigma machine machine, like they'd add another rotor creating many more combinations. They even built entirely new encryption machines. Throughout the war, Turing and his colleagues at Bletchley Park worked tirelessly to defeat these mechanisms. And overall, the intelligence gained from decrypted German communications gave the Allies an edge in many theatres, with some historians arguing it shortened the war by years. After the war, Turing returned to academia and contributed to many early electronic computing efforts, like the Manchester Mark I, which was an early and influential stored program computer. But his most famous post-war contribution was to artificial intelligence, a field so new that it didn't even get that name until 1956. It's a huge topic, so we'll get to it again in future episodes. In 1950, Turing could envision a future where computers were powerful enough to exhibit intelligence equivalent to, or at least indistinguishable from, that of a human. Turing postulated that a computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it could deceive a human into believing that it was human. This became the basis of a simple test, now called the Turing test. Imagine that you were having a conversation with two different people, not by voice or in person, but by sending type notes back and forth. You can ask any questions you want and you get replies, but one of those two people is actually a computer. If you can't tell which one is human and which one is a computer, then the computer passes the test. There's a modern version of this test called a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart, or CAPTCHA for short. These are frequently used on the internet to prevent automated systems from doing things like posting spam on websites. I'll admit, sometimes I can't read what those squiggly things say. Does that mean I'm a computer? Normally in this series, we don't delve into the personal lives of these historical figures. But in Turing's case, his name has been inextricably tied to tragedy, so his story is worth mentioning. Turing was gay in a time when homosexuality was illegal in the United Kingdom and much of the world. An investigation into a 1952 burglary at his home revealed his sexual orientation to the authorities, who charged him with gross indecency. Turing was convicted and given a choice between imprisonment or probation with hormonal treatment to suppress his sexuality. He chose the latter, in part to continue his academic work, but it altered his mood and personality. Although the exact circumstances will never be known, it's most widely accepted that Alan Turing took his own life by poison in 1954. He was only 41. Many things have been named in recognition of Turing's contributions to theoretical computer science, but perhaps the most prestigious among them is the Turing Award, the highest distinction in the field of computer science, equivalent to a Nobel Prize in physics, chemistry or other sciences. Despite a life cut short, Allen inspired the first generation of computer scientists and laid key groundwork that enabled the digital era we get to enjoy today. So we've talked a lot about sorting in this series, and often code to sort a list of numbers is only 10 lines long, which is pretty easy for a single programmer to write. Plus, it's short enough that you don't need any special tools. You can do it in Notepad, really. But a sorting algorithm isn't a program. It's likely only a small part of a much larger program. For example, Microsoft Office has roughly 40 million lines of code, 
40 million. That's way too big for any one person to figure out and write. To build huge programs like this, programmers use a set of tools and practices. Taken together, these form the discipline of software engineering, a term coined by engineer Margaret Hamilton, who helped NASA prevent serious problems on the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. She once explained it this way, it's kind of like a root canal. You waited till the end, but there are things you could have done beforehand. It's like preventative healthcare, but it's preventative software. As I mentioned in episode 12, breaking big programs into smaller functions allows many people to work simultaneously. They don't have to worry about the whole thing, just the function they're working on. So if you're tasked with writing a sort algorithm, you only need to make sure it sorts properly and efficiently. However, even packing up code into functions isn't enough. Microsoft Office probably contains hundreds of thousands of them. That's better than dealing with 40 million lines of code, but it's still way too many things for one person or team to manage. The solution is to package functions into hierarchies, pulling related code together into objects. For example, Cars software might have several functions related to cruise control, like setting speed, nudging speed up or down, and stopping cruise control altogether. Since they're all related, we can wrap them up into a unified cruise control object. But we don't have to stop there. Cruise control is just one part of the engine software. There might also be sets of functions that control spark plug ignition, fuel pumps, and the radiator. So we can create a parent engine object that contains all of these children objects. In addition, to children objects, the engine itself might have its own functions. You want to be able to stop and start it, for example. It'll also have its own variables, like how many miles the car has traveled. In general, objects can contain other objects, functions, and variables. And of course, the engine is just one part of a car object. There's also the transmission, wheels, doors, windows, and so on. Now, as a programmer, if I want to set the cruise control, I navigate down the object hierarchy from the outermost objects to more and more deeply nested ones. Eventually, I reach the function I want to trigger car, then engine, then cruise control, then set cruise speed to 55. Programming languages often use something equivalent to the syntax shown here. The idea of packing up functional units into nested objects is called object-oriented programming. This is very similar to what we've done all series long, hide complexity by encapsulating low-level details in higher-order components. Before we packed up things like transistor circuits into higher-level Boolean gates, now we're doing the same thing with software. Yet again, it's a way to move up a new level of abstraction. Breaking up a big program, like a car's software, into functional units is perfect for teams. One team might be responsible for the cruise control system, and a single programmer on that team tackles a handful of functions. This is similar to how big physical things are built like skyscrapers. You'll have electricians running wires, plumbers fitting pipes, welders welding, painters painting, and hundreds of other people teaming all over the hull. They work together on different parts simultaneously, leveraging their different skills, until one day you've got a whole working building. But returning to our cruise control example, its code is going to have to make use of functions in other parts of the engine software to, you know, keep the car at a constant speed. That code isn't part of the cruise control team's responsibility. It's another team's code. Because the cruise control team didn't write that, they're going to need good documentation about what each function in the code does, and a well-defined application programming interface, or API for short. You can think of an API as the way that collaborating programmers interact across various parts of the code. For example, in the ignition control object, there might be functions to set the RPM of the engine, check the spark plug voltage, as well as fire the individual spark plugs. Being able to set the motor's RPM is really useful Useful. The cruise control team is going to need to call that function, but they don't know much about how the ignition system works. It's not a good idea to let them call functions that fire the individual spark plugs, or the engine might explode. Maybe. The API allows the right people access to the right functions and data. Object-oriented programming languages do this by letting you specify whether functions are public or private. If a function is marked as private, it means only functions inside that object can call it. So in this example, only other functions inside of ignition control, like the set RPM function, can fire the spark plugs. On the other hand, because the set RPM function is marked as public, other objects can call it, like cruise control. This ability to hide complexity and selectively reveal it is the essence of object-oriented programming, and it's a powerful and popular way to tackle building large and complex programs. Pretty much every piece of software on your computer or game running on your console was built using an object-oriented programming language, like C++, C Sharp, or Objective-C. Other popular OO languages you may have heard of are Python and Java. It's important to remember that code before being compiled is just text. As I mentioned earlier, you could write code in Notepad or any old word processor. Some people do, but generally, today's software developers use special purpose applications 
applications for writing programs, ones that integrate many useful tools for writing, organizing, compiling, and testing code. Because they've put everything you need in one place, they're called Integrated Development Environments, or IDEs for short. All IDEs provide a text editor for writing code, often with useful features like automatic color coding to improve readability. Many even check for syntax errors as you type, like spell check for code. Big programs contain lots of individual source files, so IDEs allow programmers to organize and efficiently navigate everything. Also built right into the IDE is the ability to compile and run code. And if your program crashes because it's still a work in progress, the IDE can take you back to the line of code where it happened, and often provide you additional information to help you track down and fix the bug, which is a process called debugging. This is important because most programmers spend 70 to 80% of their time testing and debugging, not writing new code. Good tools contained in IDEs can go a long way when it comes to helping programmers prevent and find errors. Many computer programmers can be pretty loyal to their IDEs though, but let's be honest, Vim is where it's at, providing you know how to quit. In addition to coding and debugging, another important part of a programmer's job is documenting their code. This can be done in standalone files called readmes, which tell other programmers to read that help file before diving in. It can also happen right in the code itself with comments. These are specially marked statements that the program knows to ignore when the code is compiled. They exist only to help programmers figure out what's what in the source code. Good documentation helps programmers when they revisit code they haven't seen for a while, but it's also crucial for programmers who are totally new to it. I just want to take a second here and reiterate that it's the worst when someone parachutes a load of uncommented and undocumented code into your lab, and you literally have to go line by line to understand what the code is doing. Seriously, don't be that person. Documentation also promotes code reuse. So instead of having programmers constantly write the same things over and over, they can track down someone else's code that does what they need. Then, thanks to documentation, they can put it to work in their program without ever having to read through the code. Read the docs, as they say. In addition to IDEs, another important piece of software that helps big teams work collaboratively on big coding projects is called source control also known as version control or revision control. Most often, at a big software company like Apple or Microsoft, code for projects is stored on centralized servers, called a code repository. When a programmer wants to work on a piece of code, they can check it out, sort of like checking out a book from a library. Often, this can be done right in an IDE. Then they can edit this code all they want on their personal computer, adding new features and testing if they work. When the programmer is confident their changes are working and there are no loose ends, they can check the code back into the repository, known as committing code, for everyone else to use. While a piece of code is checked out and presumably getting updated or modified, other programmers leave it alone. This prevents weird conflicts and duplicated work. In this way, hundreds of programmers can be simultaneously checking in and out different pieces of code, iteratively building up huge systems. Critically, you don't want someone committing buggy code, because other people and teams may rely on it. Their code could crash, creating confusion and lost time. The master version of the code stored on the server should always compile without errors and run with minimal bugs. But sometimes bugs do creep in. Fortunately, source control software keeps track of all changes, and if a bug is found, the whole code, or just a piece, can be rolled back to an earlier stable version. It also keeps track of who made each change, so coworkers can send nasty I mean helpful, and encouraging emails to the offending person. Debugging goes hand in hand with writing code, and it's most often done by an individual or small team. The big picture version of debugging is quality assurance testing, or QA. This is where a team rigorously tests out a piece of software, attempting to create unforeseen conditions that might trip it up. Basically, they elicit bugs. Getting all the wrinkles out is a huge effort, but vital in making sure the software works as intended for as many users in as many situations as imaginable before it ships. You've probably heard of beta software. This is a version of software that's mostly complete but not 100% fully tested. Companies will sometimes release beta versions to the public to help them identify issues. It's essentially like getting a free QA team. What you don't hear about as much is the version that comes before the beta, the alpha version. This is usually so rough and buggy it's only tested internally. So that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of the tools, tricks and techniques that allow software engineers to construct the huge pieces of software that we know and love today, like YouTube, Grand Theft Auto V and PowerPoint. As you might expect, all those millions of lines of code need some serious processing power to run at useful speeds. So next episode, we'll be talking about how computers got so incredibly fast. Over the past six episodes, we've delved into software, from early programming efforts to modern software engineering practices. Within about 50 years, software grew in complexity, from machine code punched by hand onto paper tape, to object-oriented programming languages, compiled in integrated development environments. But this growth in sophistication would not have been possible without improvements in hardware.
hardware. To appreciate computing hardware's explosive growth in power and sophistication, we need to go back to the birth of electronic computing. From roughly the 1940s through the mid-1960s, every computer was built from individual parts called discrete components, which were all wired together. For example, the ENIAC consisted of more than 17,000 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, and 7,000 diodes, all of which required 5 million hand-soldered connections. Adding more components to increase performance meant more connections, more wires, and just more complexity, what was dubbed the tyranny of numbers. By the mid-1950s, transistors were becoming commercially available and being incorporated into computers. These were much smaller, faster, and more reliable than vacuum tubes, but each transistor was still one discrete component. In 1959, IBM upgraded their vacuum tube-based 709 computers to transistors by replacing all the discrete vacuum tubes with discrete transistors. The new machine, the IBM 7090, was six times faster and half the cost. These transistorized computers mark the second generation of electronic computing. However, although faster and smaller, discrete transistors didn't solve the tyranny of numbers. It was getting unwieldy to design, let alone physically manufacture computers with hundreds of thousands of individual components. By the 1960s, this was reaching a breaking point. The insides of computers were often just huge tangles of wires. Just look at what the inside of this PDP-8 from 1965 looked like. The answer was to bump up a new level of abstraction and package up underlying complexity. The breakthrough came in 1958, when Jack Kilby, working at Texas Instruments, demonstrated such an electronic part, wherein all the components of the electronic circuit are completely integrated. Put simply, instead of building computer parts out of many discrete components and wiring them all together, you put many components together inside of a new, single component. These are called integrated circuits, or ICs. A few months later, in 1959, Fairchild Semiconductor, led by Robert Noyce, made ICs practical. While Kilby built his ICs out of germanium, a rare and unstable material, Fairchild used the abundant silicon, which makes up about a quarter of the Earth's crust. It's also more stable, therefore more reliable. For this reason, Noyce is widely regarded as the father of modern ICs, ushering in the electronics era, and also Silicon Valley, where Fairchild was based and where many other semiconductor companies would soon pop up. In the early days, an IC might only contain a simple circuit with just a few transistors, like this early Westinghouse example. But even this allowed simple circuits like the logic gates from episode 3 to be packaged up into a single component. ICs are sort of like Lego for computer engineers, building blocks that can be arranged into an infinite array of possible designs. However, they still have to be wired together at some point to create even bigger and more complex circuits, like a whole computer. For this, engineers had another innovation, printed circuit boards or PCBs. Instead of soldering and bundling up bazillions of wires, PCBs, which could be mass manufactured, have all the meta wires etched right into them to connect components together. By using PCBs and ICs together, one could achieve exactly the same functional circuit as that made from discrete components, but with far fewer individual components and tangled wires. Plus, it's smaller, cheaper, and more reliable. Triple win. Many early ICs were manufactured using teeny tiny discrete components, packaged up as a single unit, like this IBM example from 1964. However, even when using really, really itty-bitty components, it was hard to get much more than around five transistors onto a single IC. To achieve more complex designs, a radically different fabrication process was needed that changed everything. Photolithography. In short, it's a way to use light to transfer complex patterns to a material like a semiconductor. It only has a few basic operations, but these can be used to create incredibly complex circuits. Let's walk through a simple, although extensive, example to make one of these. We start with a slice of silicon, which, like a thin cookie, is called a wafer. Delicious! Silicon, as we discussed briefly in episode 2, is special because it's a semiconductor. That is, a material that can sometimes conduct electricity and other times does not. We can control where and when this happens, making silicon the perfect raw material for making transistors. We can also use a wafer as a base to lay down complex metal circuits, so everything is integrated. Perfect for integrated circuits. The next step is to add a thin oxide layer on top of the silicon, which acts as a protective coating. Then we apply a special chemical called a photoresist. When exposed to light, the chemical changes and becomes soluble, so it can be washed away with a different special chemical. Photoresists aren't very powerful by themselves, but are super powerful when used in conjunction with a photo mask. This is just like a piece of photographic film, but instead of a photo of a hamster eating a tiny burrito, it contains a pattern to be transferred onto the wafer. We do this by putting a photo mask over the wafer and turning 
shining on a powerful light. Where the mask blocks the light, the photoresist is unchanged, but where the light does hit the photoresist, it changes chemically, which lets us wash away only the photoresist that was exposed to light, selectively revealing areas of our oxide layer. Now, by using another special chemical, often an acid, we can remove any exposed oxide and etch a little hole the entire way down to the raw silicon. Note that the oxide layer under the photoresist is protected. To clean up, we use yet another special chemical that washes away any remaining photoresist. Yep, there are a lot of special chemicals in photolithography, each with a very specific function. So now we can see the silicon again, we want to modify only the exposed areas to better conduct electricity. To do that, we need to change it chemically through a process called doping. I'm not even going to make a joke, let's move on. Most often this is done with a high temperature gas, something like phosphorus, which penetrates into the exposed area of silicon. This alters its electrical properties. We're not going to wade into the physics and chemistry of semiconductors, but if you're interested, there's a link in the description to an excellent video by our friend Derek Mueller from Veritas. Potassium. But we still need a few more rounds of photolithography to build a transistor. The process essentially starts again, first by building up a fresh oxide layer, which we coat in photoresist. Now we use a photo mask with a new and different pattern, allowing us to open a small window above the doped area. Once again, we wash away any remaining photoresist. Now we dope and avoid telling a hilarious joke again, but with a different gas that converts part of the silicon into yet a different form. Timing is super important in photolithography in order to control things like doping diffusion and etch depth. In this case, we only want to dope a little region nested inside the other. Now we have all the pieces we need to create our transistor. The final step is to make channels in the oxide layer so that we can run little metal wires to different parts of our transistor. Once more, we apply a photoresist and use a new photo mask to etch little channels. Now we use a new process called metallization that allows us to deposit a thin layer of metal like aluminium or copper. But we don't want to cover everything in metal. We want to etch a very specific circuit design. So very similar to before, we apply a photoresist, use a photo mask, dissolve the exposed resist, and use a chemical to remove any exposed metal. Whew. Our transistor is finally complete. It has three little wires that connect to three different parts of the silicon, each doped a particular way to create, in this example, what's called a bipolar junction transistor. Here's the actual pattern from 1962, an invention that changed our world forever. Using similar steps, photolithography can create other useful electronic elements, like resistors and capacitors, all on a single piece of silicon, plus all the wires needed to hook them up into circuits. Goodbye discrete components. In our example, we made one transistor, but in the real world, Photomask lay down millions of little details all at once. Here is what an IC might look like from above, with wires crisscrossing above and below each other, interconnecting all the individual elements together into complex circuits. Although we could create a photo mask for an entire wafer, we can take advantage of the fact that light can be focused and projected to any size we want. In the same way that a film can be projected to fill an entire movie screen, we can focus a photo mask onto a very small patch of silicon, creating incredibly fine details. A single silicon wafer is generally used to create dozens of ICs. Then once you've got a whole wafer full, you cut them up and package them into microchips, those little black rectangles you see in electronics all the time. Just remember, at the heart of each of these chips is one of these small pieces of silicon. As photolithography techniques improved, the size of transistors shrunk, allowing for greater densities. At the start of the 1960s, an IC rarely contained more than five transistors. They just couldn't possibly fit. But by the mid-1960s, we were starting to see ICs with over 100 transistors on the market. In 1965, Gordon Moore could see the trend that approximately every two years, thanks to advances in materials and manufacturing, you could fit twice the number of transistors into the same amount of space. This is called Moore's Law. The term is a bit of a misnomer though, it's not really a law at all, more of a trend, but it's a good one. IC prices also fell dramatically, from an average of $50 in 1962 to around $2 in 1968. Today, you can buy ICs for cents. Smaller transistors and higher densities had other benefits too. The smaller the transistor, the less charge you have to move around, allowing it to switch states faster and consume less power. Plus, more compact circuits meant less delay in signals, resulting in faster clock speeds. In 1968, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore teamed up and founded a new company, combining the words integrated and electronics. Intel, the largest chip maker today. The Intel 4004 CPU from episode 7 and 8 was a major milestone. Released in 1971, it was the first processor that shipped as an IC, what's called a microprocessor, because it was so beautifully small. It contained 2,300 transistors. People marvelled at the level of integration, an entire CPU in one chip. 
which just two decades earlier would have filled an entire room using discrete components. This era of integrated circuits, especially microprocessors, ushered in the third generation of computing. And the Intel 4004 was just the start. CPU transistor count exploded. By 1980, CPUs contained 30,000 transistors. By 1990, CPUs breached the 1 million transistor count. By 2000, 30 million transistors, and by 2010, 1 billion transistors in one IC. OMG! <laughs> to achieve this density, the finest resolution possible with photolithography has improved from roughly 10,000 nanometers, that's about one tenth the thickness of a human hair, to around 14 nanometers today. That's over 400 times smaller than a red blood cell. And of course, CPUs weren't the only components to benefit. Most electronics advanced essentially exponentially. RAM, graphics cards, solid state hard drives, camera sensors, you name it. Today's processors, like the A10 CPU inside of an iPhone 7, contains a mind-melting 3.3 billion transistors in an IC roughly one centimeter by one centimeter. That's smaller than a postage stamp. And modern engineers aren't laying out these designs by hand, one transistor at a time. It's not humanly possible. Starting in the 1970s, very large-scale integration of VLSI software has been used to automatically generate chip designs instead. Using techniques like logic synthesis, where whole high-level components can be laid down, like a memory cache, the software generates circuits in the most efficient way possible. Many consider this to be the start of the fourth generation computers. Unfortunately, experts have been predicting the end of Moore's law for decades, and we might finally be getting close to it. There are two significant issues holding us back from further miniaturization. First, we're bumping into limits on how fine we can make features on a photo mask, and its resulting wafer due to the wavelengths of light used in photolithography. In response, scientists have been developing light sources with smaller and smaller wavelengths that can project smaller and smaller features. The second issue is that when transistors get really, really small, where electrodes might be separated by only a few dozen atoms, electrons can jump the gap, a phenomenon called quantum tunneling. If transistors leak current, they don't make very good switches. Nonetheless, scientists and engineers are hard at work figuring out ways around these problems. Transistors as small as one nanometer have been demonstrated in research labs. Whether this will ever be commercially feasible remains masked in mystery, but maybe we'll be able to resolve it in the future. I'm dying to know. Computers in the 40s and early 50s ran one program at a time. A programmer would write one at their desk, for example, on punch cards. Then they'd carry it to a room containing a room-sized computer and hand it to a dedicated computer operator. That person would then feed the program into the computer when it was next available. The computer would run it, spit out some output and halt. This very manual process worked okay back when computers were slow, and running a program often took hours, days, or even weeks. But as we discussed last episode, computers became faster and faster and faster, exponentially so. Pretty soon, having humans run around inserting programs into readers was taking longer than running the actual programs themselves. We needed a way for computers to operate themselves, and so operating systems were born. Operating systems, or OSs for short, are just programs, but special privileges on the hardware let them run and manage other programs. They're typically the first one to start when a computer is turned on, and all subsequent programs are launched by the OS. They got their start in the 1950s as computers became more widespread and more powerful. The very first OSs augmented the mundane manual task of loading programs by hand. Instead of being given one program at a time, computers could be given batches. When the computer was done with one, it would automatically and near instantly start the next. There was no downtime while someone scurried around an office to find the next program to run. This was called batch processing. While computers got faster, they also got cheaper. So they were popping up all over the world, especially in universities and government offices. Soon, people started sharing software. But there was a problem. In the era of one-off computers, like the Harvard Mark I or ENIAC, programmers only had to write code for that one single machine. The processor punch card readers and printers were known and unchanging. But as computers became more widespread, their configurations were not always identical. Like computers might have the same CPU, but not the same printer. This was a huge pain for programmers. Not only did they have to worry about writing their program, but also how to interface with each and every model of printer and all devices connected to a computer, what are called peripherals. Interfacing with early peripherals was very low level, requiring programmers to know intimate hardware details about each device. On top of that, programmers rarely had access to every model of peripheral to test their code on. So they had to write code as best they could, often just by reading manuals, and hope it worked when shared. 
Things weren't exactly plug and play back then, more plug and pray. This was clearly terrible, so to make it easier for programmers, operating systems were implemented as intermediaries between software programs and hardware peripherals. More specifically, they provided a software abstraction through APIs called device drivers. These allow programmers to talk to common input and output hardware, or I.O. for short, using standardized mechanisms. For example, programmers could call a function like print high score, and the OS would do the heavy lifting to get it onto paper. By the end of the 1950s, computers had gotten so fast they were often idle, waiting for slow mechanical things like printers and punch card readers. While programs were blocked on I.O., the expensive processor was just chilling. Not like a villain, you know, just relaxing. In the late 50s, the University of Manchester in the UK started work on a supercomputer called Atlas, one of the first in the world. They knew it was going to be wicked fast, so they needed a way to make maximal use of the expensive machine. Their solution was a program called the Atlas Supervisor, finished in 1962. This operating system not only loaded programs automatically, like earlier batch systems, but could also run several at the same time on its single CPU. It did this through clever scheduling. Let's say we have a game program running on Atlas, and we call the function print high score which instructs Atlas to print the value of a variable named high score onto paper to show our friends that we're the ultimate champion of virtual tiddlywinks. That function call is going to take a while, the equivalent of thousands of clock cycles, because mechanical printers are slow in comparison to electronic CPUs. So instead of waiting for the I.O. to finish, Atlas instead puts our program to sleep, then selects and runs another program that's waiting and ready to run. Eventually, the printer will report back to Atlas that it finished printing the value of high score. Atlas then marks our program as ready to go, and at some point, it'll be scheduled to run again on the CPU, and continue onto the next line of code following the print statement. In this way, Atlas could have one program running calculations on the CPU, while another was printing out data, and yet another reading in data from a punch tape. Atlas's engineers doubled down on this idea and outfitted their computer with four paper tape readers, four paper tape punches, and up to eight magnetic tape drives. This allowed many programs to be in progress all at once, sharing time on a single CPU. This ability, enabled by the operating system, is called multitasking. There's one big catch to having many programs running simultaneously on a single computer, though. Each one is going to need some memory, and we can't lose that program's data when we switch to another program. The solution is to allocate each program its own block of memory. So, for example, let's say a computer computer has 10,000 memory locations in total, program A might get allocated memory addresses 0 through 999, and program B might get 1,000 through 1,999, and so on. If a program asks for more memory, the operating system decides if it can grant that request, and if so, what memory block to allocate next? This flexibility is great, but introduces a quirk. It means that program A could end up being allocated non-sequential blocks of memory in, say, addresses 0 through 999, and 2,000 through 2,999. And this is just a simple example. A real program might be allocated dozens of blocks scattered all over memory. As you might imagine, this would get really confusing for programmers to keep track of. Maybe there's a long list of sales data in memory that a programmer has to total up at the end of the day. But this list is stored across a bunch of different blocks of memory. To hide this complexity, operating systems virtualize memory locations. With virtual memory, programs can assume their memory always starts at address zero, keeping things simple and consistent. However, the actual physical location in computer memory is hidden and abstracted by the operating system. Just a new level of abstraction. Let's take our example program B, which has been allocated a block of memory from address 1000 to 1999. As far as program B can tell, this appears to be a block from 0 to 999. The OS and CPU handle the virtual to physical memory remapping automatically. So if program B requests memory location 42, it really ends up reading address 1042. This virtualization of memory addresses is even more useful for program A, which in our example has been allocated two blocks of memory that are separated from one another. This too is invisible to program A. As far as it can tell, it's been allocated a continuous block of 2000 addresses. When program A reads memory address 999, that does coincidentally map to physical memory address 999. But if program A reads the very next value in memory at address 1000, that gets mapped behind the scenes to physical memory address 2000. This mechanism allows programs to have flexible memory sizes, called dynamic memory allocation, that appear to be continuous to them. 
It simplifies everything and offers tremendous flexibility to the operating system in running multiple programs simultaneously. Another upside of allocating each program its own memory is that they're better isolated from one another. So if a buggy program goes awry and starts writing gobbledygook, it can only trash its own memory, not that of other programs. This feature is called memory protection. This is also really useful in protecting against malicious software like viruses. For example, we generally don't want other programs to have the ability to read or modify the memory of, let's say, our email. With that kind of access, malware could send emails on your behalf and maybe steal personal information. Not good. Atlas had both virtual and protected memory. It was the first computer and OS to support these features. By the 1970s, computers were sufficiently fast and cheap. Institutions like a university could buy a computer and let students use it. It was not only fast enough to run several programs at once, but also give several users simultaneous, interactive access. This was done through a terminal, which is a keyboard and screen that connects to a big computer, but doesn't contain any processing power itself. A refrigerator-sized computer might have 50 terminals connected to it, allowing up to 50 users. Now operating systems had to handle not just multiple programs, but also multiple users. So that no one person could gobble up all of a computer's resources, operating systems were developed that offered time sharing. With time sharing, each individual user was only allowed to utilize a small fraction of the computer's processor, memory, and so on. Because computers are so fast, even getting just one fiftieth of its resources was enough for individuals to complete many tasks. The most influential of early time sharing operating systems was Multics, or Multiplex Information and Computing Service, released in 1969. Multics was the first major operating system designed to be secure from the outset. Developers didn't want mischievous users accessing data they shouldn't, like students attempting to access their final exam on their professor's account. Features like this meant Multics was really complicated for its time, using around one megabit of memory, which was a lot back then. That might be half of a computer's memory just to run the OS. Dennis Ritchie, one of the researchers working on Multics, once said, one of the obvious things that went wrong with Multics as a commercial success was just that it was sort of over-engineered in a sense. There was just too much in it. This led Dennis and another Multics researcher, Ken Thompson, to strike out on their own and build a new lean operating system called Unix. They wanted to separate the OS into two parts. First was the core functionality of the OS, things like memory management, multitasking, and dealing with I.O., which is called the kernel. The second part was a wide array of useful tools that came bundled with, but not part of the kernel, things like programs and libraries. Building a compact lean kernel meant intentionally leaving some functionality out. Tom Van Vleck, another Multics developer, recalled, I remarked to Dennis that easily half of the code I was writing in Multics was error recovery code. He said, we left all that stuff out of Unix. If there's an error, we have this routine called panic. And when it is called, the machine crashes and you holler down the hall, hey, reboot it. You might have heard of kernel panics. This is where the term came from. It's literally when the kernel crashes, has no recourse to recover, and so calls a function called panic. Originally, all it did was print the word panic and then enter an infinite loop. This simplicity meant that Unix could be run on cheaper and more diverse hardware, making it popular inside Bell Labs where Dennis and Ken worked. As more developers started using Unix to build and run their own programs, the number of contributed tools grew. Soon after its release in 1971, it gained compilers for different programming languages and even a word processor, quickly making it one of the most popular OSs of the 1970s and 80s. At the same time, by the early 1980s, the cost of a basic computer had fallen to the point where individual people could afford one, called a personal or home computer. These were much simpler than the big mainframes found at universities, corporations and governments. So their operating systems had to be equally simple. For example, Microsoft's Disk Operating System, or MS-DOS, was just 160 kilobytes, allowing it to fit, as the name suggests, onto a single disk. First released in 1981, it became the most popular OS for early home computers, even though it lacked features like multitasking and protected memory. This meant that programs could, and would, regularly crash the system. While annoying, it was an acceptable trade-off, as users could just turn their own computers off and on again. Even early versions of Windows, first released by Microsoft in 1985, and which dominated the OS scene throughout the 1990s, lacked strong memory protection. When programs misbehave, you could get the blue screen of death, a sign that a program had crashed so badly that it took down the whole operating system. Luckily, newer versions of Windows have better protections and usually don't crash that often. Today, computers run modern operating systems like Mac OS X, Windows 10, Linux, iOS, and Android. Even though the computers we own are most often used by just a single person, you, their OSs all have multitasking and virtual and protected memory. So they can run many programs at once. You can watch YouTube in your web browser, edit a photo in Photoshop, play music in Spotify, and sync Dropbox all at the same time. 
This wouldn't be possible without those decades of research and development on operating systems, and of course the proper memory to store those programs, which we'll get to next week. We've talked about computer memory several times in this series, and we've even designed some in episode 6. In general, computer memory is non-permanent. If your Xbox accidentally gets unplugged and turns off, any data saved in memory is lost. For this reason, it's called volatile memory. What we haven't talked so much about this series is storage, which is a tad different. Any data written to storage, like your hard drive, will stay there until it's overwritten or deleted, even if the power goes out. It's non-volatile. It used to be that volatile memory was fast and non-volatile storage was slow. But as computing technologies have improved, this distinction is becoming less true, and the terms have started to blend together. Nowadays, we take for granted technologies like this little USB stick, which offers gigabytes of memory, reliable over long periods of time, all at low cost. But this wasn't always true. The earliest computer storage was paper punch cards, and its close cousin, punched paper tape. By the 1940s, punch cards had largely standardized into a grid of 80 columns and 12 rows, allowing for a maximum of 960 bits of data to be stored on a single card. The largest program ever punched onto cards that we know of was the US military's semi-automatic ground environment, or SAGE, an air defense system that became operational in 1958. The main program was stored on 62,500 punch cards, roughly equivalent to 5 megabytes of data. That's the size of an average smartphone photo today. And punch cards were a useful and popular form of storage for decades. They didn't need power, plus paper was cheap and reasonably durable. However, punch cards were slow and write once. You can't easily unpunch a hole, so they were a less useful form of memory, where a value might only be needed for a fraction of a second during a program's execution and then discarded. A faster, larger, more flexible form of computer memory was needed. An early and practical approach was developed by J. Presper Ecker as he was finishing work on ENIAC in 1944. His invention was called delay line memory, and it worked like this. You take a tube and you fill it with liquid like mercury. Then you put a speaker at one end and a microphone at the other. When you pulse the speaker, it creates a pressure wave. This takes time to propagate to the other end of the tube where it hits the microphone, converting it back into an electrical signal. And we can use this propagation delay to store data. Imagine that the presence of a pressure wave is a one and the absence of a pressure wave is zero. Our speaker can output a binary sequence like 10100111. The corresponding waves will travel down the tube in order and a little while later hit the microphone, which converts the signal back into ones and zeros. If we create a circuit that connects the microphone to the speaker, plus a little amplifier to compensate for any loss, we can create a loop that stores data. The signal travelling along the wire is near instantaneous, so there's only ever one bit of data showing at any moment in time. But in the tube, you can store many bits. After working on ENIAC, Ecker and his colleague John Muckley set out to build a bigger and better computer called EDVAC, incorporating delay line memory. In total, the computer had 128 delay lines, each capable of storing 352 bits. That's a grand total of 45,000 bits of memory, not too shabby for 1949. This allowed EDVAC to be one of the very earliest stored program computers, which we talked about in episode 10. However, a big drawback with delay line memory is that you can only read one bit of data from a tube at any given instant. If you wanted to access a specific bit, you'd have to wait for it to come around in the loop, what's called sequential or cyclic access memory, whereas we really want random access memory where we can access any bit at any time. It also proved challenging to increase the density of the memory. Packing waves closer together meant they were more easily mixed up. In response, new forms of delay line memory were invented, such as magnetostrictive delay lines. These delay lines used a metal wire that could be twisted, creating little torsional waves that represented data. By forming a wire into a coil, you could store around a thousand bits in a one foot by one foot square. However, delay line memory was largely obsolete by the mid-1950s, surpassed in performance, reliability and cost by a new kid on the block, magnetic core memory, which was constructed out of little magnetic donuts called cores. If you loop a wire around this core and run an electrical current through the wire, we can magnetize the core in a certain direction. If we turn the current off, the core will stay magnetized. If we pass current through the wire in the opposite direction, the magnetization direction, called polarity, flips the other way. In this way, we can store ones and zeros. One bit of memory isn't very useful, so these little donuts were arranged into grids. There were wires for selecting the right row and column, and a wire that ran through every core, which could be used to read or write a bit. Here is an actual piece of core memory. In each of these little yellow squares, there are 32 rows and 32 columns of tiny cores, each one holding one bit of data. So each of these yellow squares could hold 1024 bits. In total, there are nine of these, so this memory board could hold a maximum of 9216 bits, which is around 
around 9 kilobytes. The first big use of core memory was MIT's Whirlwind One computer in 1953, which used a 32 by 32 core arrangement. And instead of just a single plane of cores like this, it was 16 boards deep, providing roughly 16,000 bits of storage. Importantly, unlike delay line memory, any bit could be accessed at any time. This was a killer feature, and magnetic core memory became the predominant random access memory technology for two decades, beginning in the mid-1950s, even though it was typically woven by hand. Although starting at roughly $1 per bit, the cost fell to around $0.01 cent per bit by the 1970s. Unfortunately, even $0.01 cent per bit isn't cheap enough for storage. As previously mentioned, an average smart phone photo is around 5 megabytes in size. That's roughly 40 million bits. Would you pay $400,000 to store a photo on core memory? If you have that kind of money to drop, did you know that Crash Course is on Patreon? Right? Wink wink. Anyway, there was tremendous research into storage technologies happening at this time. By 1951, Ecker and Muckley had started their own company and designed a new computer called Univac, one of the earliest commercially sold computers. It debuted with a new form of computer storage, magnetic tape. This was a long, thin and flexible strip of magnetic material stored in reels. The tape could be moved forwards or backwards inside of a machine called a tape drive. Inside is a write head which passes current through a wound wire to generate a magnetic field, causing a small section of the tape to become magnetised. The direction of the current sets the polarity, again perfect for storing ones and zeros. There was also a separate read head that could detect the polarity non-destructively. The Univac used half-inch wide tape with eight parallel data tracks, each able to store 128 bits of data per inch. With each reel containing 1200 feet of tape, it meant that you could store roughly 15 million bits. That's almost 2 megabytes. Although tape drives were expensive, the magnetic tape itself was cheap and compact, and for this reason they're still used today for archiving data. The main drawback is access speed. Tape is inherently sequential. You have to rewind or fast forward to get the data you want. This might mean traversing hundreds of feet of tape to retrieve a single byte, which is slow. A related popular technology in the 1950s and 60s was magnetic drum memory. This was a metal cylinder called a drum, coated in a magnetic material for recording data. The drum was rotated continuously, and positioned along its length were dozens of read and write heads. These would wait for the right spot to rotate underneath them to read or write a bit of data. To keep this delay as short as possible, drums were rotated thousands of revolutions per minute. By 1953, when the technology started to take off, you could buy a unit able to record 80,000 bits of data. That's 10 kilobytes. But the manufacture of drums ceased in the 1970s. However, magnetic drums did directly lead to the development of hard disk drives, which are very similar but use a different geometric configuration. Instead of a large cylinder, hard disks use, well, disks that are hard, hence the name. The storage principle is the same. The surface of a disk is magnetic, allowing write and read heads to store and retrieve ones and zeros. The great thing about disks is that they are thin, so you can stack many of them together, providing a lot of surface area for data storage. That's exactly what IBM did for the world's first computer with a disk drive, the Ramac 305. Sweet name, by the way. It contained 50 24-inch diameter disks, offering a total storage capacity of roughly 5 megabytes. Yes, finally, we've gotten to a technology that can store a single smartphone photo. The year was 1956. To access any bit of data, a read-write head would travel up or down the stack to the right disk, and then slide in between them. Like drum memory, the disks are spinning, so the head has to wait for the right section to come around. The Ramac 305 could access any block of data, on average, in around six tenths of a second, what's called the seek time. While great for storage, this was not nearly fast enough for memory, so the Ramac 305 also had drum memory and magnetic core memory. This is an example of a memory hierarchy, where you have a little bit of fast memory, which is expensive, slightly more medium speed memory, which is less expensive, and then a lot of slowish memory, which is cheap. This mixed approach strikes a balance between cost and speed. Hard disk drives rapidly improved and became commonplace by the 1970s. A hard disk drive like this can easily hold one terabyte of data today. That's a trillion bytes, or roughly 200,000 5 megabyte photos. And these types of drives can be bought online for as little as 40 US dollars. That's 0 0.0000000005 cents per bit. A huge improvement over core memory's one cent per bit. Also, modern drives have an average seek time of under one one hundredth of a second. I should also briefly mention a close cousin of hard disks, the floppy disk, which is basically the same thing but uses a magnetic medium that's floppy. You might recognise it as the save icon on some of your applications, but it was once a real physical object. 
It was most commonly used for portable storage and became near ubiquitous from the mid-1970s up to the mid-90s. And today, it makes a pretty good coaster. Higher density floppy disks like ZipDisk became popular in the mid-1990s, but fell out of favour within a decade. Optical storage came into the scene in 1972 in the form of a 12-inch Laserdisc. However, you're probably more familiar with its later, smaller and more popular cousin, the Compact Disc, or CD, as well as the DVD, which took off in the 90s. Functionally, these technologies are pretty similar to hard disks and floppy disks, but instead of storing data magnetically, optical disks have little physical divots in their surface that cause light to be reflected differently, which is captured by an optical sensor and decoded into ones and zeros. However, today, things are moving to solid state technologies with no moving parts, like this hard drive and also this USB stick. Inside are integrated circuits, which we talked about in episode 15. The first RAM integrated circuits became available in 1972 at one cent per bit, quickly making magnetic core memory obsolete. Today, costs have fallen so far that hard disk drives are being replaced with non-volatile solid-state drives, or SSDs, as the cool kids say. Because they contain no moving parts, they don't really have to seek anywhere. So SSD access times are typically under 1 1,000th of a second. That's fast, but it's still many times slower than your computer's RAM. For this reason, computers today still use memory hierarchies. So we've come a long way since the 1940s. Much like transistor count and Moore's law, which we talked about in episode 14, memory and storage technologies have followed a similar exponential trend. From early core memory costing millions of dollars per megabyte, we've steadily fallen to mere cents by 2000 and only fractions of a cent today. Plus, there's way fewer punch cards to keep track of. Seriously, can you imagine if there was a slight breeze in that room containing the Sage program? 62,500 punch cards. I don't even want to think about it. Last episode, we talked about data storage, how technologies like magnetic tape and hard disks can store trillions of bits of data for long durations, even without power, which is perfect perfect for recording big blobs of related data, what are more commonly called computer files. You've no doubt encountered many types, like text files, music files, photos and videos. Today, we're going to talk about how files work and how computers keep them all organized with file systems. It's perfectly legal for a file to contain arbitrary unformatted data, but it's most useful and practical if the data inside the file is organized somehow. This is called a file format. You can invent your own, and programmers do that from time to time, but it's usually best and easiest to use an existing standard, like JPEG and MP3. Let's look at some simple file formats. The most straightforward are text files, also known as TXT files, which contain, surprise, text. Like all computer files, this is just a huge list of numbers stored as binary. If we look at the raw values of a text file in storage, it would look something like this. We can view this as decimal numbers instead of binary, but that still doesn't help us read the text. The key to interpreting this data is knowing that text files use ASCII, a character encoding standard we discussed way back in episode 4. So in ASCII, our first value, 72, maps to the capital letter H, and in this way we decode the whole file. Let's look at a more complicated example, a WAV file, also called a WAV, which stores audio. Before we can correctly read the data, we need to know some information, like the bit rate and whether it's a single track or stereo. Data about data is called metadata. This metadata is stored at the front of the file ahead of any actual data in what's known as a header. Here's what the first 44 bytes of a WAV file looks like. Some parts are always the same, like where it spells out W-A-V-E. Other parts contain numbers that change depending on the data contained within. The audio data comes right behind the metadata, and it's stored as a long list of numbers. These values represent the amplitude of sound captured many times per second. And if you want a primer on sound, check out our video all about it in Crash Course Physics. Link in the doobly-doo. As an example, let's look at a waveform of me saying hello. Hello. Now that we've captured some sound, let's zoom into a little snippet. A digital microphone, like the one in your computer or smartphone, samples the sound pressure thousands of times. Each sample can be represented as a number. Larger numbers mean higher sound pressure, what's called amplitude. And these numbers are exactly what gets stored in a WAV file, thousands of amplitudes for every single second of audio. When it's time to play this file, an audio program needs to actuate the computer's speakers, such that the original waveform is emitted. Hello. So now that you're getting the hang of file formats, let's talk about bitmaps or BMPs which store pictures. On a computer, pictures are made up of tiny square elements called pixels. Each pixel is a combination of three colours, red, green and blue. These are called additive primary colours and they can be mixed together to create any other colour on our electronic displays. Now just like WAV files, bitmaps start with metadata, including key values like image width, image height and colour depth. As an example, let's say the metadata specified an image 4 pixels wide by 4 pixels tall, with a 24-bit colour depth. 
That's 8 bits for red, 8 bits for green, and 8 bits for blue. As a reminder, 8 bits is the same as 1 byte. The smallest number a byte can store is 0, and the largest is 255. Our image data is going to look something like this. Let's look at the colour of our first pixel. It has 255 for its red value, 255 for green, and 255 for blue. This equates to 4 intensity red, 4 intensity green, and 4 intensity blue. These colours blend together on your computer monitor to become white, so our first pixel is white. The next pixel has a red, green, blue, or RGB value of 255, 255, 0. That's the colour yellow. The pixel after that has an RGB value of 0, 0, 0. That's zero intensity everything, which is black. And the next one is yellow. Because the metadata specified this was a 4x4 image, we know that we've reached the end of our first row of pixels. So we need to drop down a row. The next RGB value is 255, 255, 0, yellow again. OK, let's go ahead and read all the pixels in our 4x4 image. Ta-da! A very low resolution Pac-Man. Obviously, this is a simple example of a small image, but we could just as easily store this image in a bitmap. I want to emphasize again that it doesn't matter if it's a text file, wave, bitmap, or fancier formats we don't have time to discuss. Under the hood, they're all the same. Long list of numbers stored as binary on a storage device. File formats are the key to reading and understanding the data inside. Now that you understand files a little better, let's move on to how computers go about storing them. Even though the underlying storage medium might be a strip of tape, a drum, a disk, or integrated circuits, hardware and software abstractions let us think of storage as a long line of little buckets that store values. In the early days, when computers only performed one computation, like calculating artillery range tables, the entire storage operated like one big file. Data started at the beginning of storage and then filled it up in order as output was produced, up to the storage capacity. However, as computational power and storage capacity improved, it became possible and useful to store more than one file at a time. The simplest option is to store files back to back. This can work, but how does the computer know where files begin and end? Storage devices have no notion of files, they're just a mechanism for storing lots of bits. So for this to work, we need to have a special file that records where other ones are located. This goes by many names, but a good general term is directory file. Most often it's kept right at the front of storage, so we always know where to access it. Location zero. Inside the directory file are the names of all the other files in storage. In our example, they each have a name, followed by a period, and end with what's called a file extension, like BMP or WAV. Those further assist programs in identifying file types. The directory file also stores metadata about these files, like when they were created and last modified, who the owner is, and if they can be read, written, or both. But most importantly, the directory file contains where these files begin in storage and how long they are. If we want to add a file, remove a file, change a file name, or similar, we have to update the information in the directory file. It's like the table of contents in a book. If you make a chapter shorter or move it somewhere else, you have to update the table of contents, otherwise the page numbers won't match. The directory file and the maintenance of it is an example of a very basic file system, the part of an operating system that manages and keeps track of stored files. This particular example is called a flat file system because they're all stored at one level. It's flat. Of course, packing files together back to back is a bit of a problem because if we want to add some data to, let's say, todo.txt, there's no room to do it without overwriting part of carry.bitmap. So modern file systems do two things. First, they store files in blocks. This leaves a little extra space for changes called slack space. It also means that all file data is aligned to a common size, which simplifies management. In a scheme like this, our directory file needs to keep track of what block each one is stored in. The second thing file systems do is allow files to be broken up into chunks and stored across many blocks. So let's say we open todo.txt and we add a few more items. Then the file becomes too big to be saved in its one block. We don't want to overwrite the neighboring one, so instead the file system allocates an unused block, which can accommodate extra data. With a file system scheme like this, the directory file needs to store not just one block per file, but rather a list of blocks per file. In this way, we can have files of variable sizes that can be easily expanded and shrunk, simply by allocating and deallocating blocks. If you watched our episode on operating systems, this should sound a lot like virtual memory. Conceptually, it's very similar. Now let's say we want to delete carry.bitmap. To do that, we can simply remove the entry from the directory file. This, in turn, causes one block to become free. Note that we didn't actually erase the file's data in storage, we just deleted the record of it. At some point, that block will be overwritten with new data, but until then it just sits there. This is one way that computer forensic teams can recover data from computers, even though people think it's been deleted. 
crafty. Okay, let's say we add even more items to our to-do list, which causes the file system to allocate yet another block to the file, in this case, recycling the block freed from carry.bitmap. Now our to-do.txt is stored across three blocks spaced apart and also out of order. Files getting broken up across storage like this is called fragmentation. It's the inevitable byproduct of files being created, deleted, and modified. For many storage technologies, this is bad news. On magnetic tape, reading to do.txt into memory would require seeking to block one, then fast forwarding to block five, and then rewinding to block three. That's a lot of back and forth. In real world file systems, large files might be stored across hundreds of blocks, and you don't want to have to wait five minutes for your files to open. The answer is defragmentation. That might sound like technical no babble, but the process is really simple, and once upon a time it was really fun to watch. The computer copies around data so that files have blocks located together in storage and in the right order. After we've defragged, we can read our to-do file, now located in blocks 1 through 3 in a single quick read pass. So far we've only been talking about flat file systems, where they're all stored in one directory. This worked okay when computers only had a little bit of storage, and you might only have a dozen or so files, but as storage capacity exploded, like we discussed last episode, so did the number of files on computers. Very quickly, it became impractical to store all files together at one level. Just like documents in the real world, it's handy to store related files together in folders. Then we can put connected folders into folders and so on. This is a hierarchical file system, and it's what your computer uses. There are a variety of ways to implement this, but let's stick with the file system example we've been using to convey the main idea. The biggest change is that our directory file needs to be able to point not just to files, but also other directories. To keep track of what's a file and what's a directory, we need some extra metadata. This directory file is the topmost one, known as the root directory. All other files and folders lie beneath this directory, along various file paths. We can see inside of our root directory directory file that we have three files and two subdirectories, music and photos. If we want to see what's stored in our music directory, we have to go to that block and read the directory file located there. The format is the same as our root directory. There's a lot of great songs in there. In addition to being able to create hierarchies of unlimited depth, this method also allows us to easily move around files. So if we wanted to move theme.wav from our root directory to the music directory, we didn't have to rearrange any blocks of data. We can simply modify the two directory files, removing an entry from one and adding it to another. Importantly, the theme.wav file stays in block five. So that's a quick overview of the key principles of file systems. They provide yet another way to move up a new level of abstraction. File systems allow us to hide the raw bits stored on magnetic tape, spinning disks and the like, and they let us think of data as neatly organized and easily accessible files. We even started talking about users, not programmers, manipulating data, like opening files and organizing them, foreshadowing where the series will be going in a few episodes. Last episode, we talked about files, bundles of data stored on a computer that are formatted and arranged to encode information, like text, sound, or images. We even discussed some basic file formats, like text, WAV, and bitmap. While these formats are perfectly fine and still used today, their simplicity also means they're not very efficient. Ideally, we want files to be as small as possible, so we can store lots of them without filling up our hard drives and also transmit them more quickly. Nothing is more frustrating than waiting for an email attachment to download. Ugh. The answer is compression, which literally squeezes data into a smaller size. To do this, we have to encode data using fewer bits than the original representation. That might sound like magic, but it's actually computer science. Let's return to our old friend from last episode, Mr. Pac-Man. This image is 4 pixels by 4 pixels. As we discussed, image data is typically stored as a list of pixel values. To know where rows end, image files have metadata, which defines properties like dimensions. But to keep it simple today, we're not going to worry about it. Each pixel Pixel's color is a combination of three additive primary colors, red, green, and blue. We store each of these values in one byte, giving us a range of 0 to 255 for each color. If you mix full intensity red, green, and blue, that's 255 for all three values, you get the color white. If you mix full intensity red and green, but no blue, it's 0, you get yellow. We have 16 pixels in our image, and each of those needs 3 bytes of color data. That means this image's data will consume 48 bytes of storage, but we can compress the data and pack it into a smaller number of bytes than 48. One way to compress data is to reduce repeat or redundant information. The most straightforward way to do this is called run length encoding. This takes advantage of the fact there are often runs of identical values in files. For example, in our Pac-Man image, there are seven yellow pixels in a row. Instead of encoding redundant data, yellow pixel, yellow pixel, yellow pixel, and so on, we can just say there are seven yellow pixels in a row by inserting an extra byte that specifies the length of the run 
like so. And then we can eliminate the redundant data behind it. To ensure that computers don't get confused with which bytes are run lengths and which bytes represent color, we have to be consistent in how we apply this scheme. So we need to preface all pixels with their run length. In some cases, this actually adds data, but on the whole, we've dramatically reduced the number of bytes we need to encode this image. We're now at 24 bytes down from 48. That's 50% smaller, a huge saving. Also note that we haven't lost any data. We can easily expand this back to the original form without any degradation. A compression technique that has this characteristic is called lossless compression because we don't lose anything. The decompressed data is identical to the original before compression bit for bit. Let's take a look at another type of lossless compression where blocks of data are replaced by more compact representations. This is sort of like don't forget to be awesome being replaced by DFTBA. To do this, we need a dictionary that stores the mapping from codes to data. Let's see how this works for our example. We can view our image as not just a string of individual pixels, but as little blocks of data. For simplicity, we're going to use pixel pairs, which are six bytes long, but blocks can be any size. In our example, there are only four pairings, white yellow, black yellow, yellow yellow, and white white. Those are the data blocks in our dictionary we want to generate compact codes for. What's interesting is that these blocks occur at different frequencies. There are four yellow yellow pairs, two white yellow pairs, and one each of black yellow and white white. Because yellow yellow is the most common block, we want that to be substituted for the most compact representation. Presentation. On the other hand, black, yellow, and white, white can be substituted for something longer because those blocks are infrequent. One method for generating efficient codes is building a Huffman tree, invented by David Huffman while he was a student at MIT in the 1950s. His algorithm goes like this. First, you lay out all the possible blocks and their frequencies. At every round, you select the two with the lowest frequencies. Here, that's black, yellow, and white, white, each with a frequency of one. You combine these into a little tree, which have a combined frequency of two, so we record that. And now one step of the algorithm is done. Now we repeat the process. This time we have three things to choose from. Just like before, we select the two with the lowest frequency, put them into a little tree and record the new total frequency of all the sub items. Okay, we're almost done. This time it's easy to select the two items with the lowest frequency because there are only two things left to pick. We combine these into a tree and now we're done. Our tree looks like this and it has a very cool property. It's arranged by frequency with less common items lower down. So now we have a tree, but you may be wondering how this gets us to a dictionary. Well, we use our frequency sorted tree to generate the codes we need by labeling each branch with a zero or a one, like so. With this, we can write out our code dictionary. Yellow yellow is encoded as just a single zero. White yellow is encoded as one zero. Black yellow is one one zero. And finally, white white is one one one. The really cool thing about these code words is that there's no way to have conflicting codes because each path down the tree is unique. This means our codes are prefix free. That is no code starts with another complete code. Now let's return to our image data and compress it. Our first pixel pair white yellow is substituted for the bits one zero. The next pair is black yellow, which is substituted for one one zero. Next is yellow yellow with the incredibly compact substitution of just zero. And this process repeats for the rest of the image. So instead of 48 bytes of image data, this process has encoded it into 14 bits, not bytes, bits. That's less than two bytes of data. But don't break out the champagne quite yet. This data is meaningless unless we also save our code dictionary. So we'll need to append it to the front of the image data like this. Now, including the dictionary, our image data is 30 bytes long. That's still a significant improvement over 48 bytes. The two approaches we discussed, removing redundancies and using more compact representations are often combined and underlie almost all lossless compressed file formats like GIF, PNG, PDF, and zip files. Both run length encoding and dictionary coders are lossless compression techniques. No information is lost. When you decompress, you get the original file. That's really important for many types of files. Like it'd be very odd if I zipped up a Word document to send to you, and when you decompressed it on your computer, the text was different. But there are other types of files where we can get away with little changes, perhaps by removing unnecessary or less important information, especially information that human perception is not good at detecting. And this trick underlies most lossy compression techniques. These tend to be pretty complicated, so we're going to attack this at a conceptual level. Let's take sound as an example. Your hearing is not perfect. We can hear some frequencies of sound better than others, and there are some we can't hear at all, like ultrasound. 
unless you're a bat. Basically, if we make a recording of music and there's data in the ultrasonic frequency range, we can discard it because we know that humans can't hear it. On the other hand, humans are very sensitive to frequencies in the vocal range, like people singing. It's best to preserve quality there as much as possible. Deep bass is somewhere in between. Humans can hear it, but we're less attuned to it. We mostly sense it. Lossy audio compressors take advantage of this and encode different frequency bands at different precisions. Even if the result is rougher, it's likely that users won't perceive the difference, or at least it doesn't dramatically affect the experience. And here comes the hate mail from the audio files. You encounter this type of audio compression all the time. It's one of the reasons you sound different on a cell phone versus in person. The audio data is being compressed, allowing more people to take calls at once. As the signal quality or bandwidth gets worse, compression algorithms remove more data, further reducing precision, which is why Skype calls sometimes sound like robots talking. Compared to an uncompressed audio format like a wave or FLAC, there we go, got the audio files back, compressed audio files like MP3s are often 10 times smaller. That's a huge saving, and it's why I've got a killer music collection on my retro iPod. Don't judge. This idea of discarding or reducing precision in a manner that aligns with human perception is called perceptual coding, and it relies on models of human perception, which comes from a field of study called psychophysics. This same idea is the basis of lossy compressed image formats, most famously JPEGs. Like hearing, the human visual system is imperfect. We're really good at detecting sharp contrasts, like the edges of objects, but our perceptual system isn't so hot with subtle color variations. JPEG takes advantage of this by breaking images up into blocks of 8x8 pixels then throwing away a lot of the high-frequency spatial data. For example, take this photo of our director's dog, Noodle. So cute! Let's look at a patch of 8x8 pixels. Pretty much every pixel is different from its neighbour, making it hard to compress with lossless techniques, because there's just a lot going on, lots of little details. But human perception doesn't register all those details, so we can discard a lot of it, and replace it with a simplified patch like this. This maintains the visual essence, but might only use 10% of the data. We can do this for all the patches in the image and get this result. You can still see it's a dog, but the image is rougher. So that's an extreme example, going from a slightly compressed JPEG to a highly compressed one, one eighth the original file size. Often you can get away with a quality somewhere in between, and perceptually, it's basically the same as the original. The one on the left is one third the file size of the one on the right. That's big savings for essentially the same thing. Can you tell the difference between the two? Probably not, but I should mention that video compression plays a role in that too, since I'm literally being compressed right now. Videos are really just long sequences of images, so a lot of what I said about them applies here too. But videos can do some extra clever stuff, because between frames, a lot of pixels are going to be the same, like this whole background behind me. This is called temporal redundancy. We don't need to retransmit those pixels every frame of the video, we can just copy patches of data forward. When there are small pixel differences, like the readout on this frequency generator behind me, most video formats send data that encodes just the difference between patches, which is more efficient than retransmitting all the pixels afresh again taking advantage of inter-frame similarity. The fanciest video compression formats go one step further. They find patches that are similar between frames, and not only copy them forward with or without differences, but also can apply simple effects to them, like a shift or rotation. They can also lighten or darken a patch between frames. So if I move my hand side to side like this, the video compressor will identify the similarity, capture my hand in one or more patches, then just move these patches around between frames. You're actually seeing my hand from the past, Kind of freaky, but it uses a lot less data. MPEG-4 videos are common standard, are often 20 to 200 times smaller than the original uncompressed file. However, encoding frames as translations and rotations of patches from previous frames can go horribly wrong when you compress too heavily, and there isn't enough space to update pixel data inside of the patches. The video player will forge ahead applying the right motions, even if the patch data is wrong, and this leads to some hilarious and trippy effects, which I'm sure you've seen. Overall, it's extremely useful to have compression techniques for all the types of data I discussed today. I guess our imperfect vision and hearing are useful too. And it's important to know about compression because it allows users to store pictures, music and videos in efficient ways. Without compression, streaming your favourite carpool karaoke videos on YouTube would be nearly impossible, due to bandwidth and the economics of transmitting that volume of data for free. And now when your Skype calls sound like they're being taken over by demons, you'll know what's really going on. We've talked a lot about inputs and outputs in this series, but they've mostly been between different parts of a computer, like outputting data from RAM or inputting instructions to a CPU. We haven't discussed much about inputs coming from humans. We also haven't learned how people get information out of a computer other than by printing or punching it onto paper. Of course, there's a wide variety of input and output devices that allow us users to communicate with computers. They provide an interface between humans 
human and computer. And today, there's a whole field of study called human-computer interaction. These interfaces are so fundamental to the user experience that they're the focus of the next few episodes. As we discussed at the very beginning of the series, the earliest mechanical and electromechanical computing devices use physical controls for inputs and outputs, like gears, knobs, and switches. And this was pretty much the extent of the human interface. Even the first electronic computers like Colossus and ENIAC were configured using huge panels of mechanical controls and patch wires. It could take weeks to enter in a single program, let alone run it. And to get data out after running a program, results were most often printed to paper. Paper printers were so useful that even Babbage designed one for his difference engine, and that was in the 1820s. However, by the 1950s, mechanical inputs were rendered obsolete by programs and data stored entirely on mediums like punch cards and magnetic tape. Paper printouts were still used for the final output, and huge banks of indicator lights were developed to provide real-time feedback while the program was in progress. It's important to recognize that computer input of this era was designed to be as simple and robust as possible for computers. Ease and understanding for users was a secondary concern. Punch tape is a great example. This was explicitly designed to be easy for computers to read. The continuous nature of tape made it easy to handle mechanically, and the holes could be reliably detected with a mechanical or optical system which encoded instructions and data. But of course, humans don't think in terms of little punch holes and strips of paper. So the burden was on the programmers. They had to spend the extra time and effort to convert their ideas and programs into a language and a format that was easy for computers of the era to understand, often with the help of additional staff and auxiliary devices. It's also important to note that early computers, basically pre-1950, had an extremely simple notion of human input. Yes, humans input programs and data into computers, but these machines generally didn't respond interactively to humans. Once a program was started, it typically ran until it was finished. That's because these machines were way too expensive to be waiting around for humans to type a command or enter data. Any input needed for a computation was fed in at the same time as the program. This started to change in the late 1950s. On one hand, smaller scale computers started to become cheap enough that it was feasible to have a human in the loop. That is, a back and forth between human and computer. And on the other hand, big fancy computers became fast and sophisticated enough to support many programs and users at once, what were called multitasking and time-sharing systems. But these computers needed a way to get input from users. For this, computers borrowed the ubiquitous data entry mechanism of the era, keyboards. At this point, typing machines had already been in use for a few centuries, but it was Christopher Latham Scholes who invented the modern typewriter in 1868. It took until 1874 to refine the design and manufacture it, but it went on to be a commercial success. Scholl's typewriter adopted an unusual keyboard layout that you know well, QWERTY, named for the top left row of letter keys. There has been a lot of speculation as to why this design was used. The most prevalent theory is that it put common letter pairings in English far apart to reduce the likelihood of type bars jamming when entered in sequence. It's a convenient explanation, but it's also probably false, or at least not the full story. In fact, QWERTY puts many common letter pairs together, like TH and ER. And we know that Scholes and his team went through many iterations before arriving at this iconic arrangement. Regardless of the reason, the commercial success of Scholes' typewriter meant that the competitor companies that soon followed duplicated his design. Many alternative keyboard layouts have been proposed over the last century, claiming various benefits. But once people had invested the time to learn QWERTY, they just didn't want to learn something new. This is what economists would call a switching barrier or switching cost. And it's for this very basic human reason that we still use QWERTY keyboards almost a century and a half later. I should mention that QWERTY isn't universal. There are many international variants, like the French Azerty layout or the Quertz layout common in Central Europe. Interestingly, Scholes didn't envision that typing would ever be faster than handwriting, which is around 20 words per minute. Typewriters were introduced chiefly for legibility and standardization of documents, not speed. However, as they became standard equipment in offices, the desire for speedy typing grew. And there were two big advances that unlocked typing's true potential. Around 1880, Elizabeth Longley, a teacher at the Cincinnati Shorthand and Typewriter Institute, started to promote 10-finger typing. This required much less finger movement than Hunt and Peck, so it offered enhanced typing speeds. Then, a few years later, Frank McGurin, a federal court clerk in Salt Lake City, taught himself to touch type, as in he didn't need to look at the keys while typing. In 1888, McGurin won a highly publicized typing speed contest, after which 10-finger touch typing began to catch on. Professional typists were soon able to achieve speeds upwards of 100 words per minute, much faster than handwriting, and nice and neat too. So humans are pretty good with typewriters, but we can't just plunk down a typewriter in front of a computer and have it type. They have no fingers. Instead, early computers adapted a special type of typewriter that was used for telegraphs called a teletype machine. 
These were electromechanically augmented typewriters that could send and receive text over telegraph lines. Pressing a letter on one teletype keyboard would cause a signal to be sent over telegraph wires to a teletype machine on the other end, which would then electromechanically type that letter. This allowed two humans to type to one another over long distances, basically a steampunk version of a chat room. Since these teletype machines already had an electronic interface, they were easily adapted for computer use, and teletype computer interfaces were common in the 1960s and 70s. Interaction was pretty straightforward. Users would type a command, hit enter, and then the computer would type back. This text, conversation between a user and a computer, went back and forth. These were called command line interfaces, and they remained the most prevalent form of human computer interaction up until around the 1980s. Command line interaction on a teletype machine looks something like this. A user can type any number of possible commands. Let's check out a few, beginning with seeing all the files in the current directory we're in. For this, we would type the command ls, which is short for list, and the computer replies with a list of the files in our current directory. If we want to see what's in our secret Star Trek Discovery cast.txt file, we use yet another command to display the contents. In Unix, we can call cat, short for concatenate. We need to specify which file to display, so we include that after the command, called an argument. If you're connected to a network with other users, you can use a primitive version of a Find My Friends app to get more info on them with the command finger. Electromechanical teletype machines were the primary computing interface for most users up until around the 1970s. Although computer screens first emerged in the 1950s and were used for graphics, they were too expensive and low resolution for everyday use. However, mass production of televisions for the consumer market and general improvements in processors and memory meant that by 1970 it was economically viable to replace electromechanical teletype machines with screen-based equivalents. But rather than build a whole new standard to interface computers with these screens, engineers simply recycled the existing text-only teletype protocol. These machines used a screen, which simulated endless paper. It was text in and text out, nothing more. The protocol was identical, so computers couldn't even tell if it was paper or a screen. These virtual teletype or glass teletype machines became known as terminals. By 1971, it was estimated in the United States there was something on the order of 70,000 electromechanical teletype machines and 70,000 screen-based terminals in use. Screens were so much better, faster and more flexible though. Like you could delete a mistake and it would disappear. So by the end of the 1970s, screens were standard. You might think that command line interfaces are way too primitive to do anything interesting. But even when the only interaction was through text, programmers found a way to make it fun. Early interactive text-based computer games include famous titles like Zork, created in 1977. Players of these sorts of early games were expected to engage their limitless imaginations as they visualized the fictional world around them, like what terrifying monster confronted them when it was pitch black and you were likely to be eaten by a Gru. Let's go back to our command line, now on a fancy screen-based terminal and play. Just like before, we can see what's in our current directory with the ls command. Then let's go into our games directory by using the cd command for change directory. Directory. Now we can use our ls command again to see what games are installed on our computer. Sweet, we have adventure! All we have to do to run this program is type its name. Until this application halts or we quit it, it takes over the command line. What you're seeing here is actual interaction from Colossal Cave Adventure, first developed by Will Crother in 1976. In the game, players can type in one or two word commands to move around, interact with objects, pick up items and so on. The program acts as the narrator, describing locations, possible actions and the results of those actions. Certain ones resulted in death. The original version only had 66 locations to explore, but it's widely considered to be the first example of interactive fiction. These text adventure games later became multiplayer called MUDs or multi-user dungeons, and they're the great forebearers of the awesome graphical MMO RPGs we enjoy today. And if you want to know more about the history of these and other games, we've got a whole series on it hosted by Andre Meadows. Command line interfaces, while simple, are very powerful. Computer programming is still very much a written task, and as such, command lines are a natural interface. For this reason, even today, most programmers use command line interfaces as part of their work, and they're also the most common way to access computers that are far away, like a server in a different country. If you're running Windows, Mac OS or Linux, your computer has a command line interface, one you may have never used. Check it out by typing CMD in your Windows search bar or search for Terminal on Mac. Then install a copy of Zork and play on. So you can see how these early advancements still have an impact on computing today. Just imagine if your phone didn't have a good old fashioned QWERTY keyboard. It could take forever to type your Instagram captions. But there's still something missing from our discussion, all the sweet, sweet graphics. That's our topic for next week. 
See you soon. 1960 PDP-1 is a great example of early computing with graphics. You can see a cabinet-sized computer on the left, an electromechanical teletype machine in the middle, and a round screen on the right. Note how they're separated. That's because text-based tasks and graphical tasks were often distinct back then. In fact, these early computer screens had a very hard time rendering crisp text, whereas typed paper offered much higher contrast and resolution. The most typical use for early computer screens was to keep track of a program's operation, like values in registers. It didn't make sense to have a teletype machine print this on paper over and over and over again. That would waste a lot of paper, and it was slow. On the other hand, screens were dynamic and quick to update, perfect for temporary values. Computer screens were rarely considered for program output, though. Instead, any results from a computation were typically written to paper or some other more permanent medium. But screens were so darn useful that by the early 1960s, people started to use them for awesome things. <laughs> A lot of different display technologies have been created over the decades, but the most influential and also the earliest were cathode ray tubes or CRTs. These work by shooting electrons out of an emitter at ferromagnetic fields. Plates or coils are used inside to steer electrons to a desired position, both left, right and up, down. With this control, there are two ways you can draw graphics. The first option is to direct the electron beam to trace out shapes. This is called vector scanning. Because the glow persists for a little bit, if you repeat the path quickly enough, you create a solid image. The other option is to repeatedly follow a fixed path, scanning line by line from top left to bottom right and looping over and over again. You only turn on the electron beam at certain points to create graphics. This is called raster scanning. With this approach you can display shapes and even text all made of little line segments. Eventually, as display technologies improved, it was possible to render crisp dots onto the screen, also known as pixels. The liquid crystal displays, or LCDs, that we use today are quite a different technology, but they use raster scanning too, updating the brightness of little tiny red, green, and blue pixels many times a second. Interestingly, most early computers didn't use pixels, not because they couldn't physically, but because it consumed way too much memory for computers of the time. A 200 by 200 pixel image can contains 40,000 pixels. Even if you use just one bit of data for each pixel, that's black or white, not grayscale, the image would consume 40,000 bits of memory. That would have gobbled up more than half of a PDP-1's entire RAM. So computer scientists and engineers had to come up with clever tricks to render graphics until memory sizes caught up to our pixelicious ambitions. Instead of storing tens of thousands of pixels, early computers stored a much smaller grid of letters, most typically 80 by 25 characters. That's 2,000 characters in total, and if each is encoded in 8 bits using something like ASCII, it would consume 16,000 bits of memory for an entire screen full of text, which is way more reasonable. To pull this off, computers needed an extra piece of hardware that could read characters out of RAM and convert them into raster graphics to be drawn onto the screen. This was called a character generator, and they were basically the first graphics cards. Inside, they had a little piece of read-only memory, a ROM, that stored graphics for each character, called a dot matrix pattern. If the graphics card saw the 8-bit code for the letter K, then it would raster scan its 2D pattern onto the screen in the appropriate position. To do this, the character generator had special access to a portion of the computer's memory reserved for graphics, a region called the screen buffer. Computer programs wishing to render text to the screen simply manipulated the values stored in this region, just as they could with any other data in RAM. This scheme required much less memory, but it also meant the only thing you could draw was text. Even still, people got pretty inventive with ASCII art. People also tried to make rudimentary pseudo-graphical interfaces out of this basic set of characters, using things like underscores and plus signs to create boxes, lines, and other primitive shapes. But the character set was really too small to do anything terribly sophisticated. So various extensions to ASCII were made that added new semi-graphical characters, like IBM CP437 character set, seen here, which was used in DOS. On some systems, the text color and background color could be defined with a few extra bits. Bits. That allowed glorious interfaces like this DOS example, which is built entirely out of the character set you just saw. Character generators were a clever way to save memory, but they didn't provide any way to draw arbitrary shapes, and that's important if you want to draw content like electrical circuits, architectural plans, maps, and well, pretty much everything that isn't text. To do this without resorting to memory gobbling pixels, computer scientists used the vector mode available on CRTs. The idea is pretty straightforward. All content to be drawn on screen is defined by a series of lines. There's no text. If you need to draw text, you have to draw it out of lines. Don't read between the lines here. There is only lines. Got it? 
All right, no more wordplay. I'm drawing the line here. Let's pretend this video is a Cartesian plane, 200 units wide and 100 tall, with the origin that's the zero, zero point in the upper left corner. We can draw a shape with the following vector commands, which we've borrowed from the Vectrex, an early vector display system. First, we reset, which clears the screen, moves the drawing point of the electron gun to zero, zero, and sets the brightness of lines to zero. Then we move the drawing point down to 50-50 and set the line intensity to 100%. With the intensity up, now we can move to 150, then 60, 75, and then back to 50, 50. The last thing to do is to set our line intensity back to 0%. Cool, we've got a triangle. This sequence of commands would consume about 160 bits, which is way more efficient than keeping a huge matrix of pixel values. Just like how characters were stored in memory and turned into graphics by a character generator, these vector instructions were also stored in memory and rendered to a screen using a vector graphics card. Hundreds of commands could be packed together sequentially in the screen buffer and used to build up complex graphics, all made of lines. Because all these vectors are stored in memory, computer programs can update the values freely, allowing for graphics that change over time. Animation. One of the very earliest video games, Space War, was built on a PDP-1 in 1962 using vector graphics. It's credited with inspiring many later games like Asteroids and even the first commercial arcade video game, Computer Space. 1962 was also a huge milestone because of Sketchpad, an interactive graphical interface that offered computer-aided design called CAD software today. It's widely considered the earliest example of a complete graphical application, and its inventor Ivan Sutherland later won the Turing Award for this breakthrough. To interact with graphics, Sketchpad used a recently invented input device called a light pen, which was a stylus tethered to a computer with a wire. By using a light sensor in the tip, the pen detected the refresh of the computer monitor. Using the timing of the refresh, the computer could actually figure out the pen's position on the screen. With this light pen and various buttons on a gigantic computer, users could draw lines and other simple shapes. Sketchpad could do things like make lines perfectly parallel, the same length, straighten corners into perfect 90 degree intersections, and even scale shapes up and down dynamically. These things that were laborious on paper, a computer now did with a press of a button. Users were also able to save complex designs they created, and then paste them into later designs, and even share with other people. You could have whole libraries of shapes, like electronic components and pieces of furniture, that you could just plop in and manipulate in your creations. This might all sound pretty routine from today's perspective, but in 1962, when computers were still cabinet-sized behemoths chugging through punch cards, Sketchpad and light pens were equal parts eye-opening and brain-melting. They represented a key turning point in how computers could be used. They were no longer just number-crunching math machines that hummed along behind closed doors. Now they were potential assistants, interactively augmenting human tasks. The earliest computers and displays with true pixel graphics emerged in the late 1960s. Bits in memory directly mapped to pixels on the screen, what were called bitmap displays. With full pixel control, totally arbitrary graphics were possible. You can think of a screen's graphics as a huge matrix of pixel values. As before, computers reserve a special region of memory for pixel data, called the frame buffer. In the early days, the computer's RAM was used, but later systems used special high-speed video RAM, or VRAM, which was located on the graphics card itself for high-speed access. This is how it's done today. On an 8-bit grayscale screen, we can set values from zero intensity, which is black, to 255 intensity, which is white. Well, actually, it might be green or orange, as many early displays couldn't do white. Let's pretend this video is a really low-resolution bitmap screen with a resolution of 60 by 35 pixels. If we wanted to set the pixel at 1010 to be white, we could do it with a piece of code like this. If we wanted to draw a line, let's say from 30, 0 to 3035, we can use a loop like so. And this changes a whole line of pixels to white. If we want to draw something more complicated, let's say a rectangle, we need to know four values. Values, the x and y coordinates of its starting corner and its width and height. So far we've drawn everything in white, so let's specify this rectangle to be grey. Grey is halfway between 0 and 255, so that's a colour value of 127. Then with two loops, one nested in the other, so that the inner loop runs once for every iteration of the outer loop, we can draw a rectangle. When the computer executes our code as part of its draw routine, it colours in all the pixels we specified. Let's wrap this up into a draw rectangle function like this. Now to draw a second rectangle on the other side of the screen, maybe in black this time, we could just call our rectangle drawing function. 
Voila! Just like the other graphic schemes we've discussed, programs can manipulate pixel data in the frame buffer, creating interactive graphics. Pong time! Of course, programmers aren't wasting time writing drawing functions from scratch. They use graphic libraries with ready-to-go functions for drawing lines, curves, shapes, text, and other cool stuff. Just a new level of abstraction. The flexibility of bitmap graphics opened up a whole new world of possibilities for interactive computing, but it remained expensive for decades. As I mentioned last episode, by as late as 1971, it was estimated there were around 70,000 electromechanical teletype machines and 70,000 terminals in use in the United States. Amazingly, there are only around 1,000 computers in the US that had interactive graphical screens. That's not a lot, but the stage was set, helped along by pioneering efforts like Sketchpad and Space Wars, for computer displays to become ubiquitous, and with them, the dawn of graphical user interfaces, which we'll cover in a few episodes. Science. Early in this series, we covered computing history from roughly the dawn of civilization up to the birth of electronic general purpose computers in the mid 1940s. A lot of the material we've discussed over the past 23 episodes, like programming languages and compilers, algorithms and integrated circuits, floppy disks and operating systems, teletypes and screens, all emerged over roughly a 30-year period, from the mid-1940s up to the mid-1970s. This is the era of computing before companies like Apple and Microsoft existed, and long before anyone tweeted, googled, or ubered. It was a formative period setting the stage for personal computers, the World Wide Web, self-driving cars, virtual reality, and many other topics we'll get to in the second half of this series. Today, we're going to step back from circuits and algorithms and review this influential period. We'll pay special attention to the historical backdrop of the Cold War, the space race, and the rise of globalization and consumerism. Pretty much immediately after World War II concluded in 1945, there was tension between the world's two new superpowers, the United States and the USSR. The Cold War had begun, and with it, massive government spending on science and engineering. Computing, which had already demonstrated its value in wartime efforts like the Manhattan Project and code-breaking Nazi communications, was lavished with government funding. That enabled huge, ambitious computing projects to be undertaken, like ENIAC, EDVAC, ATLAS, and Whirlwind, all mentioned in previous episodes. This spurred rapid advances that simply weren't possible in the commercial sector alone, where projects were generally expected to recoup development costs through sales. This began to change in the early 1950s, especially with Eckert and Muckley's Univac 1, the first commercially successful computer. Unlike ENIAC or ATLAS, this wasn't just one single computer, it was a model of computer. In total, more than 40 were built. Most of these Univacs went to government offices or large companies, which was part of the growing military-industrial complex in the United States, with pockets deep enough to afford the cutting edge. Famously, a Univac 1 built for the US Atomic Energy Commission was used by CBS to predict the results of the 1952 US presidential election. With just 1% of the vote, the computer correctly predicted an Eisenhower landslide, while pundits favoured Stevenson. It was a media event that helped propel computing to the forefront of the public's imagination. Computing was unlike machines of the past, which generally augmented human physical abilities. Trucks allowed us to carry more, automatic looms wove faster, machine tools were more precise, and so on for a bunch of contraptions that typified the Industrial Revolution. But computers, on the other hand, could augment human intellect. This potential wasn't lost on Vannevar Bush, who in 1945 published an article on a hypothetical computing device he envisioned called the Memex. This was a device in which an individual stores all his books, records, and communications, and which is mechanized so it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility. It is an enlarged, intimate supplement to his memory. He also predicted that wholly new forms of encyclopedia will appear, ready-made with a mesh of associative trails running through them. Sound familiar? Memex directly inspired several subsequent game-changing systems, like Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad, which we discussed last episode, and Doug Engelbart's online system, which we'll cover soon. Vannevar Bush was the head of the US Office of Scientific Research and Development, which was responsible for funding and coordinating scientific research during World War II. With the Cold War brewing, Bush lobbied for a creation of a peacetime equivalent, the National Science Foundation, formed in 1950. To this day, the NSF provides federal funding to support scientific research in the United States, and it is a major reason the US has continued to be a leader in the technology sector. It was also in the 1950s that consumers started to buy transistor-powered gadgets. Notable among them was the transistor radio, which was small, durable, and battery-powered. 
And it was portable, unlike the vacuum tube-based radio sets from the 1940s and before. It was a runaway success, the Furby or iPhone of its day. The Japanese government, looking for industrial opportunities to bolster their post-war economy, soon got in on the action, licensing the rights to transistors from Bell Labs in 1952, helping launch the Japanese semiconductor and electronics industry. In 1955, the first Sony product was released, the TR55 transistor radio. Concentrating on quality and price, Japanese companies captured half of the US market for portable radios in just five years. This planted the first seeds of a major industrial rivalry in the decades to come. In 1953, there were only around 100 computers on the entire planet. And at this point, the USSR was only a few years behind the West in computing technology, completing their first programmable electronic computer in 1950. But the Soviets were way ahead in the burgeoning space race. Let's go to the thought bubble. The Soviets launched the world's first satellite into orbit, Sputnik 1, in 1957. And a few years later, in 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space. This didn't sit well with the American public and prompted President Kennedy, a month after Gagarin's mission, to encourage the nation to land a man on the moon within the decade. And it was expensive. NASA's budget grew almost tenfold, peaking in 1966 at roughly 4.5% of the US's federal budget. Today, it's around half a percent. NASA NASA used this funding to tackle a huge array of enormous challenges. This culminated in the Apollo program, which at its peak employed roughly 400,000 people, further supported by over 20,000 universities and companies. One of these huge challenges was navigating in space. NASA needed a computer to process complex trajectories and issue guidance commands to the spacecraft. For this, they built the Apollo guidance computer. There were three significant requirements. First, the computer had to be fast. No surprise there. Second, it had to be small and lightweight. There's not a lot of room in a spacecraft and every ounce is precious when you're flying a quarter million miles to the moon. And finally, it had to be really, really ridiculously reliable. This is super important in a spacecraft where there's lots of vibration, radiation and temperature change. And there's no running to Best Buy if something breaks. The technology of the era of vacuum tubes and discrete transistors just weren't up to the task. So NASA turned to a brand new technology, integrated circuits, which we discussed a few episodes ago. The Apollo guidance computer was the first computer to use them, a huge paradigm shift. NASA was also the only place that could afford them. Initially, each chip cost around $50, and the guidance computer needed thousands of them. But by paying that price, the Americans were able to beat the Soviets to the moon. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Although the Apollo guidance computer is credited with spurring the development and adoption of integrated circuits, it was a low volume product. There were only 17 Apollo missions after all. It was actually military applications, especially the Minuteman and Polaris nuclear missile systems, that allowed integrated circuits to become a mass-produced item. This rapid advancement was further accelerated by the US building and buying huge powerful computers, often called supercomputers because they were frequently 10 times faster than any other computer on the planet upon their release. But these machines, built by companies like CDC, Cray and IBM, were also super in cost, and pretty much only governments could afford to buy them. In the US, these machines went to government agencies like the NSA and government research labs like Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos National Laboratories. Initially, the US semiconductor industry boomed, buoyed by high-profit government contracts. However, this meant that most US companies overlooked the consumer market where profit margins were small. The Japanese semiconductor industry came to dominate this niche. By having to operate with lean profit margins in the 1950s and 60s, the Japanese had invested heavily in manufacturing capacity to achieve economies of scale, in research to improve quality and yields, and in automation to keep manufacturing costs low. In the 1970s, with the space race and Cold War subsiding, previously juicy defense contracts began to dry up, and American semiconductor and electronics companies found it harder to compete. It didn't help that many computing components had been commoditized. DRAM was DRAM. So why buy expensive Intel memory when you could buy the same chip for less from Hitachi? Throughout the 1970s, US companies began to downsize, consolidate, or outright fail. Intel had to lay off a third of its workforce in 1974, and even the storied Fairchild Semiconductor was acquired in 1979 after near bankruptcy. To survive, many of these companies began to outsource their manufacturing in a bid to reduce costs. Intel withdrew from its main product category, memory ICs, and decided to refocus on processors which ultimately saved the company. This lull in the US electronics industry allowed Japanese companies like Sharp and Casio to dominate the breakout computing product of the 1970s, handheld electronic calculators. By using integrated circuits, these could be made small and cheap. They replaced expensive desktop adding machines you'd find in offices. For most people, it was the first time they didn't have to do math on paper or use a slide rule. They were an instant hit, selling by the millions. 
This further drove down the cost of integrated circuits and led to the development and widespread use of microprocessors, like the Intel 4004 we've discussed previously. This chip was built by Intel in 1971 at the request of Japanese calculator company Bizicom. Soon, Japanese electronics were everywhere, from televisions and VCRs to digital wristwatches and Walkmans. The availability of inexpensive microprocessors spawned entirely new products like video arcades. The world got Pong in 1972 and Breakout in 1976. As costs continued to plummet, soon it became possible for regular people to afford computing devices. During this time, we see the emergence of the first successful home computers, like the 1975 Altair 8800, and also the first home gaming consoles, like the Atari 2600 in 1977. Home. Let me repeat that. Home. That seems like a small thing today, but this was the dawn of a whole new era in computing. In just three decades, computers had evolved from machines where you could literally walk inside of the CPU, assuming you had government clearance, to the point where a child could play with a handheld toy containing a microprocessor many times faster. Critically, this dramatic evolution wouldn't have been possible without two powerful forces at play, governments and consumers. Government funding like the United States provided during the Cold War enabled early adoption of many nascent computing technologies. This funding helped float entire industries relating to computing long enough for the technology to mature and become commercially feasible. Then businesses, and ultimately consumers, provided the demand to take it mainstream. The Cold War may be over, but this relationship continues today. Governments are still funding science research, intelligence agencies are still buying supercomputers, humans are still being launched into space, and you're still buying TVs, Xboxes, Playstations, laptops and smartphones. And for these reasons, computing continues to advance at lightning pace. As we discussed last week, the idea of having a computer all to yourself, a personal computer, was elusive for the first three decades of electronic computing. It was just way too expensive for a computer to be owned and used by one single person. But by the early 1970s, all the required components had fallen into place to build a low-cost but still usefully powerful computer. Not a toy, but a tool. Most influential in this transition was the advent of single-chip CPUs, which were surprisingly powerful, yet small and inexpensive. Advances in integrated circuits also offered offered low-cost solid-state memory, both for computer RAM and ROM. Suddenly, it was possible to have an entire computer on one circuit board, dramatically reducing manufacturing costs. Additionally, there was cheap and reliable computer storage, like magnetic tape cassettes and floppy disks. And finally, the last ingredient was low-cost displays, often just repurposed televisions. If you blended these four ingredients together in the 1970s, you got what was called a microcomputer, because these things were so tiny compared to normal computers of that era, the types you'd see in businesses or universities. But more important than their size was their cost. These were, for the first time, sufficiently cheap. It was practical to buy one and only have one person ever use it. No time sharing, no multi-user logins, just a single owner and user. The personal computer era had arrived. Computer cost and performance eventually reached the point where personal computing became viable. But it's hard to define exactly when that happened. There's no one point in time, and as such, there are many contenders for the title first personal computer, like the Kenback One and the MCM70. Less disputed, however, is the first commercially successful personal computer, the Altair 8800. This machine debuted on the cover of Popular Electronics in 1975 and was sold as a $439 kit that you built yourself. Inflation adjusted, that's about $2,000 today, which isn't chump change, but extremely cheap for a computer in 1975. Tens of thousands of kits were sold to computer hobbyists, and because of its popularity, there were soon all sorts of nifty add-ons available. Things like extra memory, a paper tape reader, and even a teletype interface. This allowed you, for example, to load a longer, more complicated program from punch tape and then interact with it using a teletype terminal. However, these programs still had to be written in machine code, which was really low-level and nasty, even for hardcore computer enthusiasts. This problem didn't escape a young Bill Gates and Paul Allen, who were 19 and 22 respectively. They contacted MITS, the company making the Altair 8800, suggesting the computer would be more attractive to hobbyists if it could run programs written in BASIC, a popular and simple programming language. To do this, they needed to write a program that converted BASIC instructions into native machine code, what's called an interpreter. This is very similar to a compiler but happens as the program runs instead of beforehand. 
Let's go to the Thought Bubble. Mitz was interested and agreed to meet Bill and Paul for a demonstration. Problem is, they haven't written the interpreter yet. So they hacked it together in just a few weeks without even an Altair 8800 to develop on, finishing the final piece of code on the plane. The first time they knew their code worked was at Mitz headquarters in Albuquerque, New Mexico for the demo. Fortunately, it went well and Mitz agreed to distribute their software. Altair Basic became the newly formed Microsoft's first product. Although computer hobbyists existed prior to 1975, the Altair 8800 really jump-started the movement. Enthusiast groups formed, sharing knowledge and software and passion about computing. Most legendary among these is the Homebrew Computer Club, which met for the first time in March 1975 to see a review unit of the Altair 8800, one of the first to ship to California. At the first meeting was 24-year-old Steve Wozniak, who was so inspired by the Altair 8800 that he set out to design his own computer. In May 1976, he demonstrated his prototype to the club and shared the schematics with interested members. Unusual for the time, it was designed to connect to a TV and offered a text interface, a first for a low-cost computer. Interest was high and shortly after, fellow club member and college friend Steve Jobs suggested that instead of just sharing the designs for free, they should sell an assembled motherboard. However, you still had to add your own keyboard, power supply and enclosure. It went on sale in July 1976 with a price tag of $666.66. It was called the Apple One, and it was Apple Computer's first product. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Like the Altair 8800, the Apple One was sold as a kit. It appealed to hobbyists, who didn't mind tinkering and soldering, but consumers and businesses weren't interested. This changed in 1977 with the release of three game-changing computers that could be used right out of the box. First was the Apple II, Apple's earliest product that sold as a complete system that was professionally designed and manufactured. It also offered rudimentary colour graphics and sound output, amazing features for a low-cost machine. The Apple II series of computers sold by the millions and quickly propelled Apple to the forefront of the personal computing industry. The second computer was the TRS-80 Model 1, made by the Tandy Corporation and sold by Radio Shack, hence the TRS. Although less advanced than the Apple II, it was half the cost and sold like hotcakes. Finally, there was the Commodore PET 2001, with a unique all-in-one design that combined computer, monitor, keyboard and tape drive into one device, aimed to appeal to consumers. It started to blur the line between computer and appliance. These three computers became known as the 1977 Trinity. They all came bundled with basic interpreters, allowing non-computer wizards to create programs. The consumer software industry also took off, offering games and productivity tools for personal computers like calculators and word processors. The killer app of the era was 1979's VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet program, which was infinitely better than paper and the forebearer of programs like Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets. But perhaps Perhaps the biggest legacy of these computers was their marketing. They were the first to be targeted at households and not just businesses and hobbyists. And for the first time in a substantial way, computers started to appear in homes and also small businesses and schools. This caught the attention of the biggest computer company on the planet, IBM, who had seen its share of the overall computer market shrink from 60% in 1970 to around 30% by 1980. This was mainly because IBM had ignored the microcomputer market, which was growing at about 40% annually. As microcomputers evolved into personal computers, IBM knew it needed to get in on the action. But to do this, it would have to radically rethink its computer strategy and design. In 1980, IBM's least expensive computer, the 5120, cost roughly $10,000, which was never going to compete with the likes of the Apple II. This meant starting from scratch. A crack team of 12 engineers, later nicknamed the Dirty Dozen, were sent off to offices in Boca Raton, Florida, to be left alone and put their talents to work. Shielded from IBM internal politics, they were able to design a machine as they desired. Instead of using IBM proprietary CPUs, they chose Intel chips. Instead of using IBM's preferred operating system, CPM, they licensed Microsoft Disk Operating System, DOS, and so on from the screen to the printer. For the first time, IBM divisions had to compete with outside firms to build hardware and software for the new computer. This radical break from the company tradition of in-house development kept costs low and brought partner firms into the fold. After just a year of development, the IBM Personal Computer, or IBM PC, was released. It was an immediate success, especially with businesses that had long trusted the IBM brand. But most influential to its ultimate success was that the computer featured an open architecture, with good documentation and expansion slots, allowing third parties to create new hardware and peripherals for the platform. That included things like graphics cards, sound cards, external hard drives, joysticks and countless other add-ons. 
This spurred innovation and also competition, resulting in a huge ecosystem of products. This open architecture became known as IBM Compatible. If you bought an IBM Compatible computer, it meant that you could use that huge ecosystem of software and hardware. Being an open architecture also meant that competitor companies could follow the standard and create their own IBM compatible computers. Soon, Compact and Dell were selling their own PC clones, and Microsoft was happy to license MS-DOS to them, quickly making it the most popular PC operating system. IBM alone sold 2 million PCs in the first three years, overtaking Apple. With a large user base, software and hardware developers concentrated their efforts on IBM compatible platforms. There were just more users to sell to. Then people wishing to buy a computer bought the one with the most software and hardware available, and this affects snowballed. Whereas companies producing non-IBM compatible computers, often with superior specs, failed. Only Apple kept significant market share without IBM compatibility. Apple ultimately chose to take the opposite approach, a closed architecture, proprietary designs that typically prevent people from adding new hardware to their computers. This meant that Apple made its own computers, with its own operating system and often its own peripherals, like displays, keyboards and printers. By controlling the full stack from hardware to software, Apple was able to control the user experience and improve reliability. These competing business strategies were the genesis of the Mac versus PC division that still exists today, which is a misnomer because they're both personal computers, but whatever. To survive the onslaught of low-cost PCs, Apple needed to up its game and offer a user experience that PCs and DOS couldn't. Their answer was the Macintosh, released in 1984. This groundbreaking, reasonably low-cost, all-in-one computer booted not a command-line text interface, but rather a graphical user interface. We ended last episode with the 1984 release of Apple's Macintosh personal computer. It was the first computer a regular person could buy with a graphical user interface and a mouse to interact with it. This was a radical evolution from the command-line interfaces found on all other personal computers of the era. Instead of having to remember or guess the right commands to type in, a graphical user interface shows you what functions are possible. You just have to look around the screen for what you want to do. It's a point and click interface. All of a sudden, computers were much more intuitive. Anybody, not just hobbyists or computer scientists, could figure things out all by themselves. The Macintosh is credited with taking graphical user interfaces or GUIs mainstream, but in reality, they were the result of many decades of research. In previous episodes, we've discussed some early interactive graphical applications like Sketchpad and Space War, both made in 1962. But these were one-off programs and not whole integrated computing experiences. Arguably, the true forefather of modern GUIs was Douglas Engelbart. Let's go to the thought bubble. During World War II, while Engelbart was stationed in the Philippines as a radar operator, he read Vannevar Bush's article on the Memex. These ideas inspired him, and when his Navy service ended, he returned to school, completing a PhD in 1955 at UC Berkeley. Heavily involved in the emerging computing scene, he collected his thoughts in a seminal 1962 report titled Augmenting Human Intellect. Engelbart believed that the complexity of the problems facing mankind was growing faster than our ability to solve them. Therefore, finding ways to augment our intellect would seem to be both a necessary and a desirable goal. He saw that computers could be useful beyond just automation, and be essential interactive tools for future knowledge workers to tackle complex problems. Further inspired by Ivan Sutherland's recently demonstrated sketchpad, Engelbart set out to make his vision a reality, recruiting a team to build the online system. He recognised that a keyboard alone was insufficient for the type of applications he was hoping to enable. In his words, we envisioned problem solvers using computer aided working stations to augment their efforts. They required the ability to interact with information displays using some sort of device to move a cursor around the screen. And in 1964, working with colleague Bill English, he created the very first computer mouse. The wire came from the bottom of the device and looked very much like a rodent and the nickname stuck. Thanks Thought Bubble! In 1968, Engelbart demonstrated his whole system at the Full Joint Computer Conference in what's often referred to as the mother of all demos. The demo was 90 minutes long and demonstrated many features of modern computing, bitmap graphics, video conferencing, word processing, and collaborative real-time editing of documents. There were also precursors to modern GUIs, like the mouse and multiple windows, although they couldn't overlap. It was way ahead of its time, and like many products with that label, it ultimately failed at least commercially, but its influence on computer researchers of the day was huge. Engelbart was recognised for this watershed moment in computing with a Turing Award in 1997. Federal funding started to reduce in the early 1970s, which we discussed two episodes ago. At that point, many of Engelbart's team, including Bill English, left and went to Xerox's newly formed Palo Alto Research Centre, more commonly known as Xerox Park. 
It was here that the first true GUI computer was developed, the Xerox Alto, finished in 1973. For the computer to be easy to use, it needed more than just fancy graphics. It needed to be built around a concept that people were already familiar with, so they could immediately recognize how to use the interface with little or no training. Xerox's answer was to treat the 2D screen like the top of a desk or a desktop. Just like how you can have many papers laid out on a desk, a user could have several computer programs open at once. Each was contained in their own frame, which offered a view onto the application called a window. Also like papers on a desk, these windows could overlap, blocking the items behind them. And there were desk accessories like a calculator and clock that the user could place on the screen and move around. It wasn't an exact copy of a desktop though, instead it was a metaphor of a desktop. For this reason, surprisingly, it's called the desktop metaphor. There are many ways to design an interface like this, but the Alto team did it with windows, icons, menus and a pointer, what's called a WIMP interface. It's what most desktop GUIs use today. It also offered a basic set of widgets, reusable graphical building blocks, things like buttons, checkboxes, sliders and tabs, which were also drawn from real world objects to make them familiar. GUI applications are constructed from these widgets. So let's try coding a simple example using this new programming paradigm. First, we have to tell the operating system that we need a new window to be created for our app. We do this through a GUI API. We need to specify the name of the window and also its size. Let's say 500 by 500 pixels. Now let's add some widgets, a text box and a button. These require a few parameters to create. First, we need to specify what window they should appear in because apps can't have multiple windows. We also need to specify the default text, the X and Y location in the window, and a width and height. Okay, so now we've got something that looks like a GUI app, but has no functionality. If you click the roll button, nothing happens. In previous examples we've discussed, the code pretty much executes from top to bottom. GUIs, on the other hand, use what's called event-driven programming. Code can fire at any time in different orders in response to events. In this case, it's user-driven events, like clicking on a button, selecting a menu item, or scrolling a window. Or if a cat runs across your key, Keyboard, it's a bunch of events all at once. Let's say that when the user clicks the roll button, we want to randomly generate a number between 1 and 20, and then show that value in our text box. We can write a function that does just that. We can even get a little fancy and say if we get the number 20, set the background color of the window to blood red. The last thing we need to do is hook this code up so that it's triggered each time our button is clicked. To do this, we need to specify that our function handles this event for our button by adding a line to our initialize function. The type of event in this case is a click event and our function is the event handler for that event. Now we're done. We can click that button all day long and each time our roll d20 function gets dispatched and executed. This is exactly what's happening behind the scenes when you press the little bold button in a text editor or select shutdown from a drop down menu. A function linked to that event is firing. Hope I don't roll a 20. Ah! Okay, back to the Xerox Alto. Roughly 2,000 Altos were made and used at Xerox and given to university labs. They were never sold commercially. Instead, the Park team kept refining the hardware and software, culminating in the Xerox Star system released in 1981. The Xerox Star extended the desktop metaphor. Now files look like pieces of paper and they could be stored in little folders, all of which could sit on your desktop or be put away into digital filing cabinets. It's a metaphor that sits on top of the underlying file system. From a user's perspective, this is a new level of abstraction. Xerox, being in the printing machine business, also advanced text and graphics creation tools. For example, they introduced the terms cut, copy and paste. This metaphor was drawn from how people dealt with making edits in documents written on typewriters. You'd literally cut text out with scissors and then paste it with glue into the spot you wanted in another document. Then you'd photocopy the page to flatten it back down into a single layer, making the change invisible. Thank goodness for computers. This manual process was moot with the advent of word processing software, which existed on platforms like the Apple II and Commodore PET. But Xerox went way beyond the competition with the idea that whatever you made on the computer should look exactly like the real world version if you printed it out. They dubbed this, what you see is what you get, or WYSIWYG. Unfortunately, like Engelbart's online system, the Xerox Star was ahead of its time. Sales were sluggish because it had a price tag equivalent to nearly $200,000 today for an office setup. It also didn't help that the IBM PC launched that same year, followed by a tsunami of cheap IBM compatible PC clones. But the great ideas that Park researchers had been cultivating and building for almost a decade didn't go to waste. In December of 1979, a year and a half before the Xerox Star shipped, a guy you may have heard of visited. 
Steve Jobs. There's a lot of lore surrounding this visit, with many suggesting that Steve Jobs and Apple stole Xerox's ideas, but that simply isn't true. In fact, Xerox approached Apple, hoping to partner with them. Ultimately, Xerox was able to buy a million dollar stake in Apple before its highly anticipated IPO, but it came with an extra provision. Disclose everything cool going on at Xerox Park. Steve knew they had some of the greatest minds in computing, but he wasn't prepared for what he saw. There was a demonstration of Xerox's graphical user interface running on a crisp bitmap display, all driven with intuitive mouse input. Steve later said, It was like a veil being lifted from my eyes. I could see the future of what computing was destined to be. Steve returned to Apple with his engineering entourage and they got to work inventing new features, like the menu bar and a trash can to store all files to be deleted. It would even bulge when full again with the metaphors. Apple's first product with a graphical user interface and mouse was the Apple Lisa, released in 1983. It was a super advanced machine with a super advanced price, almost $25,000 today. That was significantly cheaper than the Xerox Star, but it turned out to be an equal flop in the market. Luckily, Apple had another project up its sleeve, the Macintosh, released a year later in 1984. It had a price of around $6,000 today, a quarter of the Lisa's cost, and it hit the mark, selling 70,000 units in the first 100 days. But after the initial craze, sales started to falter, and Apple was selling more of its Apple II computers than Max. A big problem was that no one was making software for this new machine with its new radical interface. And it got worse. The competition caught up fast. Soon other personal computers had primitive but usable GUIs on computers a fraction of the cost. Consumers ate it up, and so did PC software developers. With Apple's finances looking increasingly dire and tensions growing with Apple's new CEO John Scully, Steve Jobs was ousted. A few months later, Microsoft released Windows 1.0. It may not have been as pretty as Mac OS, but it was the first salvo in what would become a bitter rivalry and near dominance of the industry by Microsoft. Within 10 years, Microsoft Windows was running on almost 95% of personal computers. Initially, fans of Mac OS could rightly claim superior graphics and ease of use. Those early versions of Windows were all built on top of DOS, which was never designed to run GUIs. But after Windows 3.1, Microsoft began to develop a new consumer-oriented OS with an upgraded GUI called Windows 95. This was a significant rewrite that offered much more than just polished graphics. It also had advanced features Mac OS didn't have, like program multitasking and protected memory. Windows 95 introduced many GUI elements still seen in Windows versions today, like the Start menu, Taskbar, and Windows Explorer File Manager. Microsoft wasn't infallible though. Looking to make the desktop metaphor even easier and friendlier, it worked on a product called Microsoft Bob, and it took the idea of using metaphors to an extreme. Now you had a whole virtual room on your screen, with applications embodied as objects that you could put on tables and shelves. It even came with a crackling fireplace and a virtual dog to offer assistance. And you see those doors on the sides? Yep, those went to different rooms in your computer where different applications were available. As you might have guessed, it was not a success. This is a great example of how the user interfaces we enjoy today are the product of what's essentially natural selection. Whether you're running Windows, Mac, Linux, or some other desktop GUI, it's almost certainly an evolved version of the WIMP paradigm first introduced on the Xerox Auto. Along the way, a lot of bad ideas were tried and failed. Everything had to be invented, tested, refined, adopted, or dropped. Today, GUIs are everywhere, and while they're good, they're not always great. No doubt you've experienced design-related frustrations after downloading an application, used someone else's phone, or visited a website. And for this reason, computer scientists and interface designers continue to work hard to craft computing experiences that are both easier and more powerful. Ultimately, working towards Engelbart's vision of augmenting human intellect. Over the past five episodes, we've worked up from text-based teletype interfaces to pixelated bitmap graphics. Then, last episode, we covered graphical user interfaces and all their ooey-gooey richness. All of these examples have been 2D, but of course, we're living in a 3D world and I'm a three-dimensional girl. So today, we're going to talk about some fundamental methods in 3D computer graphics and how you render them onto a 2D screen. As we discussed in episode 20, we can write functions that draw a line between any two points, like A and B. By manipulating the X and Y coordinates of points A and B, we can manipulate the line. In 3D graphics, points have not just two coordinates, but three, X, Y, and Z, or Z. 
but I'm gonna say Z. Of course, we don't have X, Y, Z coordinates on a 2D computer screen, so graphics algorithms are responsible for flattening 3D coordinates onto a 2D plane. This process is known as 3D projection. Once all of the points have been converted from 3D to 2D, we can use the regular 2D line drawing function to connect the dots, literally. This is called wireframe rendering. Imagine building a cube out of chopsticks and shining a flashlight on it. The shadow it casts onto your wall, its projection is flat. If you rotate the cube around, you can see it's a 3D object, even though it's a flat projection. This transformation from 3D to 2D is exactly what your computer is doing, just with a lot more math and less chopsticks. There are several types of 3D projection. What you're seeing right now is an orthographic projection, where, for example, the parallel sides in the cube appear as parallel in the projection. In the real 3D world, though, parallel lines converge as they get further from the viewer, like a road going to the horizon. This type of 3D projection is called perspective projection. It's the same process, just with different math. Sometimes you want perspective and sometimes you don't. The choice is up to the developer. Simple shapes like cubes are easily defined by straight lines, but for more complex shapes, triangles are better, what are called polygons in 3D graphics. Look at this beautiful teapot made out of polygons. A collection of polygons like this is a mesh. The denser the mesh, the smoother the curves and the finer the details. But that also increases the polygon count, which means more work for the computer. Game designers have to carefully balance model fidelity versus polygon count, because if the count goes too high, the frame rate of an animation drops below what users perceive as smooth. For this reason, there are algorithms for simplifying meshes. The reason triangles are used and not squares or polygons or some other more complex shape is simplicity. Three points in space unambiguously define a plane. If you give me three points in a 3D space, I can draw a plane through it. There is only one single answer. This isn't guaranteed to be true for shapes with four or more points. Also, two points aren't enough to define a plane, only a line. So three is the perfect and minimal number. Triangles for the win. Wireframe rendering is cool and all, sort of retro, but of course 3D graphics can also be filled. The classic algorithm for doing this is called scanline rendering, first developed in 1967 at the University of Utah. For a simple example, let's consider just one polygon. Our job here is to figure out how this polygon translates to filled pixels on a computer screen. So let's first overlay a grid of pixels to fill. The scanline algorithm starts by reading the three points that make up the polygon and finding the lowest and highest Y values. It will only consider rows between these two points. Then the algorithm works down one row at a time. In each row, it calculates where a line running through the center of a row intersects with the side of the polygon. Because polygons are triangles, if you intersect one line, you have to intersect with another. It's guaranteed. The job of the scanline algorithm is to fill in the pixels between the two intersections. Let's see how this works. On the first row we look at, we intersect here and here. The algorithm then colors in all the pixels between those two intersections. And this just continues row by row, which is why it's called scan line rendering. When we hit the bottom of the polygon, we're done. The rate at which a computer fills in polygons is called the fill rate. Admittedly, this is a pretty ugly filled polygon. It has what are known as jaggies, those rough edges. This effect is less pronounced when using smaller pixels, but nonetheless, you see these in games all the time, especially on lower powered platforms. One method to soften this effect is anti-aliasing. Instead of filling pixels in a polygon with the same color, we can adjust the color based on how much the polygon cuts through each pixel. If a pixel is entirely inside of a polygon, it gets fully colored. But if the polygon only grazes a pixel, it'll get a lighter shade. This feathering of the edges is much more pleasant to the eyes. Anti-aliasing is used all over the place, including in two 2D graphics like fonts and icons. If you lean in real close to your monitor, closer, closer, you'll see all the fonts in your browser are anti-aliased. So smooth. In a 3D scene, there are polygons that are part objects in the back, near the front, and just about everywhere. Only some are visible because some objects are hidden behind other objects in the scene, what's called occlusion. The most straightforward way to handle this is to use a sort algorithm and arrange all the polygons in the scene from farthest to nearest, then render them in that order. This is called the painter's algorithm because painters also have to start with the background and then increasingly work up to foreground elements. Consider this example scene with three overlapping polygons. To make things easier to follow, we're going to color the polygons differently. 
Also, for simplicity, we'll assume these polygons are all parallel to the screen. But in a real program like a game, the polygons can be tilted in 3D space. Our three polygons A, B and C are at distance 20, 12 and 14. The first thing the painter's algorithm does is sort all the polygons from farthest to nearest. Now that they're in order, we can use scanline rendering to fill each polygon one at a time. We start with polygon A, the furthest one away. Then we repeat the process for the next farthest polygon, in this case C, and then we repeat this again for polygon B. Now we're all done and you can see the ordering is correct. The polygons that are closer are in front. An alternative method for handling occlusion is called Z buffering. It achieves the same output as before but with a different algorithm. Let's go back to our previous example, before it was sorted. That's because this algorithm doesn't need to sort any polygons, which makes it faster. In short, Z buffering keeps track of the closest distance to a polygon for every pixel in the scene. It does this by maintaining a Z buffer, which is just a matrix of values that sits in memory. At first, every pixel is initialized to infinity. Then Z buffering starts with the first polygon in its list. In this case, it's A. It follows the same logic as the scanline algorithm, but instead of coloring in pixels, it checks the distance of the polygon versus what's recorded in its Z buffer. It records the lower of the two values. For our polygon A with a distance of 20, it wins against infinity every time. When it's done with polygon A, it moves on to the next polygon in its list, and the same thing happens. Now, because we didn't sort the polygons, it's not always the case that later polygons overwrite high values. In in the case of polygon C, only some of the values in the Z buffer get new minimum distances. This completed Z buffer is used in conjunction with a fancier version of scanline rendering that not only tests for line intersection, but also does a lookup to see if that pixel will even be visible in the final scene. If it's not, the algorithm skips it and moves on. An interesting problem arises when two polygons have the same distance, like if polygon A and B are both at a distance of 20, which one do you draw on top? Polygons are constantly being shuffled around in memory and changing their access order. Plus, rounding errors are inherent in floating point computations, so which one gets drawn on top is often unpredictable. The result is a flickering effect called Z fighting, which if you've played 3D games, you've no doubt encountered. Speaking of glitches, another common optimization in 3D graphics is called back face culling. If you think about it, a triangle has two sides, a front and a back. With something like the head of an avatar or the ground in a game, you should only ever see one side, the side facing outwards. So to save processing time, the back side of polygons are often ignored in the rendering pipeline, which cuts the number of polygon faces to consider in half. This is great, except when there's a bug that lets you get inside of those objects and look outwards. Then the avatar head or ground becomes invisible. Moving on. We need to talk about lighting, also known as shading, because if it's a 3D scene, the lighting should vary over the surface of objects. Let's go back to our teapot mesh. With scanline rendering colouring in all the polygons, our teapot looks like this, not very 3D. So let's add some lighting to enhance the realism. As an example, we'll pick three polygons from different parts of our teapot. Unlike our previous examples, we're now going to consider how these polygons are oriented in 3D space. They're no longer parallel to the screen, but rather tilted in different 3D directions. The direction they face is called the surface normal and we can visualize that direction with a little 3D arrow that's perpendicular to the polygon surface. Now let's add a light source. Each polygon is going to be illuminated a different amount. Some will appear brighter because their angle causes more light to be reflected towards the viewer. For example, the bottommost polygon is tilted downwards, away from the light source, which means it's going to be dark. In a similar way, the rightmost polygon is slightly facing away from the light, so it will be partially illuminated. And finally, there's the upper left polygon. Its angle means it will reflect light from the light source towards our view, so it will appear bright. If we do this for every polygon, our teapot looks like this, which is much more realistic. This approach is called flat shading and it's the most basic lighting algorithm. Unfortunately, it also makes all those polygon boundaries really noticeable and the mesh doesn't look smooth. For this reason, more advanced lighting algorithms were developed, such as Guro shading and Fong shading. Instead of colouring in polygons just using one colour, they vary the colour across the surface in clever ways, which results in much nicer output. We also need to talk about textures, which in graphics refers to the look of a surface rather than its feel. Like with lighting, there are many algorithms with all sorts of fancy effects. The simplest is texture mapping. To visualise this process, let's go back to our single polygon. When we're filling this in using scanline rendering, we can look up what colour to use at every pixel according to a texture image saved in memory. 
To do this, we need a mapping between the polygon's coordinates and the texture's coordinates. Let's jump to the first pixel that scanline rendering needs to fill in. The texturing algorithm will consult the texture in memory, take the average color from the corresponding region, and fill the polygon accordingly. This process repeats for all pixels in the polygon, and that's how we get textures. If you combine all the techniques we've talked about this episode, you get a wonderfully funky little teapot. And this teapot can sit in an even bigger scene, comprised of millions of polygons. Rendering a scene like this takes a fair amount of computation, but importantly, it's the same type of calculations being performed over and over and over again for many millions of polygons. Scan line filling, anti-aliasing, lighting and texturing. However, there are a couple of ways to make this much faster. First off, we can speed things up by having special hardware with extra bells and whistles just for these specific types of computations, making them lightning fast. And secondly, we can divide up a 3D scene into many smaller parts and then render all the pieces in parallel rather than sequentially. CPUs aren't designed for this, so they aren't particularly fast. So computer engineers created special processors just for graphics, a GPU or graphics processing unit. These can be found on graphics cards inside of your computer, along with RAM reserved for graphics. This is where all the meshes and textures live, allowing them to be accessed super fast by many different cores of the GPU all at once. A modern graphics card like a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti contains 3584 processing cores, offering massive parallelization. It can process hundreds of millions of polygons every second. Okay, that concludes our whistle-stop tour of 3D graphics. As we talked about last episode, your computer is connected to a large distributed network called the internet. I know this because because you're watching a YouTube video which is being streamed over that very internet. It's arranged as an ever-enlarging web of interconnected devices. For your computer to get this video, the first connection is to your local area network, or LAN, which might be every device in your house that's connected to your Wi-Fi router. This then connects to a wide area network, or WAN, which is likely to be a router run by your internet service provider, or ISP, companies like Comcast, AT&T, or Verizon. At first, this will be a regional router, like one for your neighborhood, and then that router connects to an even bigger WAN, maybe one for your whole city or town. There might be a couple more hops, but ultimately you'll connect to the backbone of the internet, made up of gigantic routers with super high bandwidth connections running between them. To request this video file from YouTube, a packet had to work its way up to the backbone travel along that for a bit, and then work its way back down to a YouTube server that had the file. That might be four hops up, two hops across the backbone, and four hops down, for a total of 10 hops. If you're running Windows, MacOS, or Linux, you can see the route data takes to different places on the internet by using the trace route program on your computer. Instructions are in the doobly-doo. For us here at the Chad and Stacey Evergold studio in Indianapolis, the route to the DFTBA server in California goes through 11 stops. We start at 192.168.0.1. That's the IP address for my computer on our LAN. Then there's the Wi-Fi router here at the studio, then a series of regional routers, and then we get onto the backbone. And then we start working back down to the computer hosting dftba.com, which has the IP address 104.24.109.186. But how does a packet actually get there? What happens if a packet gets lost along the way? If I type dftba.com into my web browser, how does it know the server's address? These are our topics for today. As we discussed last episode, the internet is a huge distributed network that sends data around as little packets. If your data is big enough, like an email attachment, it might get broken up into many packets. For example, this video stream is arriving to your computer right now as a series of packets, and not one gigantic file. Internet packets have to conform to a standard called the Internet Protocol or IP. It's a lot like sending physical mail through the postal system. Every letter needs a unique and legible address written on it and there are limits to the size and weight of packages. Violate this and your letter won't get through. IP packets are very similar. However, IP is very low level protocol. There isn't much more than a destination address in a packet's header, which is the metadata that's stored in front of the data payload. This means that a packet can show up at a computer, but the computer may not know which application to give the data to, Skype or Call of Duty. For this reason, more advanced protocols were developed that sit on top of IP. One of the simplest and most common is the User Datagram Protocol, or UDP. UDP has its own header, which sits inside the data payload. Inside of the UDP header is some useful extra information. One of them is a port number. Every program wanting to access the internet will ask its host computer's operating system to be given a unique port, like Skype might ask for the port number 3478. 
When a packet arrives to the computer, the operating system will look inside the UDP header and read the port number. Then, if it sees, for example, 3478, it will give the packet to Skype. So to review, IP gets the packet to the right computer, but UDP gets the packet to the right program running on that computer. UDP headers also include something called a checksum, which allows the data to be verified for correctness. As the name suggests, it does this by checking the sum of the data. Here's a simplified version of how this works. Let's imagine the raw data in our UDP packet is 89, 111, 33, 32, 58, and 41. Before the packet is sent, the transmitting computer calculates the checksum by adding all the data together. 89 plus 111 plus 33 and so on. In our example, this adds up to a checksum of 364. In UDP, the checksum value is stored in 16 bits. If the sum exceeds the maximum possible value, the uppermost bits overflow and only the lower bits are used. Now, when the receiving computer gets this packet, it repeats the process, adding up all the data. 89 plus 111 plus 33 and so on. If that sum is the same as the checksum sent in the header, all is well. But if the numbers don't match, you know that the data got corrupted at some point in transit, maybe because of a power fluctuation or faulty cable. Unfortunately, UDP doesn't offer any mechanisms to fix the data or request a new copy. Receiving programs are alerted to the corruption, but typically just discard the packet. Also, UDP provides no mechanisms to know if packets are getting through. A sending computer shoots the UDP packet off, but has no confirmation it ever gets to its destination successfully. Both of these properties sound pretty catastrophic, but some applications are okay with this because UDP is also really simple and fast. Skype, for example, which uses UDP for video chat, can handle corrupt or missing packets. That's why sometimes if you're on a bad internet connection, Skype gets all glitchy. Only some of the UDP packets are making it to your computer. But this approach doesn't work for many other types of data transmission. Like, it doesn't really work if you send an email and it shows up with the middle missing. The whole message really needs to get there correctly. When it absolutely positively needs to get there, programs use the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, which like UDP, rides inside the data payload of IP packets. For this reason, people refer to this combination of protocols as TCP IP. Like UDP, the TCP header contains a destination port and checksum, but it also contains fancier features, and we'll focus on the key ones. First off, TCP packets are given sequential numbers, so packet 15 is followed by packet 16, which is followed by 17, and so on for potentially millions of packets sent during that session. These sequence numbers allow a receiving computer to put the packets into the correct order, even if they arrive at different times across the network. So if an email comes in all scrambled, the TCP implementation in your computer's operating system will piece it all together correctly. Second, TCP requires that once a computer has correctly received a packet and the data passes the checksum, that it send back an acknowledgement, or ACK, as the cool kids say, to the sending computer. Knowing the packet made it successfully, the sending can now transmit the next packet, but this time let's say it waits and doesn't get an acknowledgement packet back. Something must be wrong. If enough time elapses, the sender will go ahead and just retransmit the same packet. It's worth noting here that the original packet might have actually gotten there, but the acknowledgement is just really delayed, or perhaps it was the acknowledgement that was lost. Either way, it doesn't matter because the receiver has those sequence numbers, and if a duplicate packet arrives, it can be discarded. Also, TCP isn't limited to a back and forth conversation. It can send many packets and have many outstanding acts, which increases bandwidth significantly since you aren't wasting time waiting for acknowledgement packets to return. Interestingly, the success rate of acts and also the round trip time between sending and acknowledging can be used to infer network congestion. TCP uses this information to adjust how aggressively it sends packets, a mechanism for congestion control. So basically, TCP can handle out of order packet delivery, dropped packets including retransmission, and even throttle its transmission rate according to available bandwidth. Pretty awesome. You might wonder why anyone would use UDP when TCP has all those nifty features. The single biggest downside are all those acknowledgement packets. It doubles the number of messages on the network, and yet you're not transmitting any more data. That overhead, including associated delays, is sometimes not worth the improved robustness, especially for time-critical applications like multiplayer first-person shooters. And if it's you getting lag-fragged, you'll definitely agree. When your computer wants to make a connection to a website, you need two things an IP address and a port, like port 80, at 172.217.7.238. This example is the IP address and port for the Google web server. In fact, you can enter this into your browser's address bar like so, and you'll end up on the Google homepage. This gets you to the right destination, but remembering that long string of digits would be really annoying. It's much easier to remember google.com. So the internet has a special service that maps these domain names to addresses. It's like the phone book for the internet,
internet, and it's called the Domain Name System, or DNS for short. You can probably guess how it works. When you type something like youtube.com into your web browser, it goes and asks a DNS server, usually one provided by your ISP, to look up the address. DNS consults its huge registry and replies with the address, if one exists. In fact, if you try mashing your keyboard, adding .com and then hit enter in your browser, you'll likely be presented with an error that says DNS failed. That's because the site doesn't exist, so DNS couldn't give your browser an address. But if DNS returns a valid address, which it should for YouTube.com, then your browser shoots off a request over TCP for the website's data. There's over 300 million registered domain names, so to make our DNS look up a little bit more manageable, it's not stored as one gigantically long list, but rather in a tree data structure. What are called top-level domains, or TLDs, are at the very top. These are huge categories like .com and .gov. Then there are lower level domains that sit below that, called second level domains. Examples under .com include google.com and dftba.com. Then there are even lower level domains called subdomains, like images.google.com and store.dftba.com. And this tree is absolutely huge. Like I said, more than 300 million domain names, and that's just second level domain names, not all the subdomains. For this reason, the data is distributed across many DNS servers, which are authorities for different parts of the tree. Okay, I know you've been waiting for it. We've reached a new level of abstraction. Over the past two episodes, we've worked up from electrical signals on wires or radio signals transmitted through the air in the case of wireless networks. This is called the physical layer. MAC addresses, collision detection, exponential backoff, and similar low-level protocols that mediate access to the physical layer are part of the data link layer. Above this is the network layer, which is where all the switching and routing technologies that we discussed operate. And today, we've mostly covered the transport layer, protocols like UDP and TCP, which are responsible for point-to-point -point data transfer between computers, and also things like error detection and recovery when possible. We've also grazed the session layer, where protocols like TCP and UDP are used to open a connection, pass information back and forth, and then close the connection when finished, what's called a session. This is exactly what happens when you, for example, do a DNS lookup or request a web page. These are the bottom five layers of the Open System Interconnection OSI model, a conceptual framework for compartmentalizing all these different network processes. Each level has different things to worry about and solve, and it would be impossible to build one huge networking implementation. As we've talked about all series, abstraction allows computer scientists and engineers to be improving all these different levels of the stack simultaneously, without being overwhelmed by the full complexity. And amazingly, we're not quite done yet. The OSI model has two more layers, the presentation layer and the application layer, which include things like web browsers, Skype, HTML decoding, streaming movies, and more, which we'll talk about next week. See you then. The internet is amazing. In just a few keystrokes, we can stream videos on YouTube, hello, read articles on Wikipedia, order supplies on Amazon, video chat with friends, and tweet about the weather. Without a doubt, the ability for computers and their users to send and receive information over a global telecommunications network forever changed the world. 150 years ago, sending a letter from London to California would have taken two to three weeks, and that's if you paid for express mail. Today, that email takes a fraction of a second. This million-fold improvement in latency, that's the time it takes for a message to transfer, juiced up the global economy, helping the modern world to move at the speed of light on fiber optic cables spanning the globe. You might think that computers and networks always went hand in hand, but actually most computers pre-1970 were humming away all alone. However, as big computers started popping up everywhere and low-cost machines started to show up on people's desks, it became increasingly useful to share data and resources, and the first networks of computers appeared. Today, we're going to start a three-episode arc on how computer networks came into being, and the fundamental principles and techniques that power them. <laughs> The first computer networks appeared in the 1950s and 60s. They were generally used within an organization, like a company or research lab, to facilitate the exchange of information between different people and computers. This was faster and more reliable than the previous method of having someone walk a pile of punch cards or a reel of magnetic tape to a computer on the other side of the building, which was later dubbed a sneaker net. A second benefit of networks was the ability to share physical resources. For example, instead of each computer having its own printer, everyone could share one attached to the network. 
It was also common on early networks to have large shared storage drives, ones too expensive to have attached to every machine. These relatively small networks of close-by computers are called local area networks or LANs. A LAN could be as small as two machines in the same room or as large as a university campus with thousands of computers. Although many LAN technologies were developed and deployed, the most famous and successful was Ethernet, developed in the early 1970s at Xerox PARC and still widely used today. In its simplest form, a series of computers are connected to a single common Ethernet cable. When a computer wants to transmit data to another computer, it writes the data as an electrical signal onto the cable. Of course, because the cable is shared, every computer plugged into the network sees the transmission, but doesn't know if the data is intended for them or another computer. To solve this problem, Ethernet requires that each computer has a unique media access control address or MAC address. The unique address is put into a header that prefixes any data sent over the network. So computers simply listen to the Ethernet cable and only process data when they see their address in the header. This works really well. Every computer made today comes with its own unique MAC address for both Ethernet and Wi-Fi. The general term for this approach is Carrier Sense Multiple Access, or CSMA for short. The carrier in this case is any shared transmission medium that carries data, copper wire in the case of Ethernet, and the air carrying radio waves for Wi-Fi. Many computers can simultaneously sense the carrier, hence the sense and multiple access, and the rate at which the carrier can transmit data is called its bandwidth. Unfortunately, using a shared carrier has one big drawback. When network traffic is light, computers can simply wait for silence on the carrier and then transmit their data. But as network traffic increases, the probability that two computers will attempt to write data at the same time also increases. This is called a collision, and the data gets all garbled up, like two people trying to talk on the phone at the same time. Fortunately, computers can detect these collisions by listening to the signal on the wire. The most obvious solution is for computers to stop transmitting, wait for silence, and then try again. Problem is, the other computer is going to try that too, and other computers on the network that have been waiting for the carrier to go silent will try to jump in during any pause. This just leads to more and more collisions. Soon, everyone is talking talking over one another and has a backlog of things they need to say, like breaking up with a boyfriend over a family holiday dinner. Terrible idea. Ethernet had a surprisingly simple and effective fix. When transmitting computers detect a collision, they wait for a brief period before attempting to retransmit. As an example, let's say one second. Of course, this doesn't work if all the computers use the same wait duration. They just collide again one second later. So a random period is added. One computer might wait 1.3 seconds, while another waits 1.5 seconds. With any luck, the computer that waited 1.3 seconds will wake up, find the carrier to be silent, and start transmitting. When the 1.5 second computer wakes up a moment later, it will see the carrier is in use, and will wait for the other computer to finish. This definitely helps, but doesn't totally solve the problem, so an extra trick is used. As I just explained, if a computer detects a collision while transmitting, it will wait one second, plus some random extra time. However, if it collides again, which suggests network congestion, instead of waiting another one second, this time it will wait two seconds. If it collides again, it will wait four seconds, and then eight, and then 16, and so on, until it's successful. With computers backing off, the rate of collision goes down, and data starts moving again, freeing up the network. Family dinner saved. This backing off behavior using an exponentially growing wait time is called exponential backoff. Both Ethernet and Wi-Fi use it, and so do many transmission protocols. But even with clever tricks like exponential backoff, you can never have an entire university's worth of computers on one shared Ethernet cable. To reduce collisions and improve efficiency, we need to shrink the number of devices on any given shared carrier, what's called the collision domain. Let's go back to our earlier Ethernet example, where we had six computers on one shared cable, aka one collision domain. To reduce the likelihood of collisions, we can break this network into two collision domains by using a network switch. It sits between our two smaller networks and only passes data between them if necessary. It does this by keeping a list of what MAC addresses are on what side of the network. So if A wants to transmit to C, the switch doesn't forward the data to the other network. There's no need. This means if E wants to transmit to F at the same time, the network is wide open and two transmissions can happen at once. But if F wants to send data to A, then the switch passes it through and the two networks are both briefly occupied. This is essentially how big computer networks are constructed, including the biggest one of all, the internet, which literally interconnects a bunch of smaller networks, allowing inter-network communication. What's interesting about these big networks is that there's often multiple paths to get data from one location to another. And this brings us to another fundamental networking topic, 
routing. The simplest way to connect two distant computers or networks is by allocating a communication line for their exclusive use. This is how early telephone systems worked. For example, there might be five telephone lines running between Indianapolis and Missoula. If John picked up the phone wanting to call Hank in the 1910s, John would tell a human operator where he wanted to call, and they'd physically connect John's phone line into an unused line running to Missoula. For the length of that call, that line was occupied, and if all five lines were already in use, John would have to wait for one to become free. This approach is called circuit switching, because you're literally switching whole circuits to route traffic to the correct destination. It works fine, but it's relatively inflexible and expensive, because there's often unused capacity. On the upside, once you have a line to yourself, or you have the money to buy one for your private use, you can use it to its full capacity without having to share. For this reason, the military, banks and other high importance operations still buy dedicated circuits to connect their data centers. Another approach for getting data from one place to another is message switching, which is sort of like how the postal system works. Instead of a dedicated route from A to B, messages are passed through several stops. So if John writes a letter to Hank, it might go from Indianapolis to Chicago, and then hop to Minneapolis, then Billings, and then finally make it to Missoula. Each stop knows where to send it next, because they keep a table of where to pass letters given a destination address. What's neat about message switching is that they can use different routes, making communication more reliable and fault tolerant. Sticking with our mail example, if there's a blizzard in Minneapolis grinding things to a halt, the Chicago Mail Hub can decide to route the letter through Omaha instead. In our example, cities are acting like network routers. The number of hops a message takes along its route is called the hop count. Keeping track of the hop count is useful because it can help identify routing problems. For example, let's say Chicago thinks the fastest route to Missoula is through Omaha, but Omaha thinks the fastest route is through Chicago. That's bad, because both cities are going to look at the destination address, Missoula, and end up passing the message back and forth between them endlessly. Not only is this wasting bandwidth, but it's a routing error that needs to get fixed. This kind of error can be detected because the hop count is stored with the message and updated along its journey. If you start seeing messages with high hop counts, you can bet something has gone awry in the routing. This threshold is called the hop limit. A downside to message switching is that messages are sometimes big, so they can clog up the network, because the whole message has to be transmitted from one stop to the next before continuing on its way. While a big file is transferring, that whole link is tied up. Even if you have a tiny one kilobyte email trying to get through, it either has to wait for the big file transfer to finish or take a less efficient route. That's bad. The solution is to chop up big transmissions into many small pieces called packets. Just like with message switching, each packet contains the destination address on the network, so routers know where to forward them. This format is defined by the Internet Protocol, or IP for short, a standard created in the 1970s. Every computer connected to a network gets an IP address. You've probably seen these as four 8-bit numbers written with dots in between. For example, 172.217.7.238 is an IP address for one of Google's servers. With millions of computers online all exchanging data, bottlenecks can appear and disappear in milliseconds. Network routers are constantly trying to balance the load across whatever routes they know to ensure speedy and reliable delivery, which is called congestion control. Sometimes different packets from the same message take different routes through a network. This opens the possibility of packets arriving at their destination out of order, which is a problem for some applications. Fortunately, there are protocols that run on top of IP, like TCP IP, that handle this issue. We'll talk more about that next week. Chopping up data into small packets and passing these along flexible routes with spare capacity is so efficient and fault tolerant is what the whole internet runs on today. This routing approach is called packet switching. It also has the nice property of being decentralized with no central authority or single point of failure. In fact, the threat of nuclear attack is why packet switching was developed during the Cold War. Today, routers all over the globe work cooperatively to find efficient routings, exchanging information with each other using special protocols like the Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, and the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP. The world's first packet switch network and the ancestors of the modern internet was the ARPANET, named after the US agency that funded it, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Here's what the entire ARPANET looked like in 1974. Each smaller circle is a location, like a university or research lab, that operated a router. They also plugged in one or more computers. You can see PDP-1s, IBM System 360, and even an atlas in London connected over satellite link. Obviously, the internet has grown by leaps and bounds in the decades since. 
Today, instead of a few dozen computers online, it's estimated to be nearing 10 billion, and it continues to grow rapidly, especially with the advent of Wi-Fi connected refrigerators, thermostats, and other smart appliances, forming an internet of things. So that's part one, an overview of computer networks. Is it a series of tubes? Well, sort of. Over the past two episodes, we've delved into the wires, signals, switches, packets, routers, and protocols that make up the internet. Today, we're going to move up yet another level of abstraction and talk about the World Wide Web. This is not the same thing as the internet, even though people often use the two terms interchangeably. The World Wide Web runs on top of the internet in the same way that Skype, Minecraft, or Instagram do. The internet is the underlying plumbing that conveys the data for all these different applications. And the World Wide Web is the biggest of them all, a huge distributed application running on millions of servers worldwide, accessed using a special program called a web browser. We're going to learn about that and much more in today's episode. The fundamental building block of the World Wide Web, or web for short, is a single page. This is a document containing content which can include links to other pages. These are called hyperlinks. You all know what these look like, text or images that you can click and they jump you to another page. These hyperlinks form a huge web of interconnected information, which is where the whole thing gets its name. This seems like such an obvious idea, but before hyperlinks were implemented, every time you wanted to switch to another piece of information on a computer, you had to rummage through the file system to find it, or type it into a search box. With hyperlinks, you can easily flow from one related topic to another. The value of hyperlinked information was conceptualized by Vannevar Bush way back in 1945. He published an article describing a hypothetical machine called a Memex, which we discussed in episode 24. Bush described it as associative indexing, whereby any item may be caused at will to select another immediately and automatically. He elaborated, the process of trying two things together is the important thing. Thereafter, at any time, when one of those items is in view, the other item can be instantly recalled merely by tapping a button. In 1945, computers didn't even have screens, so this idea was way ahead of its time. Text containing hyperlinks is so powerful, it got an equally awesome name, hypertext. Web pages are the most common type of hypertext document today. They're retrieved and rendered by web browsers, which we'll get to in a few minutes. In order for pages to link to one another, each hypertext page needs a unique address. On the web, this is specified by a uniform resource locator, or URL for short. An example web page URL is thecrashcourse.com slash courses. Like we discussed last episode, when you request a site, the first thing your computer does is a DNS lookup. This takes a domain name as input, like thecrashcourse.com, and replies back with the matching computer's IP address. Now armed with the IP address of the computer you want, your web browser opens a TCP connection to a computer that's running a special piece of software called a web server. The standard port number for web servers is port 80. At this point, all your computer has done is connect to the web server at the address, thecrashcourse.com. The next step is to ask that web server for the course's hypertext page. To do this, it uses the aptly named Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. The very first documented version of this spec, HTTP 0.9, created in 1991, only had one command, get. Fortunately, that's pretty much all you need. Because we're trying to get the courses page, we send the server the following command, get slash courses. This command is sent as a raw ASCII text to the web server, which then replies back with the web page hypertext we requested. This is interpreted by your computer's web browser and rendered to your screen. If the user follows a link to another page, the computer just issues another get request, and this goes on and on as you surf around the website. In later versions, HTTP added status codes, which prefixed any hypertext that was sent following a get request. For example, status code 200 means, okay, I've got the page and here it is. Status codes in the 400 are for client errors. Like if a user asks the web server for a page that doesn't exist, that's the dreaded 404 error. Web page hypertext is stored and sent as plain old text, for example, encoded in ASCII or UTF-16, which we talked about in episodes four and 20. Because plain text files don't have a way to specify what's a link and what's not, it was necessary to develop a way to mark up a text file with hypertext elements. For this, the hypertext markup language was developed. The very first version of HTML version 0.8 created in 1990 provided 18 HTML commands to mark up pages. That's it. Let's build a web page with these. First, let's give our web page a big heading. To do this, we type in the letters H1, which indicates the start of a first level heading, and we surround that in angle brackets. This is one example of an HTML tag. Then we enter whatever heading we want. We don't want the whole page to be a heading, so we need to close the H1 tag like so, with a little slash in the front. Now let's add some content. 
Visitors may not know what Klingons are, so let's make that word a hyperlink to the Klingon Language Institute for more information. We do this with an A tag, inside of which we include an attribute that specifies a hyperlink reference. That's the page to jump to if the link is clicked. And finally, we need to close the A tag. Now let's add a second level heading, which uses an H2 tag. HTML also provides tags to create lists. We start this by adding the tag for an ordered list. Then we can add as many items as we want, surrounded in li tags, which stands for list item. People may not know what a batlop is, so let's make that a hyperlink too. Lastly, for good form, we need to close the ordered list tag. And we're done. That's a very simple web page. If you save this text into Notepad or TextEdit and name it something like test.html, you should be able to open it by dragging it into your computer's web browser. Of course, today's web pages are a tad more sophisticated. The newest version of HTML, version 5, has over 100 different tags for things like images, tables, forms, and buttons. And there are other technologies we're not going to discuss, like cascading style sheets or CSS and JavaScript, which can be embedded into HTML pages and do even fancier things. That brings us back to web browsers. This is the application on your computer that lets you talk with all of these web servers. Browsers not only request pages and media, but also render the content that's being returned. The first web browser and web server was written by now Sir Tim Berners-Lee over the course of two months in 1990. At the time, he was working at CERN in Switzerland. To pull this feat off, he simultaneously created several of the fundamental web standards we discuss today, URLs, HTML, and HTTP. Not bad for two months' work, although to be fair, he'd been researching hypertext systems for over a decade. After initially circulating the software amongst colleagues at CERN, it was released to the public in 1991. The World Wide Web was born. Importantly, the web was an open standard, making it possible for anyone to develop new web servers and browsers. This allowed a team at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign to create the Mosaic web browser in 1993. It was the first browser that allowed graphics to be embedded alongside text. Previous browsers displayed graphics in separate windows. It also introduced new features like bookmarks and had a friendly GUI interface, which made it popular. Even though it looks pretty crusty, it's recognizable as the web we know today. By the end of the 1990s, there were many web browsers in use, like Netscape, Navigator, Internet Explorer, Opera, OmniWeb, and Mozilla. Many web servers were also developed, like Apache and Microsoft's Internet Information Services. New websites popped up daily, and web mainstays like Amazon and eBay were founded in the mid-1990s. It was a golden era. The web was flourishing, and people increasingly needed ways to find things. If you knew the web address of where you wanted to go, like ebay.com, you could just type it into the browser. But what if you didn't know where to go? Like, you only knew that you wanted pictures of cute cats right now. Where do you go? At first, people maintained web pages which served as directories hyperlinking to other websites. Most famous among these was Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web, renamed Yahoo in 1994. As the web grew, these human-edited directories started to get unwieldy, and so search engines were developed. Let's go to the thought bubble. The earliest web search engine that operated like ones we use today was JumpStation, created by Jonathan Fletcher in 1993 at the University of Stirling. This consisted of three pieces of software that worked together. The first was a web crawler, software that followed all the links it could find on the web. Anytime it found a link on a page that had new links, it would add those to its list. The second component was an ever-enlarging index, recording what terms appeared on what pages the crawler had visited. The final piece was a search algorithm that consulted the index. For example, if I typed the word cat into JumpStation, every web page where the word cat appeared would come up in a list. Early search engines used very simple metrics to rank order their search results, most often just the number of times a search term appeared on a page. This worked okay until people started gaming the system, like by writing cat hundreds of times on their web pages just to steer traffic their way. Google's rise to fame was in large part due to a clever algorithm that sidestepped this issue. Instead of trusting the content on a web page, they looked at how other websites linked to that page. If it was a spam page with the word cat over and over again, no site would link to it. But if the web page was an authority on cats, then other sites would likely link to it. So the number of what are called backlinks, especially from reputable sites, was often a good sign of quality. This started as a research project called Backrub at Stanford University in 1996, before being being spun out two years later into the Google we know today. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Finally, I want to take a second to talk about a term you've probably heard a lot recently, net neutrality. Now that you've built an understanding of packets, internet routing, and the World Wide Web, you know enough to understand the essence, or at least the technical essence, of this big debate. In short, network neutrality is the principle that all packets on the internet should be treated equally. It doesn't matter if the packets are my email or you streaming this video, they should all chug along at the same speed and priority. But many companies would prefer that their data arrive to you preferentially. Take, for example, Comcast 
Comcast, a large ISP that also owns many TV channels, like NBC and the Weather Channel, which are streamed online. Not to pick on Comcast, but in the absence of net neutrality rules, they could, for example, say that they want their content to be delivered silky smooth and high priority. But other streaming videos are going to get throttled, that is, intentionally given less bandwidth and lower priority. Again, I just want to reiterate here, this is just conjecture. At a high level, net neutrality advocates argue that giving internet providers this ability to essentially set up tolls on the internet to provide premium packet delivery plants the seeds for an exploitative business model. ISPs could be gatekeepers to content, with strong incentives to not play nice with competitors. Also, if big companies like Netflix and Google can pay to get special treatment, small companies like startups will be at a disadvantage, stifling innovation. On the other hand, there are good technical reasons why you might want different types of data to flow at different speeds. That Skype call needs high priority, but it's not a big deal if an email comes in a few seconds late. Net neutrality opponents also argue that market forces and competition would discourage bad behaviour, because customers would leave ISPs that are throttling sites they like. This debate will rage on for a while yet, and as we always encourage on Crash Course, you should go out and learn more, because the implications of net neutrality are complex and wide-reaching. Over the last three episodes, we've talked about how computers have become interconnected, allowing us to communicate near instantly across the globe. But not everyone who uses these networks is going to play by the rules, or have our best interests at heart. Just as how we have physical security like locks, fences and police officers to minimise crime in the real world, we need cyber security to minimise crime and harm in the virtual world. Computers don't have ethics. Give them a formally specified problem and they'll happily pump out an answer at lightning speed. Running code that takes down a hospital's computer systems is no different to a computer than code that keeps a patient's heart beating. Like the Force, computers can be pulled to the light side or the dark side. Cyber security is like the Jedi Order, trying to bring peace and justice to the cyberverse. The scope of cyber security evolves as fast as the capabilities of computing, but we can think of it as a set of techniques to protect the secrecy, integrity and availability of computer systems and data against threats. Let's unpack those three goals. Secrecy or confidentiality means that only authorised people should be able to access or read specific computer systems and data. Data breaches where hackers reveal people's credit card information is an attack on secrecy. Integrity means that only authorised people should have the ability to use or modify systems and data. Hackers who learn your password and send emails masquerading as you is an integrity attack. And availability means that authorised people should always have access to their systems and data. Think of denial of service attacks, where hackers overload a website with fake requests to make it slow or unreachable for others. That's attacking the service's availability. To achieve these three goals, security experts start with a specification of who your enemy is, at an abstract level called a threat model. This profiles attackers, their capabilities, goals and probable means of attack, what's called awesomely enough an attack vector. Threat models let you prepare against specific threats, rather than being overwhelmed by all the ways hackers could get to your systems and data. And there are many, many ways. Let's say you want to secure physical access to your laptop. Your threat model is a nosy roommate. To preserve the secrecy, integrity and availability of your laptop, you could keep it hidden in your dirty laundry hamper. But if your threat model is a mischievous younger sibling who knows your hiding spots, then you'll need to do more, maybe lock it in a safe. In other words, how a system is secured depends heavily on who it's being secured against. Of course, threat models are typically a bit more formally defined than just nosy roommate. Often you'll see threat models specified in terms of technical capabilities. For example, someone who has physical access to your laptop along with unlimited time. With a given threat model, security architects need to come up with a solution that keeps the system secure, as long as certain assumptions are met, like no one reveals their password to the attacker. There are many methods for protecting computer systems, networks and data. A lot of security boils down to two questions. Who are you and what should you have access to? Clearly, access should be given to the right people, but refused to the wrong people. Like, bank employees should be able to open ATMs to restock them, but not me, because I take it all. All of it. That ceramic cat collection doesn't buy itself. So to differentiate between right and wrong people, we use authentication, the process by which a computer understands who it's interacting with. Generally, there are three types, each with their own pros and cons. What you know, what you have, and what you are. What you know authentication is based on knowledge of a secret that should be known only to the real user and the computer. For example, a username and password. This is the most widely used today because it's the easiest to implement. But it can be compromised if hackers guess or otherwise come to know your secret. Some passwords are easy for humans to figure out, like 123456 or QWERTY. But there are also ones that are easy for computers. Consider the pin 2580. 
This seems pretty difficult to guess, and it is for a human, but there are only 10,000 possible combinations of four-digit pins. A computer can try entering 0000, then try 0001, and then 0002, all the way up to 9999 in a fraction of a second. This is called a brute force attack because it just tries everything. There's nothing clever to the algorithm. Some computer systems lock you out or have you wait a little after, say, three wrong attempts. That's a common and reasonable strategy, and it does make it harder for less sophisticated attackers. But think about what happens if attackers have already taken over tens of thousands of computers forming a botnet. Using all these computers, the same pin, 2580, can be tried on many tens of thousands of bank accounts simultaneously. Even with just a single attempt per account, they'll very likely get into one or more that just happen to use that pin. In fact, we've probably guessed the pin of someone watching this video. Increasing the length of pins and passwords can help, but even eight-digit pins are pretty easy to crack. This is why so many websites now require you to use a mix of upper and lowercase letters and special symbols. It explodes the number of possible password combinations. An eight-digit numerical pin only has 100 million combinations. Computers eat that for breakfast. But an eight-character password with all those funky things mixed in has more than 600 trillion combinations. Of course, these passwords are hard for us mere humans to remember. So a better approach is for websites to let us pick something more memorable, like three words joined together. Green Brothers Rock or Pizza a tasty yum. English has around 100,000 words in use, so putting three together would give you roughly one quadrillion possible passwords. Good luck trying to guess that. I should also note here that using non-dictionary words is even better against more sophisticated kinds of attacks, but we don't have time to get into that here. Computerfile has a great video on choosing a password, link in the doobly-doo. What you have authentication, on the other hand, is based on possession of a secret token that only the real user has. An example is a physical key and lock. You can only unlock the door if you have the key. This escapes this problem of being guessable, and they typically require physical presence, so it's much harder for remote attackers to gain access. Someone in another country can't gain access to your front door in Florida without getting to Florida first. But what you have authentication can be compromised if an attacker is physically close. Keys can be copied, smartphones stolen, and locks picked. Finally, what you are authentication is based on you. You authenticate by presenting yourself to the computer. Biometric authenticators like fingerprint readers and iris scanners are classic examples. These can be very secure, but the best technologies are still quite expensive. Furthermore, data from sensors varies over time. What you know and what you have authentication have the nice property of being deterministic, either correct or incorrect. If you know the secret or have the key, you're granted access 100% of the time. If you don't, you get access 0% of the time. Biometric authentication, however, however, is probabilistic. There's some chance the system won't recognize you. Maybe you're wearing a hat or the lighting is bad. Worse, there's some chance the system will recognize the wrong person as you, like your evil twin. Of course, in production systems, these chances are low, but not zero. Another issue with biometric authentication is it can't be reset. You only have so many fingers, so what happens if an attacker compromises your fingerprint data? This could be a big problem for life. And recently, researchers showed it's possible to forge your iris just by capturing a photo of you. So that's not promising either. Basically, all forms of authentication have strengths and weaknesses, and all can be compromised in one way or another. So security experts suggest using two or more forms of authentication for important accounts. This is known as two-factor or multi-factor authentication. An attacker may be able to guess your password or steal your phone, but it's much harder to do both. After authentication comes access control. Once the system knows who you are, it needs to know what you should be able to access. And for that, there's a specification of who should be able to see, modify, and use what. This is done through permissions or access control lists, which describe Describe what access each user has for every file, folder, and program on a computer. Read permission allows a user to see the contents of a file. Write permission allows a user to modify the contents, and execute permission allows a user to run a file like a program. For organizations with users at different levels of access privilege, like a spy agency, it's especially important for access control lists to be configured correctly to ensure secrecy, integrity, and availability. Let's say we have three levels of access, public, secret, and top secret. The first general rule of thumb is that people shouldn't be able to read up. If a user is only clear to read secret files, they shouldn't be able to read top secret files, but should be able to 
access secret and public ones. The second general rule of thumb is that people shouldn't be able to write down. If a member has top secret clearance, then they should be able to write or modify top secret files, but not secret or public files. It may seem weird that even with the highest clearance, you can't modify less secret files, but it guarantees that there's no accidental leakage of top secret information into secret or public files. This no read up, no write down approach is called the Bell La Padula model. It was formulated for the US Department of Defense's multi-level security policy. There are many other models for access control, like the Chinese wall model and Bieber model. Which model is best depends on your use case. Authentication and access control help a computer determine who you are and what you should access, but depend on being able to trust the hardware and software that run the authentication and access control programs. That's a big dependence. If an attacker installs malicious software called malware, compromising the host computer's operating system, how can we be sure security programs don't have a backdoor that let attackers in? The short answer is, we can't. We still have no way to guarantee the security of a program or computing system. That's because even while security software might be secure in theory, implementation bugs can still result in vulnerabilities. But we do have techniques to reduce the likelihood of bugs, like quickly finding and patching bugs when they do occur, and mitigating damage when a program is compromised. Most security errors come from implementation error. To reduce implementation error, reduce implementation. One of the holy grails of system level security is a security kernel or a trusted computing base, a minimal set of operating system software that's close to provably secure. A challenge in constructing these security kernels is deciding what should go into it. Remember, the less code, the better. Even after minimizing code blow, it would be great to guarantee that code as written is secure. Formally verifying the security of code is an active area of research. The best we have right now is a process called independent verification and validation. This works by having code audited by a crowd of security-minded developers. This is why security code is almost always open sourced. It's often difficult for people who wrote the original code to find bugs, but external developers with fresh eyes and different expertise can spot problems. There are also conferences where like-minded hackers and security experts can mingle and share ideas, the biggest of which is DEF CON, held annually in Las Vegas. Finally, even after reducing code and auditing it, Clever attackers are bound to find tricks that let them in. With this in mind, good developers should take the approach that not if, but when their programs are compromised, the damage should be limited and contained, and not let it compromise other things running on the computer. This principle is called isolation. To achieve isolation, we can sandbox applications. This is like placing an angry kid in a sandbox. When the kid goes ballistic, they only destroy the sandcastle in their own box, but other kids in the playground continue having fun. Operating systems attempt to sandbox applications by giving each their own block of memory that other programs can't touch. It's also possible for a single computer to run multiple virtual machines, essentially simulated computers that live in their own sandbox. If a program goes awry, worst case is it crashes or compromises only the virtual machine on which it's running. All other virtual machines running on the computer are isolated and unaffected. Okay, that's a broad overview of some key computer security topics, and I didn't even get to network security like firewalls. Next episode, episode, we'll discuss some methods hackers use to get into computer systems. And after that, we'll touch on encryption. Until then, make your password stronger, turn on two-factor authentication, and never clink links in unsolicited emails. Last episode, we talked about the basics of computer security, principles and techniques used to keep computer systems safe and sound. But despite our best efforts, the news is full of stories of individuals, companies and governments getting cyber attacked by hackers, people who, with their technical knowledge, break into computer systems. Not all hackers are bad, though. There are hackers who hunt for bugs and try to close security holes in software to make systems safer and more resilient. They're often hired by companies and governments to perform security evaluations. These hackers are called white hats. They're the good guys. On the flip side, there are black hats, malicious hackers with intentions to steal, exploit, and sell computer vulnerabilities and data. Hackers' motivations also differ wildly. Some hack for amusement and curiosity, while cyber criminals hack most often for monetary gain. And then there are hacktivists, who use their skills to promote a social or political goal. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Basically, the stereotypical view of a hacker as some unpopular kid sitting in a dark room full of discarded pizza boxes probably better describes John Green in college than it does hackers. Today, we're not going to teach you how to be a hacker. Instead, we'll discuss some classic examples of how hackers break into computer systems to give you an idea of how it's done. The most common way hackers get into computer systems isn't by hacking at all. It's by tricking users into letting them in. This is called social engineering, where a person is manipulated into divulging confidential information, or configuring a computer system so that it permits entry by attackers. The most common type of attack is phishing, which you'll most often encounter as an email asking you to log into an account on a website. 
say your bank. You'll be asked to click a link in the email, which takes you to a site that looks legit to the casual observer, but it's really an evil clone. When you enter your username and password, that information goes straight to the hackers, who then can log into the real website as you. Bad news. Even with a one-tenth of one percent success rate, a million phishing emails might yield a thousand compromised accounts. Another social engineering attack is pretexting, where attackers call up, let's say, a company, and then confidently pretend to be from their IT department. Often, attackers will call a first number and then ask to be transferred to a second, so that the phone number appears to be internal to the company. Then, the attacker can instruct an unwitting user to configure their computer in a compromising way, or get them to reveal confidential details like passwords or network configurations. So, sorry, one sec. Oh, hey, it's Susan from IT. We're having some network issues down here. Can you go ahead and check a setting for me? And it begins. Attackers can be very convincing, especially with a little bit of research beforehand to find things like key employees' names. It might take 10 phone calls to find a victim, but you only need one to get in. Emails are also a common delivery mechanism for Trojan horses, programs that masquerade as harmless attachments, like a photo or invoice, but actually contain malicious software called malware. Malware can take many forms. Some might steal your data, like your banking credentials. Others might encrypt your files and demand a ransom, what's known as ransom. Somewhere. If they can't run malware or get a user to let them in, attackers have to force their way in through other means. One method, which we briefly discussed last episode, is to brute force a password. Try every combination of password until you gain entry. Most modern systems defend against this type of attack by having you wait incrementally longer periods of time following each failed attempt, or even lock you out entirely after a certain number of tries. One recent hack to get around this is called NAND mirroring, where if you have physical access to the computer, you can attach wires to the device's memory chip and make a perfect copy of its contents. With this setup, you can try a series of passwords until the device starts making you wait. When this happens, you just reflash the memory with the original copy you made, essentially resetting it, allowing you to try more passwords immediately with no waiting. This technique was shown to be successful on an iPhone 5C, but many newer devices include mechanisms to thwart this type of attack. If you don't have physical access to a device, you have to find a way to hack it remotely, like over the internet. In general, this requires an attacker to find and take advantage of a bug in a system, and successfully utilizing a bug to gain capabilities or access is called an exploit. One common type of exploit is a buffer overflow. Buffers are a general term for a block of memory reserved for storing data. We talked about video buffers for storing pixel data in episode 23. As a simple example, we can imagine an operating system's login prompt, which has fields for a username and password. Behind the scenes, this operating system uses buffers for storing the text values that are entered. For illustration, let's say these buffers were specified to be of size 10. In memory, the two text buffers would look something like this. Of course, the operating system is keeping track of a lot more than just a username and password, so there's going to be data stored both before and after in memory. When a user enters a username and password, the values are copied into the buffers, where they can be verified. A buffer overflow attack does exactly what the name suggests, overflows the buffer. In this case, any password longer than 10 characters will overwrite adjacent data in memory. Sometimes this will just cause a program or operating system to crash, because important values are overwritten with gobbledygook. Crashing a system is bad, and maybe that's all that a mischievous hacker wants to do, be a nuisance. But attackers can also exploit this bug more cleverly by injecting purposeful new values into a program's memory, for example setting an isAdmin variable to true. With the ability to arbitrarily manipulate a program's memory, hackers can bypass things like login prompts, and sometimes even use that program to hijack the whole system. There are many methods to combat buffer overflow attacks. The easiest is to always test the length of input before copying it into a buffer, called bounds checking. Many modern programming languages implement bounds checking automatically. Programs can also randomize the memory location of variables, like our hypothetical isAdmin flag, so that hackers don't know what memory location to overwrite, and are more likely to crash the program than gain access. Programs can also leave unused space after buffers, and keep an eye on all those values to see if they change. If they do, they know an attacker is monkeying around with memory. These regions are called canaries, named after the small birds miners used to take underground to warn them of dangerous conditions. Another classic hack is code injection. It's most commonly used to attack websites that use databases, which pretty much all big websites do. We won't be covering databases in this series, so here's a simple example to illustrate this type of attack. We'll use structured query language. SQL, also called SQL, a popular database API. Let's imagine our login prompt is now running on a web page. When a user clicks login, 
when the text values are sent to a server, which executes code that checks if that username exists, and if it does, verifies the password matches. To do this, the server will execute code known as a SQL query that looks something like this. First, it needs to specify what data we're retrieving from the database. In this case, we want to fetch the password. The server also needs to specify from what place in the database to retrieve the value from. In this case, let's imagine all the user's data is stored in a data structure called a table labeled users. Finally, the server doesn't want to get back a giant list of passwords for every user in the database. So it specifies that it only wants data for the account whose username equals a certain value. That value is copied into the SQL query by the server based on what the user typed in. So the actual command that's sent to the SQL database would look something like this, where username equals fillbin. Note also that SQL commands end with a semicolon. So how does someone hack this? By sending in a malicious username with embedded SQL commands. Like we could send the server this funky username. When the server copies this text into the SQL query, it ends up looking like this. As I mentioned before, semicolons are used to separate commands. So the first command that gets executed is this. If there is a user named whatever, the database will return the password. Of course, we have no idea what whatever's password is. So we'll get it wrong and the server will reject us. If there's no user named whatever, the database will return no password or or provide an error, and the server will again reject us. Either way, we don't care, because it's the next SQL command we're interested in, drop table users, a command that we injected by manipulating the username field. This command instructs the SQL database to delete the table containing all user data, wiped clean, which would cause a lot of headaches at a place like a bank, or really anywhere. And notice that we didn't even break into the system. It's not like we correctly guessed a username and password. Even with no formal access, we were able to create mayhem by exploiting a bug. This is a very simple example of code injection, which almost all servers today have defenses against. With more sophisticated attacks, it's possible to add records to the database, like a new administrator account, or even get the database to reveal data, allowing hackers to steal things like credit card numbers, social security numbers, and all sorts of nefarious goodies. But we're not going to teach you how to do that. As with buffer overflows, programmers should always assume input coming from the outside to be potentially dangerous and examine it carefully. Most username and password forms on the web don't let you include special symbols like semicolons or quotes as a first level of defense. Good servers also sanitize input by removing or modifying special characters before running database queries. Working exploits are often sold or shared online. The more prevalent the bug or the more damaging the exploit, the higher the price or prestige it commands. Even governments sometimes buy exploits, which allow them to compromise computers for purposes like spying. When a new exploitable bug is discovered that the software creators weren't aware of, it's called a zero-day vulnerability. Black hat hackers rush to use the exploit for maximum benefit before white hat programmers release a patch for the bug. This is why it's so important to keep your computer software up to date. A lot of those downloads are security patches. If bugs are left open on enough systems, it allows hackers to write a program that jump from computer to computer automatically which are called worms. If a hacker can take over a large number of computers, they can be used together to form what's called a botnet. This can have many purposes, like sending huge volumes of spam, mining bitcoins, using other people's computing power and electricity, and launching distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks against servers. DDoS is where all the computers in the botnet send a flood of dummy messages. This can knock services offline, either to force owners to pay a ransom or just to be evil. Despite all of the hardworking white hats, exploits documented online and software engineering best practices, cyber attacks happen on a daily basis. They cost the global economy roughly half a trillion dollars annually, and that figure will only increase as we become more reliant on computing systems. This is especially worrying to governments, as infrastructure is increasingly computer-driven, like power plants, the electrical grid, traffic lights, water treatment plants, oil refineries, air traffic control, and lots of other key systems. Many experts predict that the next major war will be fought in cyberspace, where nations are brought to their knees not by physical attack, but rather crippled economically and infrastructurally through cyber warfare. There may not be any bullets fired, but the potential for lives lost is still very high, maybe even higher than conventional warfare. So we should all adopt good cybersecurity practices. And as a community interconnected over the internet, we should ensure our computers are secured against those who wish to use their great potential for harm. So maybe stop ignoring that update notification. I'll see you next week. Over the past two episodes, we've talked a lot about computer security. But the fact is, there's no such thing as a perfectly 100% secure computer system. There will always be bugs, and security experts know that. So system architects employ a strategy called defense in depth, 
which uses many layers of varying security mechanisms to frustrate attackers. It's a bit like how castles are designed. First you've got to dodge the archers, then cross the moat, scale the walls, avoid the hot oil, get over the ramparts and defeat the guards before you get to the throne room. But in this case, we're talking about one of the most common forms of computer security, cryptography. The word cryptography comes from the roots crypto and graphy, roughly translating to secret writing. In order to make information secret, you use a cipher, an algorithm that converts plain text into ciphertext, which is gibberish unless you have a key that lets you undo the cipher. The process of making text secret is called encryption, and the reverse process is called decryption. Ciphers have been used long before computers showed up. Julius Caesar used what's now called a Caesar cipher to encrypt private correspondence. He would shift the letters in a message forward by three places, so A became D and the word Brutus became this. To decipher the message, recipients had to know both the algorithm and the number to shift by, which acted as the key. The Caesar cipher is one example of a larger class of techniques called substitution ciphers. These replace every letter in a message with something else according to a translation. A big drawback of basic substitution ciphers is that letter frequencies are preserved. For example, E is the most common letter in English. So if your cipher translates E to an X, then X will show up the most frequently in the ciphertext. A skilled cryptanalyst can work backwards from these kinds of statistics to figure out the message. It was the breaking of a substitution cipher that led to the execution of Mary Queen of Scots in 1587 for plotting to kill Queen Elizabeth. Another fundamental class of techniques are permutations ciphers. Let's look at a simple example called a columnar transposition cipher. Here we take a message and fill the letters into a grid. In this case we've chosen 5x5. Five five. To encrypt our message we read out the characters in a different order. Let's say from the bottom left working upwards one column at a time. The new letter ordering, what's called a permutation, is the encrypted message. The ordering direction as well as the 5x5 grid size serves as the key. Like before, if the cipher and key are known, a recipient can reverse the process to reveal the original message. By the 1900s, cryptography was mechanized in the form of encryption machines. The most famous was the German Enigma, used by the Nazis to encrypt their wartime communications. As we discussed back in episode 15, the Enigma was a typewriter-like machine with a keyboard and lamp board, both showing the full alphabet. Above that, there was a series of configurable rotors that were the key to the Enigma's encryption capability. First, let's look at just one rotor. One side had electrical contacts for all 26 letters. These connected to the other side of the rotor using cross-crossing wires that swapped one letter for another. If H went in, K might come out the other side. If K went in, F might come out, and so on. The letter swapping behavior should sound familiar. It's a substitution cipher, but the Enigma was more sophisticated because it used three or more rotors in a row, each feeding into the next. Rotors could also be rotated to one of 26 possible starting positions, and they could be inserted in different orders, providing a lot of different substitution mappings. Following the rotors was a special circuit called a reflector. Instead of passing the signal onto another rotor, it connected every pin to another and sent the electrical signal back through the rotors. Finally, there was a plug board at the front of the machine that allowed letters coming from the keyboard to be optionally swapped, adding another level of complexity. With our simplified circuit, let's encrypt a letter on this example Enigma configuration. If we press the H key, electricity flows through the plug board, then the rotors, hits the reflector, comes back through the rotors and plug board, and illuminates the letter L on the lamp board. So H is encrypted to L. Note that the circuit can flow both ways. So if we type the letter L, H would light up. In other words, it's the same process for encrypting and decrypting. You just have to make sure the sending and receiving machines have the same initial configuration. If you look carefully at this circuit, you'll notice it's impossible for a letter to be encrypted as itself, which turned out to be a fatal cryptographic weakness. Finally, to prevent the Enigma from being a simple substitution cipher, every single time a letter was entered, the rotors advanced by one spot, sort of like an odometer in a car. So if you entered the text AAA, it might come out as BDK, where the substitution mapping change with every key press. The Enigma was a tough cookie to crack for sure, but as we discussed in episode 15, Alan Turing and his colleagues at Bletchley Park were able to break Enigma codes and largely automate the process. But with the advent of computers, cryptography moved from hardware into software. One of the earliest software ciphers to become widespread was the Data Encryption Standard developed by IBM and the NSA in 1977. DES, as it was known, originally used binary keys that were 56 bits long, which means that there are two to the 56 or about 72 quadrillion different keys. Back in 1977, that meant that nobody, except perhaps the NSA, had enough computing power to brute force all possible keys. But by 1999, a quarter million dollar computer could try every possible DES key in just two days, rendering the cipher insecure. So in 2001, the advanced encryption standard AES was finalized and published. 
AES is designed to use much bigger keys, 128, 192 or 256 bits in size, making brute force attacks much, much harder. For a 128-bit key, you'd need trillions of years to try every combination, even if you used every single computer on the planet today, so you'd better get started. AES chops data up into 16-byte blocks and then applies a series of substitutions and permutations based on the key value, plus some other operations to obscure the message. And this process is repeated 10 or more times for each block. You might be wondering why only 10 rounds? Or why only 128-bit keys and not 10,000-bit keys? Well, it's a performance trade-off. If it took hours to encrypt and send an email, or minutes to connect to a secure website, people wouldn't use it. AES balances performance and security to provide practical cryptography. Today, AES is used everywhere, from encrypting files on iPhones and transmitting data over Wi-Fi with WPA2, to accessing websites using HTTPS. So far, the cryptographic techniques we've discussed rely on keys that are known by both sender and recipient. The sender encrypts a message using a key, and the recipient decrypts it using the same key. In the old days, keys would be shared by voice or physically. For example, the Germans distributed codebooks with daily settings for their Enigma machines. But this strategy could never work in the internet era. Imagine having to crack open a codebook to connect to YouTube. What's needed is a way for a server to send a secret key over the public internet to a user wishing to connect securely. It seems like that wouldn't be secure, because if the key is sent in the open and intercepted by a hacker, couldn't they use that to decrypt all communication between the two? The solution is key exchange, an algorithm that lets two computers agree on a key without ever sending one. We can do this with one-way functions, mathematical operations that are very easy to do in one direction, but hard to reverse. To show you how one-way functions work, let's use paint colors as an analogy. It's easy to mix paint colors together, but it's not so easy to figure out the constituent colors that we use to make a mixed paint color. You'd have to test a lot of possibilities to figure it out. In this metaphor, our secret key is a unique shade of paint. First, there's a public paint color that everyone can see. Then John and I each pick a secret paint color. To exchange keys, I mix my secret paint color with the public paint color. Then I send that mixed color to John by any means, male, carrier pigeon, whatever. John does the same, mixing his secret paint color with the public color, then sending that to me. When I receive John's color, I simply add my private color to create a blend of all three paints. John does the same with my mixed color and voila, we both end up with the same paint color. We can use this as a shared secret, even though we never sent each other our individual secret colors. A snooping outside observer would know partial information, but they'd find it very difficult to figure out our shared secret color. Of course, sending and mixing paint colors isn't going to work well for transmitting computer data. But luckily, mathematical one-way functions are perfect, and this is what Diffie-Hellman key exchange uses. In Diffie-Hellman, the one-way function is modular exponentiation. This means taking one number, the base, to the power of another number, the exponent, and taking the remainder when divided by a third number, the modulus. So for example, if we wanted to calculate 3 to the 5th power, modulo 31, we would calculate 3 to the 5th, which is 243, and then take the remainder when divided by 31, which is 26. The hard part is figuring out the exponent given only the result and the base. If I tell you I raised 3 to some secret number, modulo 31, and got 7 as the remainder, you'd have to test a lot of exponents to know which one I picked. If we make these numbers big, say hundreds of digits long, then finding the secret exponent is nearly impossible. Now let's talk about how Diffie-Hellman uses modular exponentiation to calculate a shared key. First, there's a set of public values, the base and the modulus that, like our public paint color, everyone gets to know, even the bad guys. To send a message securely to John, I would pick a secret exponent, x. Then I'd calculate b to the power of x, modulo m. I send this big number over to John. John does the same, picking a secret exponent y and sending me b to the y modulo m. To create a shared secret key, I take what John sent me and take it to the power of x, my secret exponent. This is mathematically equivalent to b to the xy modulus m. John does the same, taking what I sent to him to the power of y, and we both end up with the exact same number. It's a secret shared key, even though we never sent each other our secret number. We can use this big number as a shared key for encrypted communication, using something like AES for encryption. Diffie-Hellman key exchange is one method for establishing a shared key. These keys that can be used by both sender and receiver to encrypt and decrypt messages are called symmetric keys because the key is the same on both sides. 
The Caesar cipher, Enigma and AES are all symmetric encryption. There's also asymmetric encryption, where there are two different keys, most often one that's public and another that's private. So people can encrypt a message using a public key that only the recipient with their private key can decrypt. In other words, knowing the public key only lets you encrypt, but not decrypt. It's asymmetric. So think about boxes with padlocks that you can open with a key. To receive a secure message, I can give a sender a box and a padlock. They put their message in it and lock it shut. Now they can send that box back to me and only I can open it with my private key. After locking the box, neither the sender nor anyone else who finds the box can open it without brute force. In the same way, a digital public key can encrypt something that can only be decrypted with a private key. The reverse is possible too, encrypting something with a private key that can be decrypted with a public key. This is used for signing, where a server encrypts data using their private key. Anyone can decrypt it using the server's public key. This acts like an unforgeable signature, as only the owner using their private key can encrypt it. It proves that you're getting data from the right server or person and not an imposter. The most popular asymmetric encryption technique used today is RSA, named after its inventors Rivist, Shamir and Edelman. So now you know all the key parts of modern cryptography. Symmetric encryption, key exchange and public key cryptography. When you connect to a secure website like your bank, that little padlock icon means that your computer has used public key cryptography to verify the server, key exchange to establish a secret temporary key and symmetric encryption to protect all the back and forth communication from prying eyes. Whether you're buying something online, sending emails to BFFs or just browsing cat videos, cryptography keeps all that safe, private and secure. Thanks cryptography. Hi, I'm Carrie Ann and welcome to Crash Course Computer Science. As we've touched on many times in this series, computers are incredible at storing, organizing, fetching and processing huge volumes of data. That's perfect for things like e-commerce websites with millions of items for sale and for storing billions of health records for quick access by doctors. But what if we want to use computers not just to fetch and display data, but to actually make decisions about data? This is the essence of machine learning, algorithms that give computers the ability to learn from data and then make predictions and decisions. Computer programs with this ability are extremely useful in answering questions like, is this email spam? Does a person's heart have arrhythmia? Or what video should YouTube recommend after this one? While useful, we probably wouldn't describe these programs as intelligent in the same way we think of human intelligence. So even though the terms are often interchanged, most computer scientists would say that machine learning is a set of techniques that sits inside the even more ambitious goal of artificial intelligence, or AI for short. Machine learning and AI algorithms tend to be pretty sophisticated. So rather than wading into the mechanisms of how they work, we're going to focus on what the algorithms do conceptually. Let's start with a simple example, deciding if a moth is a lunar moth or an emperor moth. This decision process is called classification, and an algorithm that does it is called a classifier. Although there are techniques that can use raw data for training, like photos and sounds, many algorithms reduce the complexity of real-world objects and phenomena into what are called features. Features are values that usefully characterize the things we wish to classify. For our moth example, we're going to use two features, wingspan and mass. In order to train our machine learning classifier to make good predictions, we're going to need training data. To get that, we'd send an entomologist out into a forest to collect data for both lunar and emperor moths. These experts can recognize different moths, so they not only record the feature values, but also label that data with the actual moth species. This is called labeled data. Because we only have two features, it's easy to visualize this data in a scatter plot. Here, I've plotted data for 100 emperor moths in red and 100 lunar moths in blue. We can see that the species make two groupings, but there's some overlap in the middle, so it's not entirely obvious how to best separate the two. That's what machine learning algorithms do, find optimal separations. I'm just going to eyeball it and say anything less than 45 millimeters in wingspan is likely to be an emperor moth. We can add another division that says additionally, mass must be less than 0.75 in order for our guess to be emperor moth. These lines that chop up the decision space are called decision boundaries. If we look closely at our data, we can see that 86 emperor moths would correctly end up inside the emperor decision region, but 14 would end up incorrectly in lunar moth territory. On the other hand, 82 lunar moths would be correct, with 18 
falling onto the wrong side. A table like this showing where a classifier gets things right or wrong is called a confusion matrix, which probably should have also been the title of the last two movies in the Matrix trilogy. Notice that there's no way for us to draw lines that give us 100% accuracy. If we lower our wingspan decision boundary, we misclassify more emperor moths as lunars. If we raise it, we misclassify more lunar moths. The job of machine learning algorithms at a high level is to maximize correct classifications while minimizing errors. On our training data, we get 168 moths correct and 32 moths wrong for an average classification accuracy of 84%. Now using these decision boundaries, if we go out into the forest and encounter an unknown moth, we can measure its features and plot it onto our decision space. This is unlabeled data. Our decision boundaries offer a guess as to what species the moth is. In this case, we would predict it's a lunar moth. This simple approach of dividing the decision space up into boxes can be represented by what's called a decision tree, which would look like this pictorially or could be written in code using if statements like this. A machine learning algorithm that produces decision trees needs to choose what features to divide on, and then for each of those features, what values to use for the division. Decision trees are just one basic example of a machine learning technique. There are hundreds of algorithms in computer science literature today and more are being published all the time. A few algorithms even use many decision trees working together to make a prediction. Computer scientists smugly call those forests because they contain a lot of trees. There are also non-tree based approaches like support vector machines which essentially slice up the decision space using arbitrary lines. And these don't have to be straight lines, they can be polynomials or some other fancy mathematical function. Like before, it's the machine learning algorithm's job to figure out the best lines to provide the most accurate decision boundaries. So far, my examples have only had two features, which is easy enough for a human to figure out. If we add a third feature, let's say length of antennae, then our 2D lines become 3D planes, creating decision boundaries in three dimensions. These planes don't have to be straight either. Plus, a truly useful classifier would contend with many different moth species. Now, I think you'd agree it's getting too complicated to figure out by hand, but even this is a very basic example, just three features and five moth species. We can still show it in this 3D scatter plot. Unfortunately, there's no good way to visualize four features at once, or 20 features, let alone hundreds or even thousands of features. But that's what many real world machine learning problems face. Can you imagine trying to figure out the equation for a hyperplane rippling through a thousand dimensional decision space? Space. Probably not, but computers with clever machine learning algorithms can, and they do all day long on computers at places like Google, Facebook, Microsoft and Amazon. Techniques like decision trees and support vector machines are strongly rooted in the field of statistics, which has dealt with making confident decisions using data long before computers ever existed. There's a very large class of widely used statistical machine learning techniques, but there are also some approaches with no origins in statistics. Most notable are artificial neural networks, which were inspired by neural in our brains. For a primer of biological neurons, check out our three-part overview here. But basically, neurons are cells that process and transmit messages using electrical and chemical signals. They take one or more inputs from other cells, process those signals, and then emit their own signal. These form into huge interconnected networks that are able to process complex information, just like your brain watching this YouTube video. Artificial neurons are very similar. Each takes a series of inputs, combines them, and emits a signal. Rather than being electrical or chemical signals, artificial neurons take numbers in and spit numbers out. They are organized into layers that are connected by links, forming a network of neurons, hence the name. Let's return to our moth example to see how neural nets can be used for classification. Our first layer, the input layer, provides data from a single moth needing classification. Again, we'll use mass and wingspan. At the other end, we have an output layer with two neurons, one for emperor moth and another for lunar moth. The most excited neuron will be our classification decision. In between, we have a hidden layer that transforms our inputs into outputs and does the hard work of classification. To see how this is done, let's zoom into one neuron in the hidden layer. The first thing a neuron does is multiply each of its inputs by a specific weight. Let's say 2.8 for the first input and 0.1 for its second input. Then it sums these weighted inputs together, which in this case is a grand total of 9.74. The neuron then applies a bias to this result. In other words, it adds or subtracts a fixed value, for example minus 6 for a new value of 3.74. These bias and inputs weights are initially set to random values when a neural network is created. Then an algorithm goes in and starts tweaking all those values to train the neural network, using labeled data for training and testing. This happens over many interactions, gradually improving accuracy, a process very much like human learning. Finally, neurons have an activation function, also called a transfer function, that gets applied to the output, performing a final mathematical modification 
application to the result. For example, limiting the value to a range from negative 1 and positive 1, or setting any negative values to 0. We'll use a linear transfer function that passes the value through unchanged. So 3.74 stays as 3.74. So for our example neuron, given the inputs 0.55 and 82, the output would be 3.74. This is just one neuron, but this process of weighting, summing, biasing, and applying an activation function is computed for all neurons in a layer, and the values propagate forward in the network one layer at a time. In this example, the output neuron with the highest value is our decision, Luna Moth. Importantly, the hidden layer doesn't have to be just one layer, it can be many layers deep. This is where the term deep learning comes from. Training these more complicated networks takes a lot more computation and data. Despite the fact that neural networks were invented over 50 years ago, deep neural nets have only been practical very recently, thanks to powerful processors, but even more so wicked fast GPUs. So thank you gamers for being so demanding about silky smooth frame rates. A couple of years ago, Google and Facebook demonstrated deep neural nets that could find faces in photos as well as humans. And humans are really good at this. It was a huge milestone. Now deep neural nets are driving cars, translating human speech, diagnosing medical conditions, and much more. These algorithms are very sophisticated, but it's less clear if they should be described as intelligent. They can really only do one thing, like classify moths, find faces, or translate languages. This type of AI is called weak AI or narrow AI. It's only intelligent at specific tasks. But that doesn't mean it's not useful. I mean, medical devices that can make diagnoses and cars that can drive themselves are amazing. But do we need those computers to compose music and look up delicious recipes in their free time? Probably not, although that would be kind of cool. Truly general purpose AI, one as smart and well-rounded as a human, is called strong AI. No one has demonstrated anything close to human-level artificial intelligence yet. Some argue it's impossible, but many people point to the explosion of digitized knowledge, like Wikipedia articles, web pages, and YouTube videos, as the perfect kindling for strong AI. Although you can only watch a maximum of 24 hours of YouTube a day, a computer can watch millions of hours. For example, IBM's Watson consults and synthesizes information from 200 million pages of content, including the full text of Wikipedia. While not a strong AI, Watson is pretty smart and it crushed its human competition in jeopardy way back in 2011. Not only can AIs gobble up huge volumes of information, but they can also learn over time, often much faster than humans. In 2016, Google debuted AlphaGo, a narrow AI that plays the fiendishly complicated board game Go. One of the ways it got so good and able to beat the very best human players was by playing clones of itself millions and millions of times. It learned what worked and what didn't, and along the way discovered successful strategies all by itself. This is called reinforcement learning, and it's a super powerful approach. In fact, it's very similar to how humans learn. People don't just magically acquire the ability to walk. It takes thousands of hours of trial and error to figure it out. Computers are now on the cusp of learning by trial and error, and for many narrow problems, reinforcement learning is already widely used. What will be interesting to see is if these types of learning techniques can be applied more broadly to create human-like, strong AIs that learn much like how kids learn, but at super accelerated rates. If that happens, there are some pretty big changes in store for humanity, a topic we'll revisit later. Today, let's start by thinking about how important vision can be. Most people rely on it to prepare food, walk around obstacles, read street signs, watch videos like this, and do hundreds of other tasks. Vision is the highest bandwidth sense, and it provides a fire hose of information about the state of the world and how to act on it. For this reason, computer scientists have been trying to give computers vision for half a century, birthing the subfield of computer vision. Its goal is to give computers the ability to extract high-level understanding from digital images and videos. And as everyone with a digital camera or smartphone knows, computers are already really good at capturing capturing photos with incredible fidelity and detail, much better than humans in fact. But as computer vision professor Fei Fei Li recently said, just like to hear is not the same as to listen, to take pictures is not the same as to see. As a refresher, images on computers are most often stored as big grids of pixels. Each pixel is defined by a color stored as a combination of three additive primary colors, red, green, and blue. By combining different intensities of these three colors, we can represent any color, which are called RGB values. Perhaps the simplest computer vision algorithm and a good place to start is to track a colored object, like a bright pink ball. The first thing we need to do is record the ball's color. For that, we'll take the RGB value of the centermost pixel. With that value saved, we can give a computer program an image and ask it to find the pixel with the closest color match. An algorithm like this might start in the upper right corner and check each pixel one at a time, calculating the difference 
difference from our target colour. Now having looked at every pixel, the best match is very likely a pixel from our ball. And we're not limited to running this algorithm on a single photo. We can do it for every frame in a video, allowing us to track the ball over time. Of course, due to variations in lighting, shadows and other effects, the ball on the field is almost certainly not going to be the exact same RGB value as our target colour, but merely the closest match. In more extreme cases, like at a game at night, the tracking might be poor. And if one of the team's jerseys use the same colour as the ball, our algorithm might get totally confused. For these reasons, colour marker tracking and similar algorithms are rarely used, unless the environment can be tightly controlled. This colour tracking example was able to search pixel by pixel, because colours are stored inside of single pixels. But this approach doesn't work for features larger than a single pixel, like edges of objects, which are inherently made up of many pixels. To identify these types of features in images, computer vision algorithms have to consider small regions of pixels called patches. As an example, let's talk about an algorithm that finds vertical edges in a scene, let's say to help a drone navigate safely through a field of obstacles. To keep things simple, we're going to convert our image into grayscale, although most algorithms can handle colour. Now let's zoom into one of these poles to see what an edge looks like up close. We can easily see where the left edge of the pole starts, because there's a change in colour that persists across many pixels vertically. We can define this behaviour more formally by creating a rule that says the likelihood of a pixel being a vertical edge is the magnitude of the difference in colour between some pixels to its left and some pixels to its right. The bigger the colour difference between these two sets of pixels, the more likely the pixel is on an edge. If the colour difference is small, it's probably not an edge at all. The mathematical notation for this operation looks like this. It's called a kernel or filter. It contains the values for a pixel-wise multiplication, the sum of which is saved into the centre pixel. Let's see how this works for our example pixel. I've gone ahead and labelled all of the pixels with their grayscale values. Now we take our kernel and centre it over our pixel of interest. This specifies what each pixel value underneath should be multiplied by. Then we just add up all those numbers. In this example, that gives us 147. That becomes our new pixel value. This operation of applying a kernel to a patch of pixels is called a convolution. Now let's apply our kernel to another pixel. In this case, the result is one, just one. In other words, it's a very small colour difference and not an edge. If we apply our kernel to every pixel in the photo, the result looks like this, where the highest pixel values are where there are strong vertical edges. Note that horizontal edges like those platforms in the background are almost invisible. If we wanted to highlight those features, we'd have to use a different kernel, one that's sensitive to horizontal edges. Both of these edge enhancing kernels are called Pruitt operators, named after their inventor. These are just two examples of a huge variety of kernels able to perform many different image transformations. For example, here's a kernel that sharpens images, and here's a kernel that blurs them. Kernels can also be used like little image cookie cutters that match only certain shapes. So our edge kernels looked for image patches with strong differences from right to left or up and down. But we could also make kernels that are good at finding lines with edges on both sides, and even islands of pixels surrounded by contrasting colours. These types of kernels can begin to characterise simple shapes. For example, on faces, the bridge of the nose tends to be brighter than the sides of the nose, resulting in higher values for line-sensitive kernels. Eyes are also distinctive, a dark circle surrounded by lighter pixels, a pattern other kernels are sensitive to. When a computer scans through an image, most often by sliding around a search window, it can look for combinations of features indicative of a human face. Although each kernel is a weak face detector by itself, combined, they can be quite accurate. It's unlikely that a bunch of face-like features features will cluster together if they're not a face. This was the basis of an early and influential algorithm called Viola Jones Face Detection. Today, the hot new algorithms on the block are convolutional neural networks. We talked about neural nets last episode if you need a primer. In short, an artificial neuron, which is the building block of a neural network, takes a series of inputs and multiplies each by a specified weight, and then sums those values all together. This should sound vaguely familiar, because it's a lot like a convolution. In fact, if we pass a neuron 2D pixel data, rather than a one-dimensional list of inputs, it's exactly like a convolution. The input weights are equivalent to kernel values, but unlike a predefined kernel, neural networks can learn their own useful kernels that are able to recognise interesting features in images. Convolutional neural networks use banks of those neurons to process image data, each outputting a new image essentially digested by different learned kernels. These outputs are then processed by subsequent layers of neurons, allowing for convolutions on convolutions on convolutions. The very first convolutional layer might find things like 
edges, as that's what a single convolution can recognize, as we've already discussed. The next layer might have neurons that convolve on those edge features to recognize simple shapes comprised of edges, like corners. A layer beyond that might convolve on those corner features, and contain neurons that can recognize simple objects like mouths and eyebrows. And this keeps going, building up in complexity, until there's a layer that does a convolution that puts it together. Eyes, ears, mouth, nose, the whole nine yards, and says, aha, it's a face. Convolutional neural networks aren't required to be many layers deep, but they usually are in order to recognize complex objects and scenes. That's why the technique is considered deep learning. Both Viola Jones and convolutional neural networks can be applied to many image recognition problems, like recognizing handwritten text, spotting tumors in CT scans, and monitoring traffic flow on roads. But we're going to stick with faces. Regardless of what algorithm was used, once we've isolated a face in a photo, we can apply more specialized computer vision algorithms to pinpoint facial landmarks, like the tip of the nose and corners of the mouth. This data can be used for determining things like if the eyes are open, which is pretty easy once you have the landmarks. It's just the distance between points. We can also track the position of the eyebrows. Their relative position to the eyes can be an indicator of surprise or delight. Smiles are also pretty straightforward to detect, based on the shape of mouth landmarks. All of this information can be interpreted by emotion recognition algorithms, giving computers the ability to infer when you're happy, sad, frustrated, confused, and so on. In turn, that could allow computers to intelligently adapt their behavior, maybe offer tips when you're confused, and not ask to install updates when you're frustrated. This is just one example example of how vision can give computers the ability to be context sensitive, that is, aware of their surroundings. And not just the physical surroundings, like if you're at work or on a train, but also your social surroundings, like if you're in a formal business meeting versus a friend's birthday party. You behave differently in those surroundings, and so should computing devices if they're smart. Facial landmarks also capture the geometry of your face, like the distance between your eyes and the height of your forehead. This is one form of biometric data, and it allows computers with cameras to recognize you, whether it's your smartphone automatically unlocking itself when it sees you, or governments tracking people using CCTV cameras, the applications of facial recognition seem limitless. There have also been recent breakthroughs in landmark tracking for hands and whole bodies, giving computers the ability to interpret a user's body language, and what hand gestures they're frantically waving at their internet-connected microwave. As we've talked about many times in this series, abstraction is the key to building complex systems, and the same is true in computer vision. At the hardware level, you have engineers building better and better cameras, giving computers improved sight with each passing year, which I can't say for myself. Using that camera data, you have computer vision algorithms crunching pixels to find things like faces and hands. And then using output from those algorithms, you have even more specialized algorithms for interpreting things like user facial expression and hand gestures. On top of that, there are people building novel interactive experiences, like smart TVs and intelligent tutoring systems that respond to hand gestures and emotion. Each of these levels are active areas of research, with breakthroughs happening every year. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Today, computer vision is everywhere, whether it's barcodes being scanned at stores, self-driving cars waiting at red lights, or Snapchat filters superimposing moustaches. And the most exciting thing is that computer scientists are really just getting started, enabled by recent advances in computing like super-fast GPUs. Computers with human-like ability to see are going to totally change how we interact with them. Of course, it'd also be nice if they could hear and speak, which we'll discuss next week. I'll see you then. Hey guys, before I go, I wanted to tell you about a great new show from PBS Digital Studios, The Origin of Everything. In this series, host Danielle Bainbridge investigates the history of, well, everything, from the hashtag in US healthcare, to Godzilla, and even killer clowns. It's a show about how the complex intersections of our past have informed the world we know today. And I think you'll love it. Last episode, we talked about computer vision, giving computers the ability to see and understand visual information. Today, we're going to talk about how to give computers the ability to understand language. You might argue they've always had this capability. Back in episodes 9 and 12, we talked about machine language instructions, as well as higher level programming languages. While these certainly meet the definition of a language, they also tend to have small vocabularies and follow highly structured conventions. Code will only compile and run if it's 100% free of spelling and syntactic errors. Of course, this is quite 
quite different from human languages, what are called natural languages, containing large diverse vocabularies, words with several different meanings, speakers with different accents, and all sorts of interesting wordplay. People also make linguistic faux pas when writing and speaking, like slurring words together, leaving out key details so things are ambiguous, and mispronouncing things. But for the most part, humans can roll right through these challenges. The skillful use of language is a major part of what makes us human, and for this reason, the desire for computers to understand and speak our language has been around since they were first conceived. This led to the creation of Natural Language Processing, or NLP, an interdisciplinary field combining computer science and linguistics. There's an essentially infinite number of ways to arrange words in a sentence. We can't give computers a dictionary of all possible sentences to help them understand what humans are blabbing on about. So an early and fundamental NLP problem was deconstructing sentences into bite-sized pieces which could be more easily processed. In school, you learned about nine fundamental types of English words. Nouns, pronouns, articles, verbs, adjectives, Tips, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections. These are all called parts of speech. There are all sorts of subcategories too, like singular versus plural nouns and superlative versus comparative adverbs, but we're not going to get into that. Knowing a word's type is definitely useful, but unfortunately there are a lot of words that have multiple meanings, like rows and leaves, which can be used as nouns or verbs. A digital dictionary alone isn't enough to resolve this ambiguity, so computers also need to know some grammar. For this, phrase structure rules were developed which encapsulate the grammar of a language. For example, in English there's a rule that says a sentence can be comprised of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. Noun phrases can be an article like the, followed by a noun, or they can be an adjective followed by a noun. And you can make rules like this for an entire language. Then using these rules, it's fairly easy to construct what's called a parse tree, which not only tags every word with a likely part of speech, but also reveals how the sentence is constructed. We now know, for example, that the noun focus of this sentence is the Mongols, and we know it's about them doing the action of rising from something, in this case, leaves. These smaller chunks of data allow computers to more easily access, process, and respond to information. Equivalent processes are happening every time you do a voice search, like, where's the nearest pizza? The computer can recognize this as a where question, knows that you want the noun pizza, and the dimension you care about is nearest. The same process applies to what is the biggest giraffe, or who sang Thriller. By treating language almost like Lego, computers can be quite adept at natural language tasks. They can answer questions and also process commands, like set an alarm for two 20 or play T Swizzle on Spotify. But as you've probably experienced, they fail when you start getting too fancy, and they can no longer parse the sentence correctly or capture your intent. Hey Siri, methinks the Mongols doth roam too much. What think ye on this most gentle midsummer's day? I'm not sure I got that. I should also note that phrase structure rules and similar methods that codify language can be used by computers to generate natural language text. This works particularly well when data is stored in a web of semantic information, where entities are linked to one another in meaningful relationships, providing all the ingredients you need to craft informational sentences. Thriller was released in 1983 and sung by Michael Jackson. Google's version of this is called Knowledge Graph. At the end of 2016, it contained roughly 70 billion facts about and relationships between different entities. These two processes, parsing and generating text, are fundamental components of natural language chatbots, computer programs that chat with you. Early chatbots were primarily rule-based, where experts would encode hundreds of rules mapping what a user might say to how a program should reply. Obviously, this was unwieldy to maintain and limited the possible sophistication. A famous early example was Eliza, created in the mid-1960s at MIT. This was a chatbot that took on the role of a therapist and used basic basic syntactic rules to identify content in written exchanges, which it would turn around and ask the user about. Sometimes it felt very much like human-human communication, but other times it would make simple and even comical mistakes. Chatbots and more advanced dialogue systems have come a long way in the last 50 years and can be quite convincing today. Modern approaches are based on machine learning, where gigabytes of real human-to-human -human chats are used to train chatbots. Today, the technology is finding use in customer service applications, where there's already heaps of example conversations to learn from. People have also been getting chatbots to talk with one another, and in a Facebook experiment, chatbots even started to evolve their own language. This experiment got a bunch of scary-sounding press, but it was just the computers crafting a simplified protocol to negotiate with one another. It wasn't evil, it was efficient. But what about if something is spoken? How does a computer get words from the sound? 
That's the domain of speech recognition, which has been the focus of research for many decades. Bell Labs debuted the first speech recognition system in 1952, nicknamed Audrey, the automatic digit recognizer. It could recognize all 10 numerical digits if you said them slowly enough. Five, nine, Seven. The project didn't go anywhere because it was much faster to enter telephone numbers with a finger. Ten years later, at the 1962 World's Fair, IBM demonstrated a shoebox-sized machine capable of recognising 16 words. To boost research in the area, DARPA kicked off an ambitious five-year funding initiative in 1971, which led to the development of Harpy at Carnegie Mellon University. Harpy was the first system to recognise over a thousand words. But on computers of the era, transcription was often ten or more times slower than the rate of natural speech. Fortunately, thanks to huge advances in computing performance in the 80s and 90s, continuous real-time speech recognition became practical. There was simultaneous innovation in the algorithms for processing natural language, moving from handcrafted rules to machine learning techniques that could learn automatically from existing datasets of human language. Today, the speech recognition systems with the best accuracy are using deep neural networks, which we touched on in episode 34. To get a sense of how these techniques work, let's look at some speech, specifically the acoustic signal. Let's start by looking at vowel sounds, like R and E. These are the waveforms of those two sounds, as captured by a computer's microphone. As we discussed in episode 21 on files and file formats, this signal is the magnitude of displacement of a diaphragm inside of a microphone, as sound waves cause it to oscillate. In this view, of sound data, the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is the magnitude of displacement or amplitude. Although we can see there are differences between the waveforms, it's not super obvious what you would point to and say, aha, this is definitely an E sound. To really make this pop out, we need to view the data in a totally different way, a spectrogram. In this view of the data, we still have time along the horizontal axes, but now instead of amplitude on the vertical axes, we plot the magnitude of the different frequencies that make up each sound. The brighter the colour, the louder that frequency component. This conversion from waveform to frequencies is done with a very cool algorithm called a fast Fourier transform. If you've ever stared at a stereo system's EQ visualiser, it's pretty much the same thing. A spectrogram is plotting that information over time. You might have noticed that the signals have a sort of ribbed pattern to them. That's all the resonances of my vocal tract. To make different sounds, I squeeze my vocal cords, mouth and tongue into different shapes, which amplifies or dampens different resonances. We can see this in the signal, with areas that are brighter and areas that are darker. If we work our way up from the bottom, labelling where we see peaks in the spectrum, what are called formants, we can see the two sounds have quite different arrangements, and this is true for all vowel sounds. It's exactly this type of information that lets computers recognise spoken vowels, and indeed whole words. Let's see a more complicated example, like when I say, she was happy. We can see our E sound here and R sound here. We can also see a bunch of other distinctive sounds, like the sh sound in she, the wa and s in was, and so on. These sound pieces that make up words are called phonemes. Speech recognition software knows what all these phonemes look like. In English, there are roughly 44, so it mostly boils down to fancy pattern matching. Then you have to separate words from one another, figure out when sentences begin and end, and ultimately, you end up with speech converted into text, allowing for techniques like we discussed at the beginning of the episode. Because people say words in slightly different ways, due to things like accents and mispronunciations, transcription accuracy is greatly improved when combined with a language model, which contains statistics about sequences of words. For example, she was is most likely to be followed by an adjective like happy. It's uncommon for she was to be followed immediately by a noun. So if the speech recognizer was unsure between happy and harpy, it would pick happy, since the language model would report that as a more likely choice. Finally, we need to talk about speech synthesis, that is, giving computers the ability to output speech. This is very much like speech recognition, but in reverse. We can take a sentence of text and break it down into its phonetic components, and then play those sounds back to back out of a computer speaker. You can hear this changing of phonemes very clearly with older speech synthesis technologies like this 1937 hand-operated machine from Bell Labs. Say she saw me with no expression. She saw me. Now say it in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Did she see you or hear you? 
Station on. By the 1980s, this had improved a lot, but that discontinuous and awkward blending of phonemes still created that signature robotic sound. Thriller was released in 1983 and signed by Michael Jackson. Today, synthesized computer voices like Siri, Katana and Alexa have gotten much better, but they're still not quite human. But we're so, so close, and it's likely to be a solved problem pretty soon. Especially because we're now seeing an explosion of voice user interfaces on our phones, in our cars and homes, and maybe soon plugged right into our ears. This ubiquity is creating a positive feedback loop, where people are using voice interaction more often, which in turn is giving companies like Google, Amazon and Microsoft more data to train their systems on, which is enabling better accuracy, which is leading to people using voice more, which is enabling even better accuracy, and the loop continues. Many predict that speech technologies will become as common a form of interaction as screens, keyboards, trackpads and other physical input-output devices that we use today. That's particularly good news for robots, who don't want to have to walk around with keyboards in order to communicate with humans. But we'll talk more about them next week. Today, we're going to talk about robots. The first image that jumps into your mind is probably a humanoid robot, like we usually see in shows or movies. Sometimes they're our friends and colleagues, but more often they're sinister, apathetic and battle-hardened. We also tend to think of robots as a technology of the future, but the reality is they're already here by the millions, and they're our workmates, helping us to do things harder, better, faster and stronger. There are many definitions for robots, but in general, these are machines capable of carrying out a series of actions automatically, by computer control. How they look isn't part of the equation. Robots can be industrial arms that spray paint cars, drones that fly, snake-like medical robots that assist surgeons, as well as humanoid robotic assistants. Although the term robot is sometimes applied to interactive virtual characters, it's more appropriate to call these bots, or even better, agents. That's because the term robot carries a physical connotation, a machine that lives in and acts on the real world. The word robot was first used in a 1920 Czech play to denote artificial humanoid characters. The word was derived from robota, the Slavic language word for a forced labourer, indicating peasants in compulsory service in feudal 19th century Europe. The play didn't go too much into technological details, but even a century later, it's still a common portrayal. Mass-produced, efficient, tireless creatures that look humanesque, but are emotionless, indifferent to self-preservation and lack creativity. The more general idea of self-operating machines goes back even further than the 1920s. Many ancient inventors created mechanical devices that performed functions automatically, like keeping the time and striking bells on the hour. There are plenty of examples of automated animal and humanoid figures that would perform dances, sing songs, strike drums and do other physical actions. These non-electrical and certainly non-electronic machines were called automatons. For instance, an early automaton created in 1739 by the Frenchman Jacques de Vaucanson was the canard digerateur or digesting duck, a machine in the shape of a duck that appeared to eat grain and then defecate. In 1739, Voltaire wrote, without the voice of Le Maire and Vaucanson's duck, you would have nothing to remind you of the glory of France. One of the most infamous examples was the Mechanical Turk, a chess-playing humanoid automaton. After construction in 1770, it toured all over Europe, wowing audiences with its surprisingly good chess playing. It appeared to be a mechanical artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, it was a hoax. There was a dainty human stuffed inside the machine. The first machines controlled by computers emerged in the late 1940s. These computer numerical control or CNC machines could run programs that instructed a machine to perform a series of operations. This level of control also enabled the creation of new manufactured goods, like milling a complex propeller design out of a block of aluminium, something that was difficult to do using standard machine tools, and with tolerances too too small to be done by hand. CNC machines were a huge boon to industry, not just due to increased capability and precision, but also in terms of reducing labour costs by automating human jobs, a topic we'll revisit in a later episode. The first commercial deployment was a programmable industrial robot called the Unimate, sold to General Motors in 1960 to lift hot pieces of metal from a die casting machine and stack them. This was the start of the robotics industry. Soon, robots were stacking pallets, welding parts, painting cars and much more. For simple motions, like a robotic gripper that moves back and forth on a track, a robot can be instructed to move to a particular position and it will keep moving in that direction until the desired position is reached, at which point it will stop. This behaviour can be achieved through a simple control loop. First, sense the robot position. Are we there yet? Nope. So keep moving. Now sense position again. Are we there yet? No, so keep moving. Are we there yet? 
Yes, so we can stop moving and also please be quiet. Because we're trying to minimize the distance between the sense position and the desired position, this control loop is more specifically a negative feedback loop. A negative feedback control loop has three key pieces. There's a sensor that measures things in the real world like water pressure, motor position, air temperature, or whatever you're trying to control. From this measurement, we calculate how far we are from where we want to be, the error. The error is then interpreted by a controller, which decides how to instruct the system to minimize that error. Then the system acts on the world through pumps, motors, heating elements, and other physical actuators. In tightly controlled environments, simple control loops like this work okay, but in many real world applications, things are a tad more complicated. Imagine that our gripper is really heavy, and even when the control loop says to stop, momentum causes the gripper to overshoot the desired position. That would cause the control loop to take over again, this time back the gripper up. A badly tuned control loop might overshoot and overshoot and overshoot and maybe even wobble forever. To make matters worse, in real world settings there are typically external and variable forces acting on a robot, like friction, wind and items of different weight. To handle this gracefully, more sophisticated control logic is needed. A widely used control loop feedback mechanism is a proportional integral derivative controller. That's a bit of a mouthful, so people call them PID controllers. These used to be mechanical devices, but now it's all done in software. Let's imagine a robot that delivers coffee. Its goal is to travel between customers at two meters per second, which has been determined to be the idle speed that's both safe and expedient. Of course, the environment doesn't always cooperate. Sometimes there's wind and sometimes there's uphills and downhills and all sorts of things that affect the speed of the robot. So it's going to have to increase and decrease power to its motors to maintain the desired speed. Using the robot's speed sensor, we can keep track of its actual speed and plot that alongside its desired speed. PID controllers calculate three values from this data. First is the proportional value, which is the difference between the desired value and the actual value at the most recent instant in time or the present. This is what our simpler control loop used before. The bigger the gap between actual and desired, the harder you'll push towards your target. In other words, it's proportional control. Next, the integral value is computed, which is the sum of error over a window of time, like the last few seconds. This look back helps compensate for steady state errors resulting from things like motoring up a long hill. If the value is large, it means proportional control is not enough and we have to push harder still. Finally, there's the derivative value, which is the rate of change between the desired and actual values. This helps account for possible future error and is sometimes called anticipatory control. For example, if you're screaming in towards your goal too fast, you'll need to ease up a little to prevent overshoot. These three values are summed together with different relative weights to produce a controller output that's passed to the system. PID controllers are everywhere, from cruise control in your car to drones that automatically adjust their rotor speeds to maintain level flight, as well as more exotic robots like this one that balances on a ball to move around. Advanced robots often require many control loops running in parallel, working together, managing everything from robot balance to limb position. As we've discussed, control loops are responsible for getting robot attributes like location to desired values. So you may be wondering where these values come from. This is the responsibility of higher level robot software, which plans and executes robot actions like plotting a path around sensed obstacles or breaking down physical tasks like picking up a ball into simple sequential motions. Using these techniques, robots have racked up some impressive achievements. They've been to the deepest depths of the Earth's oceans and roved around on Mars for over a decade. But interestingly, lots of problems that are trivial for many humans have turned out to be devilishly difficult for robots, like walking on two legs, opening a door, picking up objects without crushing them, putting on a t-shirt or petting a dog. These are tasks you may be able to do without thinking, but a supercomputer power robot fails out spectacularly. These sorts of tasks are all active areas of robotics research. Artificial intelligent techniques, which we talked about a few episodes ago, are perhaps the most promising avenue to overcome these challenges. For example, Google has been running an experiment with a series of robotic arms that spend their days moving miscellaneous objects from one box to another, learning from trial and error. After thousands of hours of practice, the robots had cut their error rate in half. Of course, Unlike humans, robots can run 24 hours a day and practice with many arms at the same time. So it may just be a matter of time until they become adept at grasping things.
things, but for the time being, toddlers can outgrasp them. One of the biggest and most visible robotic breakthroughs in recent years has been self-driving autonomous cars. If you think about it, cars don't have too many system inputs. You can speed up or slow down, and you can steer left or right. The tough part is sensing lanes, reading signs, and anticipating and navigating traffic, pedestrians, bicyclists, and a whole host of obstacles. In addition to being studied with proximity sensors, these robotic vehicles heavily rely on computer vision algorithms, which we discussed in episode 35. We're also seeing the emergence of very primitive androids, robots that look and act like humans. Arguably, we're not close on either of those goals, as they tend to look pretty weird and act even weirder. At least, we'll always have Westworld. But anyway, these remain a tantalizing goal for roboticists that combine many computer science topics we've touched on over the last few episodes, like artificial intelligence, computer vision, and natural language processing. As for why humans are so fascinated by creating artificial embodiments of ourselves, you'll have to go to Crash Course Philosophy for that. And for the foreseeable future, realistic androids will continue to be the stuff of science fiction. Militaries also have a great interest in robots. They're not only replaceable, but can surpass humans in attributes like strength, endurance, attention, and accuracy. Bomb disposal robots and reconnaissance drones are fairly common today, but fully autonomous, armed to the teeth robots are slowly appearing, like the Samsung SGR A1 sentry gun deployed by South Korea. Robots with the intelligence and capability to take human lives are called lethal autonomous weapons and they're widely considered a complex and thorny issue. Without doubt, these systems could save soldiers' lives by taking them off the battlefield and out of harm's way. It might even discourage war altogether, though it's worth noting that people said the same thing about dynamite and nuclear weapons. On the flip side, we might be creating ruthlessly efficient killing machines that don't apply human judgment or compassion to complex situations, and the fog of war is about as complex and murky as they come. These robots would be taking orders and executing them as efficiently as they can, and sometimes human orders turn out to be really bad. This debate is going to continue for a long time, and pundits on both sides will grow louder as robotic technology improves. It's also an old debate. The danger was obvious to science fiction writer Isaac Asimov, who introduced a fictional Three Laws of Robotics in his 1942 short story, Runaround. And then he later added a zeroth rule. In short, it's a code of conduct or moral compass for robots, guiding them to do no harm, especially to humans. It's pretty inadequate for practical application, and it leaves plenty of room for equivocation. But still, Asimov's laws inspired a ton of science fiction and academic discussion. And today, there are whole conferences on robot ethics. Importantly, Asimov crafted his fictional rules as a way to push back on robot as a menace memes, common in fiction from his childhood. These were stories where robots went off the rails, harming or even destroying their creators in the process. Asimov, on the other hand, envisioned robots as useful, reliable, and even lovable machines. And it's this duality I want to leave you thinking about today. Like many of the technologies we've discussed throughout this series, there are benevolent and malicious uses. Our job is to carefully reflect on computing's potential and peril, and wield our inventive talents to improve the state of the world. And robots are one of the most potent reminders of this responsibility. I'll see you next week. So over the course of this series, we've focused almost exclusively on computers, the circuits and algorithms that make them tick, because this is Crash Course Computer Science. But ultimately, computers are tools employed by everyone, and humans are, well, messy. We haven't been designed by human engineers from the ground up with known performance specifications. We can be logical one moment and irrational the next. Have you ever gotten angry of your navigation system, surfed Wikipedia aimlessly, begged your internet browser to load faster, or nicknamed your Roomba? These behaviours are quintessentially human. To build computer systems that are useful, usable, and enjoyable, we need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of both computers and humans. And for this reason, when good system designers are creating software, they employ social, cognitive, behavioural, and perceptual psychology principles. No doubt you've encountered a physical or computer interface that was frustrating to use, impeding your progress. Maybe it was so badly designed that you couldn't figure it out and just gave up. That interface had poor usability. usability is the degree to which a human-made artifact like software can be used to achieve an objective effectively and efficiently. To facilitate human work, we need to understand humans, from how they see and think to how they react and interact. For instance, the human visual system has been well studied by psychologists. Like, we know that people are good at ordering intensities of colours. Here are three. Can you arrange these from lightest to darkest? you probably don't have to think too much about it. Because of this innate ability, colour intensity is a great choice for displaying data with continuous values. On the other hand, humans are terrible at ordering colours. Here's another example for you to put in order. 
Is orange before blue or after blue? Where does green go? You might be thinking we could order this by wavelength of light, like a rainbow, but that's a lot more to think about. Most people are going to be much slower and error prone at ordering. Because of this innate ineptitude of your visual system, displaying continuous data using colors can be a disastrous design choice. You'll find yourself constantly referring back to a color legend to compare items. However, Colors are perfect for when the data is discrete with no ordering, like categorical data. This might seem obvious, but you'd be amazed at how many interfaces get basic things like this wrong. Beyond visual perception, understanding human cognition helps us design interfaces that align with how the mind works. Like humans can read, remember and process information more effectively when it's chunked. That is, when items are put together in small, meaningful groups. Humans can generally juggle seven items, plus or minus two, in short-term memory. To be conservative, we typically see groupings of five or less. That's why telephone numbers are broken into chunks, like 317-555-3897. Instead of being 10 individual digits that we'd likely forget, it's three chunks, which we can handle better. From a computer's standpoint, this needlessly takes more time and space, so it's less efficient. But it's way more efficient for us humans, a trade-off we almost always making our favor since we're the ones running the show for now. Chunking has been applied to computer interfaces for things like drop-down menu items and menu bars with buttons. It'd be more efficient for computers to just pack all those together edge to edge. It's wasted memory and screen real estate. But designing interfaces in this way makes them much easier to visually scan, remember and access. Another central concept used in interface design is affordances. According to Don Norman, who popularized the term in computing, affordances provide strong clues to the operations of things. Plates are for pushing, knobs are for turning, slots are for inserting things into. When affordances are taken advantage of, the user knows what to do just by looking. No picture, label or instruction needed. If you've ever tried to pull a door handle only to realize that you have to push it open, you've discovered a broken affordance. On the other hand, a door plate is a better design because it only gives you the option to push. Doors are pretty straightforward. If you need to put written instructions on them, you should probably go back to the drawing board. Affordances are used extensively in graphical user interface interfaces, which we discussed in episode 26. It's one of the reasons why computers became so much easier to use than with command lines. You don't have to guess what things on screen are clickable, because they look like buttons. They pop out just waiting for you to press them. One of my favourite affordances, which suggests to users that an on-screen element is draggable, is knurling. That texture added to objects to improve grip to show you where to best grab them. This idea and pattern was borrowed from real-world physical tools. Related to the concept of affordances is the psychology of recognition recognition versus recall. You know this effect well from tests. It's why multiple choice questions are easier than fill in the blank ones. In general, human memory is much better when it's triggered by a sensory cue, like a word, picture or sound. That's why interfaces use icons, pictorial representations of functions like a trash can for where files go to be deleted. We don't have to recall what that icon does, we just have to recognize the icon. This was also a huge improvement over command line interfaces, where you had to rely on your memory for what commands to use. Do I have to type delete, or remove, or trash, or shoot? It could be anything. It's actually RM in Linux, but anyway. Making everything easy to discover and learn sometimes means slow to access, which conflicts with another psychology concept, expertise. As you gain experience with interfaces, you get faster, building mental models of how to do things efficiently. So good interfaces should offer multiple paths to accomplish goals. A great example of this is copy and paste, which can be found in the edit drop-down menu of word processors, and it's also triggered with keyboard shortcuts. One approach caters to novices, while the other caters to experts, slowing down neither. So you can have your cake and eat it too. In addition to making humans more efficient, we'd also like computers to be emotionally intelligent, adapting their behavior to respond appropriately to their user's emotional state, also called effect. That would make experiences more empathetic, enjoyable, or even delightful. This vision was articulated by Rosalind Picard in her 1995 paper on effective computing, which kick-started an interdisciplinary field combining aspects of psychology, social, and computer sciences. It spurred work on computing systems that could recognize, interpret, simulate, and alter human effect. This was a huge deal, because we know emotion influences cognition and perception in everyday tasks, like learning, communication, and decision-making. Effect-aware systems use sense sometimes worn that capture things like speech and video of the face, as well as biometrics like sweatiness and heart rate. 
This multimodal sensor data is used in conjunction with computational models that represent how people develop and express affective states, like happiness and frustration, and social states like friendship and trust. These models estimate the likelihood of a user being in a particular state, and figure out how to best respond to that state in order to achieve the goals of the system. This might be to calm the user down, build trust, or help them to get their homework done. A study looking at user effects was conducted by Facebook in 2012. For one week, data scientists altered the content on hundreds of thousands of users' feeds. Some people were shown more items with positive content, while others were presented with more negative content. The researchers analyzed people's posts during that week and found that users who were shown more positive content tended to also post more positive content. On the other hand, users who saw more negative content tended to have more negative posts. Clearly, what Facebook and other services show you can absolutely have an effect on you. As gatekeepers of content, that's a huge opportunity and responsibility, which is why this study ended up being pretty controversial. Also, it raises some interesting interesting questions about how computer programs should respond to human communication. If the user is being negative, maybe the computer shouldn't be annoying by responding in a cheery, upbeat manner. Or maybe the computer should attempt to evoke a positive response, even if it's a bit awkward. The correct behavior is very much an open research question. Speaking of Facebook, it's a great example of Computer Mediated Communication, or CMC, another large field of research. This includes synchronous communication, like video calls, where all participants are online simultaneously as well as asynchronous communication, like tweets, emails, and text messages, where people respond whenever they can or want. Researchers study things like the use of emoticons, rules such as turn-taking, and language used in different communication channels. One interesting finding is that people exhibit higher levels of self-disclosure, that is, reveal personal information in computer-mediated conversations, as opposed to face-to-face -face interactions. So if you want to build a system that knows how many hours a user truly spent watching The Great British Bake Off, it might be better to build a chatbot than a virtual agent with a face. Psychology research has also demonstrated that eye gaze is extremely important in persuading, teaching, and getting people's attention. Looking at others while talking is called mutual gaze. This has been shown to boost engagement and help achieve the goals of a conversation, whether that's learning, making a friend, or closing a business deal. In settings like a videotaped lecture, the instructor rarely, if ever, looks into the camera, and instead generally looks at the students who are physically present. That's okay for them, but it means people who watch the lectures online have reduced engagement. In response, researchers have developed computer vision and graphics software that can warp the head and eyes, making it appear as though the instructor is looking into the camera right at the remote viewer. This technique is called augmented gaze. Similar techniques have also been applied to video conference calls to correct for the placement of webcams, which are almost always located above screens. Since you're typically looking at the video of your conversation partner rather than directly into the webcam, you'll always appear to them as though you're looking downwards, breaking mutual gaze, which can create all kinds of unfortunate social side effects, like a power imbalance. Fortunately, this can be corrected digitally and appear to participants as though you're lovingly gazing into their eyes. Humans also love anthropomorphizing objects, and computers are no exception, especially if they move, like our robots from last episode. Beyond industrial uses that prevailed over the last century, robots are used increasingly in medical, education, and entertainment settings, where they frequently interact with humans. Human-Robot Interaction, or HRI, is a field dedicated to studying these interactions, like how people perceive different robot behaviors and forms, or how robots can interpret human social cues to blend in and not be super awkward. As we discussed last episode, there's an ongoing quest to make robots as human-like in their appearance and interactions as possible. When engineers first made robots in the 1940s and 50s, they didn't look very human at all. They were almost exclusively industrial machines with no human likeness. Over time, engineers got better and better at making human-like robots. They gained heads and walked around on two legs, but they couldn't exactly go to restaurants and masquerade as humans. As people pushed closer and closer to human likeness, replacing cameras with artificial eyeballs and covering metal chassis with synthetic flesh, things started to get a bit uncanny, eliciting an eerie and unsettling feeling. This dip in realism between almost human and actually human became known as the Uncanny Valley. There's debate over whether robots should act like humans too. Lots of evidence already suggests that even if robots don't act like us, people will treat them as though they know our social conventions. And when they violate these rules, such as not apologizing if they cut in front of you or roll over your foot, people get really mad. Without a doubt, psychology and computer science are a potent combination and have a tremendous potential to affect our everyday lives, which leaves us with a lot of questions. Like, you might lie to your laptop, but should your laptop lie to you? What if it makes you more efficient or happy? Or should social media companies curate the content they show you to make you stay on their site longer, to make you buy more products? They do, by the way. 
These types of ethical considerations aren't easy to answer, but psychology can at least help us to understand the effects and implications of design choices in our computing systems. But on the positive side, understanding the psychology behind design might lead to increased accessibility. A greater number of people can understand and use computers now that they're more intuitive than ever. Conference calls and virtual classrooms are becoming more agreeable experiences. And as robot technology continues to improve, the population will grow more comfortable in those interactions. Plus, thanks to psychology, we can all bond over our love of knurling. One of the most dramatic changes enabled by computing technology has been the creation and widespread availability of information. There are currently 1.3 billion websites on the internet. Wikipedia alone has 5 million English language articles, spanning everything from the dancing plague of 1518 to proper toilet paper orientation. Every day, Google serves up 4 billion searches to access this information, and every minute, 3.5 million videos are viewed on YouTube, and 400 hours of new video get uploaded by users. Lots of these views are people watching Gangnam Style and Despacito, but another large percentage could be considered educational, like what you're doing right now. This amazing treasure trove of information can be accessed with just a few taps on your smartphone, anywhere, anytime. But having information available isn't the same as learning from it. To be clear, we here at Crash Course are big fans of interactive in-class learning, directed conversations, and hands-on experiences as powerful tools for learning. But we also believe in the additive power of educational technology, both inside and outside the classroom. So today, we're going to go a little meta and talk specifically about how computer science can support learning with educational technology. Technology, from paper and pencil to recent machine learning based intelligent systems, has been supporting education for millennia, even as early as humans drawing cave paintings to record hunting scenes for posterity. Teaching people at a distance has long been a driver of educational technology. For example, around 50 CE, St. Paul was sending epistles that offered lessons on religious teachings for new churches being set up in Asia. Since then, several major waves of technological advances have each promised to revolutionise education, from radio and television to DVDs and laser discs. In fact, as far back as 1913, Thomas Edison predicted books will soon be obsolete in the schools. It is possible to teach every branch of human knowledge with the motion picture. Our school system will be completely changed in the next 10 years. Of course, you know that didn't happen, but distributing educational materials in formats like video has become more and more popular. Before we discuss what educational technology research can do for you, there are some simple things research has shown you can do while watching an educational video like this one significantly increase what you learn and retain. First, video is naturally adjustable, so make sure the pacing is right for you by using the video speed controls. On YouTube, you can do that in the right-hand corner of the screen. You should be able to understand the video and have enough time to reflect on the content. Second, pause. You can learn more if you stop the video at the difficult parts. When you do, ask yourself questions about what you've watched and see if you can answer. Or ask yourself questions about what might be coming up next and then play the video to see if you're right. Third, try any examples or exercises that are presented in the video on your own. Even if you aren't a programmer, write pseudocode on paper and maybe even give coding a try. Active learning techniques like these have been shown to increase learning by a factor of 10. And if you want more information like this, we've got a whole course on it here. The idea of video as a way to spread quality education has appealed to a lot of people over the last century. What's just the latest incarnation of this idea came in the form of massive open online courses, or MOOCs. In fact, the New York Times declared 2012 the year of the MOOC. A lot of the early forms were just videos of lectures from famous professors. But for a while, some people thought this might mean the end of universities as we know them. Whether you were worried about this idea or excited by it, that future also hasn't really come to pass and most of the hype has dissipated. This is probably mostly because when you try to scale up learning using technology to include millions of students simultaneously with small numbers of instructional staff or even none, you run into a lot of problems. Fortunately, these problems have intrigued computer scientists and more specifically educational technologists who are finding ways to solve them. For example, effective learning involves getting timely and relevant feedback. But how do you give good feedback when you have millions of learners and only one teacher. For that matter, how does a teacher grade a million assignments? Solving many of these problems means creating hybrid human technology systems. A useful but controversial insight was that students could be a great resource to give each other feedback. Unfortunately, they're often pretty bad at doing so. They're neither experts in the subject matter nor teachers. However, we can support their efforts with technology, like by using algorithms. We can match perfect learning partners together out of potentially millions of groupings. Also, parts of the grading can be done with automated systems 
while humans do the rest. For instance, computer algorithms that grade the writing portions of the SATs have been found to be just as accurate as humans hired to grade them by hand. Other algorithms are being developed that provide personalized learning experiences, much like Netflix's personalized movie recommendations or Google's personalized search results. To achieve this, the software needs to understand what a learner knows and doesn't know. With that understanding, the software can present the right material at the right time to give each particular learner practice on the things that are hardest for them, rather than what they're already good at. Such systems, most often powered by artificial intelligence, are broadly called intelligent tutoring systems. Let's break down a hypothetical system that follows common conventions. So imagine a student is working on this algebra problem in our hypothetical tutoring software. The correct next step to solve it is to subtract both sides by seven. The knowledge required to do this step can be represented by something called a production rule. These describe procedures as if-then statements. The pseudocode of a production rule for this step would say, if there is a constant on the same side as the variable, then subtract that constant from both sides. The cool thing about production rules is that they can also be used to represent common mistakes a student might make. These production rules are called buggy rules. For example, instead of subtracting the constant, the student might mistakenly try to subtract the coefficient. No can do. It's totally possible that multiple competing production rules are triggered after a student completes a step. It may not be entirely clear what misconception has led to a student's answer, so production rules are combined with an algorithm that selects the most likely one. That way, the student can be given a helpful piece of feedback. These production rules and the selection algorithm combine to form what's called a domain model, which is a formal representation of the knowledge, procedures, and skills of a particular discipline, like algebra. Domain models can be used to assist learners on any individual problem, but they're insufficient for helping learners move through a whole curriculum because they don't track any progress over time. For that, intelligent tutoring systems build and maintain a student model, one that tracks, among other things, what production rules a student has mastered and where they still need practice. This is exactly what we need to properly personalize the tutor. That doesn't sound so hard, but it's actually a big challenge to figure out what a student knows and doesn't know based only on their answers to problems. A common technique for figuring this out is Bayesian knowledge tracing. The algorithm treats student knowledge as a set of latent variables, which are variables whose true value is hidden from an outside observer like our software. This is also true in the physical world, where a teacher would not know for certain whether a student knows something completely. Instead, they might probe that knowledge using a test to see if the student gets the right answer. Similarly, Bayesian knowledge tracing updates its estimate of the student's knowledge by observing the correctness of each interaction using that skill. To do this, the software maintains four probabilities. First is the probability that a student has learned how to do a particular skill. For example, the skill of subtracting constants from both sides of an algebraic equation. Let's say our student correctly subtracts both sides by seven. Because she got the problem correct, we might assume she knows how to do this step. But there's also the possibility that the student got it correct by accident and doesn't actually understand how to solve the problem. This is the probability of guess. Similarly, if the student gets it wrong, you might assume that she doesn't know how to do the step. But there's also the possibility that she knows it but made a careless error or other slip up. This is called the probability of slip. The last probability that Bayesian knowledge tracing calculates is the probability that the student started off the problem not knowing how to do the step, but learned how to do it as a result of working through the problem. This is called the probability of transit. These four probabilities are used in a set of equations that update the student model, keeping a running assessment for each skill the student is supposed to know. The first equation asks, what's the probability that the student has learned a particular skill? Which takes into account the probability that it was already learned previously, and the probability of transit. Like a teacher, our estimate of this probability that it was already learned previously depends on whether we observe a student getting a question correct or incorrect. And so we have these two equations to pick from. After we compute the right value, we plug it into our first equation, updating the probability that a student has learned a particular skill, which then gets stored in their student model. Although there are other approaches, intelligent tutoring systems often use Bayesian knowledge tracing to support what's called mastery learning, where students practice skills until they're deeply understood. To do this most efficiently, the software selects the best problems to present to the student to achieve mastery, what's called adaptive sequencing, which is one form of personalization. But our example is still just dealing with data from one student. Internet-connected educational apps or sites now allow teachers and researchers the ability to collect data from millions of learners. From that data, we can discover things like common pitfalls and where students get frustrated. Beyond student responses to questions, this can be done by looking at how long they pause before entering an answer. 
answer, where they speed up a video and how they interact with other students on discussion forums. This field is called educational data mining and it has the ability to use all those face palms and aha moments to help improve personalized learning in the future. Speaking of the future, educational technologists have often drawn inspiration for their innovations from science fiction. In particular, many researchers were inspired by the future envisioned in the book The Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson. It describes a young girl who learns from a book that has a set of virtual agents who interact with her in natural language, acting as coaches, teachers and mentors who grow and change with her as she grows up. They can detect what she knows and how she's feeling and give just the right feedback and support to help her learn. Today, there are non-science fiction researchers such as Justin Cassell crafting pedagogical virtual agents that can exhibit the verbal and bodily behaviours found in conversation among humans and in doing so, build trust, rapport and even friendship with their human students. Maybe Crash Course in 2040 will have a little John Green AI that lives on your iPhone 30. Educational technology and devices are now moving off laptop and desktop computers and onto huge tabletop surfaces, where students can collaborate in groups and also tiny mobile devices where students can learn on the go. Virtual reality and augmented reality are also getting people excited and enabling new educational experiences for learners. Diving deep under the oceans, exploring outer space, traveling through the human body, or interacting with cultures they might never encounter in their real lives. If we look far into the future, educational interfaces might disappear entirely and instead happen through direct brain learning, where people can be uploaded with new skills directly into their brains. This might seem really far-fetched, but scientists are making inroads already, such as detecting whether someone knows something just from their brain signals. That leads to an interesting question. If we can download things into our brains, could we also upload the contents of our brains? We'll explore that in our series finale next week about the far future of computing. I'll see you then. We're here, the final episode. If you've watched the whole series, hopefully you've developed a newfound appreciation for the incredible breadth of computing applications and topics. It's hard to believe we've worked up from mere transistors and logic gates all the way to computer vision, machine learning, robotics and beyond. We've stood on the shoulders of giants like Babbage and Lovelace, Hollerith and Turing, Eckert and Hoppert, Sutherland and Engelbart, Bush and Berners-Lee, Gates and The Woz, and many other computing pioneers. My biggest hope is that these episodes have inspired you to learn more about how these subjects affect your life. Maybe you'll even pick up programming or choose a career in computing. It's awesome! It's also a skill of the future. I said in the very first episode that computer science isn't magic, but it sort of is. Knowing how to use and program computers is sorcery of the 21st century. Instead of incantations and spells, it's scripts and code. Those who know how to wield that tremendous power will be able to craft great things, not just to improve their own lives, but also their communities and humanity at large. Computing is also going to be literally everywhere, not just the computers we see today, sitting on desks and countertops and carried in pockets and bags, but inside every object imaginable. Inside all your kitchen appliances, embedded in your walls, nano-tagged in your food, woven into your clothes, and floating around inside your body. This is the vision of the field of ubiquitous computing. In some ways, it's all already here, and in other ways we've got many decades to go. Some might view this eventuality as dystopian, with computers everywhere surveilling us and competing for our attention. But the late Mark Weiser, who articulated this idea in the 1990s, saw the potential very differently. For 50 years, most interface design and most computer design has been headed down the path of the dramatic machine. Its highest idea is to make a computer so exciting, so wonderful, so interesting, that we never want to be without it. A less travelled path I call the invisible. Its highest idea is to make a computer so so embedded, so fitting, so natural that we use it without even thinking about it. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. That doesn't describe computing of today, where people sit for hours upon end in front of computer monitors and social media notifications interrupt us at dinner. But it could describe computing of the future, our final topic. When people think of computing in the future, they often jump right to artificial intelligence. No doubt there'll be tremendous strides made in AI in the coming years, but not everything will be or need to be AI powered. Your car might have an AI to self-drive, but the door locks might continue to be powered by what are essentially if statements. 
AI technology is just as likely to enhance existing devices like cars as it is to open up entirely new product categories. The exact same thing happened with the advent of electrical power. Light bulbs replaced candles, but electrification also led to the creation of hundreds of new electrically powered gadgets. And of course, we still have candles today. It's most likely that AI will be yet another tool that computer scientists can draw upon to tackle problems. What really gets people thinking and sometimes sweating is whether artificial intelligence will surpass human intelligence. This is a really tricky question for a multitude of reasons, including most immediately, what is intelligence? On one hand, we have computers that can drive cars, recognize songs with only a few seconds of audio, translate dozens of languages, and totally dominate at games like chess, Jeopardy, and Go. That sounds pretty smart. But on the other hand, computers fail at some basic tasks, like walking up steps, folding laundry, understanding speech at a cocktail party, and feeding themselves. We're a long way from artificial intelligence that's as general purpose and capable as a human. With intelligence being somewhat hard to quantify, people prefer to characterize computers and creatures by their processing power instead. But that's a pretty computing-centric view of intelligence. Nonetheless, if we do this exercise, plotting computers and processors we've talked about in this series, we find that computing today has very roughly equivalents in calculating power to that of a mouse, which to be fair, also can't fold laundry, although that would be super cute. Human calculating power is up here, another 10 to the 5 or 100,000 times more powerful than computers today. That sounds like a big gap, but with the rate of change in computing technologies, we might meet that point in as early as a decade, even though processor speeds are no longer following Moore's law, like we discussed in episode 17. If this trend continues, computers would have more processing power slash intelligence than the sum total of all human brains combined before the end of this century. And this could snowball as such systems need less human an input with an artificial superintelligence designing and training new versions of itself. This runaway technological growth, especially with respect to an intelligence explosion, is called the singularity. The term was first used by our old friend from episode 10, John von Neumann, who said, The accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life give the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. And von Neumann suggested this back in the 1950s. 50s, when computers were trillions of times slower than they are today. 60 years later though, the singularity is still just a possibility on the horizon. Some experts believe this progress is going to level off and be more of an S-curve than an exponential one, whereas complexity increases, it becomes more difficult to make additional progress. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen calls it a complexity break. But as a thought experiment, let's just say that superintelligent computers will emerge. What that would mean for humanity is a hotly debated topic. There are people who eagerly await it and those who are already working to stop it from happening. Probably the most immediate effect would be technological unemployment, where workers in many job sectors are rendered obsolete by computers, like AIs and robots, that can do their work better and for less pay. Although computers are new, this effect is not. Remember Remember Jacquard's loom from episode 10? That automated the task of skilled textile workers back in the 1800s, which led to riots. Also, back then, most of the population of the US and Europe were farmers. That's dropped to under 5% today, due to advances like synthetic fertilizers and tractors. More modern examples include telephone switchboard operators being replaced with automatic switchboards in 1960, and robotic arms replacing human painters in car factories in the 1980s. And the list goes on and on. On one hand, these were jobs lost to automation, and on the other hand, clothes, food, bicycles, toys, and a myriad of other products are all plentiful today because they can be cheaply produced thanks to computing. But experts argue that AI, robots, and computing technologies in general are going to be even more disruptive than these historical examples. Jobs at a very high level can be summarized along two dimensions. First, jobs can either be more manual like assembling toys or more cognitive like picking stocks. These jobs can also be routine, the same tasks over and over again, or non-routine, where tasks vary and workers need a problem to solve and be creative. We already know that routine manual jobs can be automated by machines. It has already happened for some jobs and it's happening right now for others. What's getting people worried is that non-routine manual jobs like cooks, waiters and security guards may get automated too. And the same goes for routine cognitive work like customer service agents, cashiers, bank tellers and office assistants. That leaves us with just one quadrant that might be safe, at least for a little while, non-routine cognitive work, which includes professions like teachers and artists, novelists and lawyers, and doctors and scientists. These types of jobs encompass roughly 40% of the US workforce. That leaves 60% of jobs vulnerable to automation. 
People argue that technological unemployment at this scale would be unprecedented and catastrophic, with most people losing their jobs. Others argue that this will be great, freeing people from less interesting jobs to pursue better ones, all while enjoying a higher standard of living with the bounty of food and products that will result from computers and robots doing most of the hard work. No one really knows how this is going to shake out, but if history is any guide, it will probably be okay in the long run. After all, no one is advocating that 90% of people go back to farming and weaving textiles by hand. The tough question which politicians are now discussing is how to handle, hopefully, short-term economic disruption for millions of people that might be suddenly out of a job. Beyond the workplace, computers are also very likely to change our bodies. For example, futurist Ray Kurzweil believes that the singularity will allow us to transcend the limitations of our biological bodies and brains. We will gain the power over our fates, we will be able to live as long as we want, we will fully understand human thinking and will vastly extend and expand its reach. Transhumanists see this happening in the form of cyborgs, where humans and technology merge, enhancing our intellect and physiology. There are already brain-computer interfaces in use today, and wearable computers like Google Glass and Microsoft HoloLens are starting to blur the line too. There are also people who foresee digital ascension, which in the words of Jaron Lanier would involve people dying in the flesh and being uploaded into a computer and remaining conscious. This transition from biological to digital beings might end up being our next evolutionary step, and a new level of abstraction. Others predict humans staying largely human, but with superintelligent computers as a benevolent force, emerging as a caretaker for humanity, running all the farms, curing diseases, directing robots to pick up trash, building new homes, and many other functions. This would allow us to simply enjoy our time on this lovely pale blue dot. Still, others view AI with more suspicion. Why would a superintelligent AI waste its time taking care of us? It's not like we've taken on the role of being a benevolent caretaker of ants. So maybe this would play out like so many sci-fi movies where we're at war with computers, our own creation having turned on us. It's impossible to know what the future holds, but it's great that this discussion and debate is already happening. So as these technologies emerge, we can plan and react intelligently. What's much more likely, regardless of whether you see computers as future friend or foe, is that they will outlive humanity. Many futurists and science fiction writers have speculated that computers will head out into space and colonize the galaxy, ambivalent to timescales, radiation, and all that other stuff that makes long-distance space travel difficult for us humans. And when the sun is burned up and the Earth is space dust, maybe our technological children will be hard at work exploring every nook and cranny of the universe, hopefully in honor of their parents' tradition to build knowledge, improve the state of the universe, and to boldly go where no one has gone before. In the meantime, computers have a long way to go and computer scientists are hard at work advancing all the topics we talked about over the past 40 episodes. In the next decade or so, we'll likely see technologies like virtual and augmented reality, self-driving vehicles, drones, wearable computers, and service robots go mainstream. The internet will continue to evolve new services, stream new media, and connect people in different ways. New programming languages and paradigms will be developed to facilitate the creation of new and amazing software, and new hardware will make complex operations blazingly fast, like neural networks and 3D graphics. Personal computers are also ripe for innovation, perhaps shedding their 40-year-old desktop metaphor and being reborn as omnipresent and lifelong virtual assistants. And there's so much we didn't get to talk about in this series, like cryptocurrencies, wireless communication, 3D printing, bioinformatics, and quantum computing. We're in a golden age of computing, and there's so much going on, it's impossible to summarize. But most importantly, you can be a part of this amazing transformation and challenge by learning about computing and taking what's arguably humanity's greatest invention to make the world a better place. Thanks for watching. Crash Course Computer Science is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. At their channel, you can check out our playlist of shows like Braincraft, Comanidi, and PBS Infinite series. This episode was filmed at the Chad and Stacey Emmergold studio in Indianapolis, and it was made with the help of all these nice people and our wonderful graphics team, Thought Cafe. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.